That is hot. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pinedale. I call this commission meeting of the Wyoming Game Fish Department Commission to order. Um, please silence your cell phones. You know, I only have a few minutes left under my reign of leadership, but all cell phones that go off is a $50 donation to our Access Yes program. <laughs> To conduct business today, I'll have a roll call of commissioners present, Commissioner Lundvall, Commissioner Jolovich, Here. Commissioner Ladwig, Here. Commissioner Bell, Here. Commissioner Roberts, present. Commissioner Masterson. Here and healthy. You are healthy. And he came in unaided with crutches and walkers. So that's a blessing to have you back in a good health. Appreciate that. Um, for members of the public who want to address the commission today, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. You need to fill one of those out. Um, assisting with the meeting today is going to be Mark from the Jackson Region Office. Mark, we appreciate your help doing that. If you're participating via Zoom, you should have advanced. You should have submitted an advanced comment. However, for, if you haven't, you can contact the host of the meeting and get your comments in. I think it's important for the public to participate. So we'll take comments through the day if you wish to do that. We'll have um, the public participate on each topic that the commission considers today. So everyone will have an opportunity to speak, but I do ask when you speak that you're courteous, you don't make personal attacks and you keep your comments short and to the point. For my commissioners, remember these new mics, red is hot, red is not off. So if you wanna be heard, make sure your mic is red. With that, would you join me now? We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, each commissioner has an agenda before them. Do you have any additions or corrections to your agenda? All right, we will work off the revised agenda that was handed out today. Um, hey, Mr. President, if Mr. Director, if I may quickly, so just an administrative note, the the folks that manage this building have asked that nobody go past the sign in this hallway back here by the bathrooms going down this hallway that kind of goes back to the southeast. That's a it says no authorized personnel, but they really wanted us to remind everybody that um anybody there's some special classes that go on down there and they can't have any of us down there thank you so noted um okay working on our agenda agenda item number one we're going to have election of new officers it's been an honor to serve as your president um thank you for that opportunity at this time i would open the floor for nominations for president of the wyoming game and fish commission Mr. Esteemed uh, President, uh, it would be my honor to nominate uh, Richard Ladwig as to be the current uh, president of the commission. Second. Thank you, Rusty. I'm locked up there. Um, are there any other nominations for president? Are there any other nominations for president? Hearing and seeing none, it's been moved that Commissioner Richard Lagwood take over presidency of the Wyoming Gig and Fish Commission. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye too also. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, now I will open the floor for nominations for vice president of the commission. Is there, is there any nominees for vice president? Mr. President, I would like to nominate Mark Dolovich as the vice president. Is there a second for Mark? Second. second by Ashley. Are there any other nominations for vice president? Are there any other nominations for vice president? Seeing none, all those in favor of Mark Jolovich serving as your vice president say, Mark's a great guy and can pass rabbit seasons. <laughs> <laughs> a simple I would suffice. Aye. 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 Those opposed? Congratulations. We're going to shuffle some chairs and then we'll resume with this meeting. Congratulations, gentlemen.
Welcome again to everybody. Uh, I was going to pass on my thanks for and the appreciation for Ralph running the organization for the last year, but he's out of the room right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, <laughs> appreciate your efforts over the last year leading the organization. You did a super job and and uh, hope I can do as well. Well, next bit of business, we'll have the approval of the commission meetings for the last commission meeting. Everybody should have had a copy of it sent to them. Is there any questions or additions to the minutes? Mr. President, I move that we uh, vote to approve the uh, uh, commission meeting minutes from the last meeting. Motion has been made by Commissioner Bell and seconded by Commissioner Lundvall to approve the minutes. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. We'll go on to the director's report. Director Nesvik. Well, good morning, Mr. President. Congratulations. <laughs> um, welcome to a new chair. And thank you, Commissioner Brokaw, for a year of your outstanding leadership and the, the contributions that come with having to serve as our commission president. It, it comes with a lot more uh, in-between meetings work and uh, really having to keep your eye on the ball. We rely on the president to make kind of those quick decisions on your behalf um, in between meetings when we're not uh, able to, to get everybody on the phone or in a, in a timely enough fashion. And so it does require quite a bit extra time and effort. And and uh, Commissioner Brokaw has done an outstanding job. Um, it was a true pleasure to have you there. And we look forward to Commissioner Ladwig's um, service here over this next year as, as our commission president and know that we'll get the same contribution and dedication from him as we've seen um, with with all the presidents of the game fish commission thank you so a couple of things here this morning i should have a fairly brief um, director's report um, i did want to first of all just say that for those that may be interested in attending the western association of fish and wildlife agencies annual meeting it's going to be the first full week of june um, the early bird deadline to to um, get registered I think is coming up here very shortly. So if you are interested, um, please let Tony know. She can take care of all the arrangements and registration. Um, okay. Commissioner Ladwig has attended in the past, as has Commissioner Brokaw, and um, and they've reported back to the commission that it's been wor worth their time. It is, it is a time commitment, though, to go spend. It usually ends up being three or four days down at uh, this year. It's going to be in Washington, um, Washington State, and I can't remember exactly the town, but um, it's going to be a pretty good venue and uh, an opportunity to interact with commissioners from other states, as well as um, department leadership from other states as well. I um, did want to let the commission know this will be um, Jennifer Doring's last commission meeting. She's um, She's been here with the department since 2006 or 7. Um, she, before that, was with the Department of Audit, served here as the um, in the wildlife division as their fiscal program coordinator and then as our licensing manager since 2013. Um, she's been in front of this commission many, many times, um, is always very accurate, pro provides good information concisely. Um, she's been involved in, obviously in Wyoming, you know, managing hunting licenses is a big deal and it's important to a lot of people. And so she oftentimes gets called upon to have to answer those very complicated questions and a lot of times they're backed with a lot of passion and um, she's done a, a wonderful job with that with interacting with both you internally within the department and then also with um, our external stakeholders she was instrumental in working with uh, the wildlife task force and providing them a lot of information that was very detailed and complex and um, and anyway she's been a it's been great to have on with us for the last several years. She's accepted a position with the Office of State Lands, and we certainly wish her the absolute best as she, she goes over there and continues her service with the state of Wyoming. Um, did want to talk a little bit about, uh, Angie will provide a good thorough legislative update on this session that just ended last Friday, but I did want to let the commission know 
the two interim topics that we proposed and that we are hopeful will be accepted for the uh, specifically for the department over the interim. The first one is, is uh, we're, we're calling it Game and Fish um, financial planning. Um, as many of you are aware, there's been a number of years now that have gone by where the standard model that we used to use for decades of, you know, every several years doing a, a fee adjustment in order to keep up with inflation, that, that's not been the model now for many years. And we're at a point where um, we have not had any kind of an increase in revenue through this period of inflation over the last three years. We're still in, in uh, our financial position is good. Um, however, in order to continue to do some of the really cool things that you've all done, like with wildlife crossings, with mule deer research, with treatment of invasive annual grasses, with access and conservation easements and access, long-term access agreements, we're, we're going to need to, to um, find some new revenue sources here in the coming pretty near future, actually. And so really, I want to I go to the legislature and talk to them about a package of different ideas. Um, maybe some new ideas that that have never been um, evaluated before, and then you know, looking at some of the old, the older ways that we've always um, had revenue for the department. So, um, I, I feel pretty darn confident that that interim topic will be uh, approved and will be on the list. And then the other one that um, we're going to talk to them about, hopefully, if they approve it, is um, wildlife disease one hundred and one. Um, as you know, there are many of the, the more difficult and complex wildlife management issues in our state that some way, you know, some way have a nexus to wildlife disease. Oftentimes legislation um, has some kind of a wildlife disease nexus to it. We've seen a lot of that play out here just recently. And even the topics that we're gonna discuss today directly involve disease. Um, the feed ground plan is a great example. Um, you know, a lot of discussion recently with bighorn sheep and where we can have bighorn sheep in the state is directly tied to pneumonia and, and diseases that can move back and forth between domestic livestock and wildlife. And so anyway, we feel like it's a good opportunity to not ask for any kind of new legislation, but provide um, the Tri Tribal Recreation Wildlife Committee a good base of knowledge on wildlife disease and why it's important in our state. There were other topics that were recommended to the Tribal Recreation Wildlife Committee don't know which one of those may or may not be approved. Um, some that relate to us are, again, another look at the, the um, regulation of commercial fishing operations in our state, um, primarily on rivers and streams. Um, that's been hashed, uh, hashed out multiple times in the past and never come to any kind of re uh, resolution. So I do know there's interest in that. There was recommendations that came for... Um, reevaluating or looking at a trapping issue again that has been an interim topic in the past and and as recently as three or four years ago um, and then there were a few others that were recommended by um, by other members of the public and so april 1st will be the uh, management council of the legislature's next meeting and they will approve or disapprove interim study topics at that time so we should know shortly after that we'll have a an interim meeting in may July, and then I think again in October, and uh, to discuss whatever topics end up being approved. Did want to give the commission a heads up. There's been discussion about the the Wind River uh, migration corridor. It's actually not very far from here, north, um, north and east, um, but a, a deer migration um, movement that we know exists between uh, the Dubois area and the Wind River Reservation over as far as Grand Teton Park. Um, our folks have been working on that uh, on that that information and putting a lot of stuff together. I believe we're going to be able to bring the uh, commission some information and a recommendation in, in July at your July meeting. Um, so just wanted to give you a heads up on that. We're still in the, um, having conversations with landowners and also the tribes, um, as is our practice with any kind of migration corridor work under the governor's executive order. And then lastly, um, just wanted to bring it to your attention that we do expect to have a public draft of the sage grouse amendment plan um, here. We, we think maybe as early as Friday, um, if not Friday, I think it'll be rather, it'll be just several days after that. Um, we've been extensively involved in that process. We've offered a lot of, of a lot of comments 
about, you know, what we think is, is the best way to write that. Angie has spent weeks, literally weeks of work commenting on hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of uh, that plan and done an exceptional job with that. And so we'll, we'll find out um, how many of those recommendations have been accepted and incorporated into the plan. There will be a, it's a draft to the public. So the public has an opportunity to weigh in again, as well, as will the, the state agencies that are cooperators and other entities like County Commissioners Association and um, other state agencies that are cooperators in that process. And with that, Mr. President, I would stand for any questions. Anybody have any questions for the director? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, director Gazette, um, I'm curious. Um, we have on our agenda the uh, sublet antelope migration corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that's on the agenda for today. We have a the sage grouse plan is imminent. Um, and then we also have the Rock Springs RMD. I'm not quite sure what the state of play is. I believe that all the states comments are in and we're waiting for the BLM to respond. But my question is, um, what is the interplay between the RMD and the sage grouse plan here and the migration corridor here? Um, if it strikes me that there's these are related to mm -hmm. this, are we should we stand by on the migration corridor, waiting to see how the other plans go so we can put them together? Or help me with that. Absolutely. So, Mr. President, Commissioner Matters, an excellent question. And you're right, there's a lot of overlap. And what I would say is, is I would recommend that you, that the commission take each one of those things individually and decide on them. And, and we'll prompt you along the way as to when we think you should um, take action on any of those specific items. So today we're going to recommend that you take action on the sublet pronghorn corridor. And, and I recommend that you do and not wait for any other decisions. There is like, you know, in the, in the evaluation and the analysis that our folks that are involved in, in the sublet corridor, as an example, um, part of that analysis is to look at what other plans, how they affect the, the corridor. So there's some parts of this corridor that are already protected, actually have more protections um, under the sage grouse core area and the say our, our state sage grouse executive order than um, what are contemplated in the migration corridor. So that we just know that the department does look really hard at, at the interplay and the overlap before we develop recommendations to the commission. The sage grouse amendment, um, the things that are contemplated in that um, do not, you know, there's there's nothing there that would trigger us to go a different direction, at least as we know it today, with regards to the migration corridor. Um, and don't uh, I? I'm not in, implying by any means that they're siloed in such a way that there's no communication. Mm -hmm. I absolutely uh, understand that. I I was trying to figure out the timing mm -hmm. right um because if the migration corridors if we if we act on that and then later we've got a sage sage grouse plan and lord knows what's going to happen with the rock springs rmp do we is it kind of cart before the horse or that's that was what i was trying to express okay and i mr president i certainly understand that and i um and, and again i think that irregardless of where they they land on the RMP. I think we should move forward on this this corridor today, and you'll you'll be presented the why here in a lot of detail shortly. Um, and and as a matter, since you brought it up, so we did. You know, the governor formed a task force and provided a lot of advice to the BLM, and we're now waiting to see how the BLM is going to react to that, and if they're going to make modifications to the draft or not. And I don't know a timeline on when we may hear back from them on that. Other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you. A couple of things I'd like to make mention of. Uh, during my five-year tenure here at this point, uh, it's kind of strange not to have Deputy Director Kennedy here for a meeting. 
We have a new deputy director, Eric Wiltanger, is taking his place, and we're expecting great things from him. And and uh, we will uh, miss Director Kennedy because he had a sense of humor that was rather neat. But welcome, Eric. Don't worry, Eric's got some little tricks up his sleeve, too. <laughs> <I'll bet. laughs> and for those of you that don't know, the restroom capability is out down in that hall. You go past the sign that says no trespassing, and that's where the restroom facility is at. So next we'll have uh, awards and recognition. Chief King. Good morning, President Ladwig, uh, Director Nesvik, members of the commission. It's my honor and privilege today to recognize one of our outstanding game wardens. Uh, truly is uh, Chief Game Warden one of the best perks of the job is this annual opportunity to recognize one of our outstanding officers, thanks to the uh, support of Safari Club International. So this year, our recipient of the Shikar Safari Club International uh, Game Warden of the Year for Wyoming is Bags Game Warden Kim Olson. And I'm going to ask Kim to come up here and, and stand here uncomfortably while we put the spotlight on her and, and talk about how wonderful Kim is. As all good Game Wardens, she doesn't like the spotlight, but we're going to make her stand in it for a little while today. So Kim is the, the Game Warden in Bags, and she's been the Game Warden down there for about 13 years. And during that time, you, you can um, get a sense of, of her dedication to, to the resource and the people that she serves. That district has a, a diversity of wildlife, a diversity of habitats. And even though it's a small town, during the fall, it's inundated with some of the highest hunter numbers of anywhere in the state. Lots of deer hunters, lots of elk hunters. And, and Kim just does a phenomenal job. She knows that resource extremely well. She is always willing to help the public. Um, she shares her wealth of knowledge that she has about that resource with, with anybody and everybody that will ask. Every year we frequently receive a lot of comments in our hunter harvest survey and through other means about Kim's willingness to share information with the public about the wildlife resource that she manages. I think one of the neat things about uh, Kim is that she has a really strong interest in wildlife management. So when you think about a Wyoming game warden, you think about not only the enforcement work that we're charged with doing, but, but also the critical piece of wildlife management. And, and Kim does all aspects of the job remarkably well. In fact, just this morning, she was all excited to tell me about some sharp-tailed grouse licks that they discovered while doing a moose survey and how she's already scheming to make a snowmobile trip in February to go look at these sharp-tailed grouse licks next year. That epitomizes Kim's remarkable ability to, to do the, the full range of, of the Wyoming Game Warden job so well. Um, in addition to her her field work, she spends a lot of time in the community. She teaches hunter education courses. She's always available for, for ride-alongs with people that might have an interest in, in the game warden career. She's been involved with 4-H sports. Um, just very, very engaged in, in the community. Kim, as I mentioned, has served for 13 years in bags. She served for several years in Rollins before that. And prior to that, she was in our Green River region. So all told, almost 20 years of service with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And prior to us getting her, she spent about nine years in Utah as a conservation officer. So almost three decades of service as a wildlife officer. And, and again, very, very deserving of this award. Kim is a Johnstown College graduate in North Dakota, where she... It was a track and basketball scholarship athlete. And so, yes, those rumors of her being extremely tough are true. She, she is very tough. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that, that I appreciate, appreciate about Kim is, again, she has served as a mentor to a lot of our game wardens. And, and we can 
point to Kim and say, this is this is what a Wyoming game warden looks like, and this is how they do their job. I, I think, you know, her recipe for success is, uh, number one, a true passion for wildlife. Uh, two is a is sincere desire to serve the public. And then I think, uh, uh, importantly, a, a strong, supportive family back home that supports her while she's out doing the job. I think along with that, probably a good dog and a good mule are also part of the part of the equation. And Kim certainly has that. So with that, I would like to recognize Kim Olson as uh, your Safari Club International Game Warden of the Year. Thank you. Um, it's just, I'm very honored. Um, this is really special. Uh, I just try to do what's best for wildlife. Thank you. Next, we'll have Meredith Wood. Oh, no, we'll have Chief Will Tanger, Director Will Tanger. Something like that. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. President, Director Nesvik, members of the commission. Just a real quick opportunity to kick this agenda item off. Meredith Wood, our CFO, is going to present the preliminary approval for your budget for FY25. Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to our field staff. You know, this process starts in October and really prior to that, but formally, everybody starts getting things opened up in October. We work on it October, November, December. January, and uh, it's a process. And I'll tell you, since you mentioned our former deputy director, he did have a big hand in this. So if it works out, um, I'll take credit for it. But if it doesn't, <laughs> we'll remind him that he put this together. Um, but no, just a big thank you also to our commissioners that are on the budget team um, that kind of finished out the process. And uh, I think you're going to be happy with it. And uh, with that, I'll introduce CFO Meredith Wood. Good morning, President Leidwig, Commissioners, Director Nesvik. Um, agenda item number five, preliminary approval of the commission's FY25 standard and one-time budget. So just briefly in this presentation, uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna go over your standard budget. Those are the day-to-day -day operational items for um, the department as well as capital construction, maintenance, um, vehicle use, and, and smaller projects. And then our one-time budget, um, or your one-time budget. And then finally, I'll just ask for a vote from the commission for the approval of both of those things. So at the beginning of every budget cycle, budget development cycle, we do an in-depth review of what do we think revenues will be. Since we don't receive any outside funding, as you're aware, um, we do a projection, if you will, of how much revenue we think we are going to receive during that same cycle. And then the target this year, as established both by the commission and department administration, was that we don't want to have a expense standard budget greater than those revenues or projected revenues. So for FY25, we um, projected that we would have just over 1.3 million in revenues, and therefore that became um, the max target for the standard budget. So um, this is just a, a snapshot of what those projected revenues are at the top. You often hear us talk about projections, expenditures over revenues or revenues over expenditures, buckets of money, if you will, that the commission has. Um, so I'll just walk through this briefly, but you, and as I go through it, I'll kind of highlight where those buckets are uh, that you often hear Director Nesvik talking about. So we start with our projected revenue and then our FY25 estimated standard budget is the one Point two million dollars, and that's the details I'll get into in just a minute. Um, every year we estimate or we have an expense rate that runs roughly between 92 and 
5%. So for conservative purposes in these projections, we estimate the expenditures over the FY25 total standard to be that 95% or 97 million. And then we have the one-time budget of the 3.1, which again, I'll show you the details of in just a moment. So total estimated expenditures at the end of FY25 are estimated to be just over that 100 million, leaving revenues over expenditures at the end of the fiscal year. Um, the next section there is basically where, what does our cash look like? What does your cash look like? So at the beginning of FY24, which is the budget that we are in right now that will go through the end of June, there was just under $97 million in there. That is essentially the entire operating fund. The next line there is the reserve, that $44.8 million. That is the six months, if you will, you've heard it referred to as six months operating cash um, that we were able to get approval of to invest in pool A. So that is secure and set aside and being invested via the treasurer's office in pool A. 100% of the interest generated on that per commission direction and request is being reinvested into that account um, as it's earned and allocated by the treasurer's office. So that 44.8 essentially is harder to um, retract, if you will, and expend if you need it, but uh, it is available to you. So funds available for distribution essentially are the difference, the 51.8. And then because we're still in budget fiscal year 24, and we don't know what those expenses and revenues will actually come to be, the estimated amount there, the 13.6, is estimating that of your FY24 expenditures and revenue, we will expend $13.6 million more than we will earn. And primarily that's Jackson Housing. Um, and then secondly, that FY25 estimated revenue over expenditure, that goes back to the top two. We expect that we will spend less than we will earn. So in essence, replenish the operating fund by that $3 million uh, difference. The next line is prior committed funds. So this is one of those four that Director Navasovic talks about. These are things that have been earmarked while they still sit in cash, we can't essentially double distribute them. And so that 17.7 .7 million is to cover um, prior encumbered dollars. For example, the 2.5 million that you just approved for the um, Cool and Warm Water Hatchery is part of that 17.7, .7, as well as some Jackson housing money and so forth. Um, finally, the anticipated one-time projects, uh, as you know, you approved 17.5 total on that hatchery project. You only gave spending authority for 2.5. So the 15 million remainder that you have already committed is part of that 16.2. And then the difference there is also some uh, crossing money that was earmarked a while back. So if all of this happens as projected, and I just want to emphasize that there's a lot of magic and, and guessing here, um, hopefully educated, but at the end of FY25, which will be June 30, 2025, I believe your operating or discretionary fund, which is another one of these pots of money, will be at 7.2 million. Do we want to pause and take questions there, or Brian, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so as far as projections go, Meredith's exactly right. Um, you know, we track these over time and look at what where we where we thought that we were going to hit the target. And then once we are done and we hit the target, how far off we were, and we're usually pretty darn close. Um, we do ask, I've asked Meredith to make sure when she makes these projections, if she's going to err to err on the side of more being more conservative. Uh, I think that's a better, better way to go. And the other thing that you know, the way that we generate the discretion, the level of discretionary funds that we've had in the past to do a lot of the big things that Meredith just mentioned, like $17 million for a warm, cool water hatchery, all the money that the commission's pumped out on wildlife crossings, all those big um, Jackson housing, Cody office, those, the way we've been able to do that is to maintain a separation between 
expenditures and revenue. Um, and you can see this has gotten very tight, tighter than what it's been um, for a long time. And so um, we still managed to do that. We still have, you know, $3 million moving into the discretionary pot, but um, in order to continue to stay on track with the priorities that this commission has outlined, um, we've got to, we've got to focus on that. What I've asked our folks to do is to shoot for a target of about 10% of the budget of the standard budget being in that discretionary fund, which right now would be uh, just North of, of $10 million. Thanks. Mr. President. Mayor. Um, following up, just so I'm clear, um, Director Nesvik, or um, for you, um, estimated funds available for distribution, is that is that what you're referring to as the discretionary fund? That bottom, very bottom line? For, because I, it, for distribution where, to what? That's so what. You're talking the very bottom line. Yes. That's, that's, that's the discretionary fund that the commission okay. relies on for one-time spending. And, and because you had, you had said discretionary fund and I wanted to make sure I knew which line. Um, but my second question is, uh, for example, with the fish hatchery money that we have set aside, the committed funds, um, uh, we've given spending authority for 2.5, um, where does that 15 that's still left, where does that sit? Is that also invested by the treasurer? I'm just wondering how it's held. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Masterson, it is invested by the treasurer, but not in pool A. It's in the state agency pool, um, which does have a significant lower rate of return on it, but it does stay in that, um, in that pool. And the difference is, is that's more liquid. Right. Pool A is, it's not as easy to pull money out of there. Okay. All right. So um, another thing that we do is we compare prior budget fiscal year to current projected or estimated requested fiscal year. So some of the significant changes um, between FY24 and FY25 are listed up here. But as you can see, as of the end of January, your FY24 current standard budget is just over 1.3 million. And the requested FY25 is just over 1.2. So we're actually less than your current FY24 in this current uh, request. So some of the major changes, we did have two very expensive capital construction projects, if you will, the difference being the shooting complex in 24 came off. That was a one-time thing. And uh, there's a request for a downer capital construction overhaul project for 2. million in the current request. Um, inflation has been um, something that continues to kind of tick up your standard budget the last few years in particular. Four primary categories, as you can see there, utilities, property taxes, travel, expenditures and then vehicle maintenance. So um, it's gonna cost us approximately half a million dollars more to run the same number of vehicles in your fleet this coming year um, than it has previously. And then statewide cost allocation, there's another 300 there. So just as a reminder, it's in the legislative expenses category when we get into that sheet, um, but that is for shared services provided to the department by other agencies. And so what's in there is ETS, which is the uh, Enterprise Technology Services System, which handles servers and Gmail and phones and those kind of things. And then there was also recently an HR consolidation. So we have three full-time employees that were pulled from the department and incorporated into a &I, and this is where we'll get billed for it. So that's what that 300,000 is for. And then as far as reductions go, again, <clears throat> the list is there. You will notice there are two line items on there for houses, game warden house and a hatchery house. So for several years, we've had a, a standard replacement schedule of one house per division. Um, and we are taking requesting to take a break from that, this FY25 cycle to do a, a more over a complete review of all houses uh, that are necessary and, and come up with a replacement and maintenance plan on those. Um, 
the vehicle purchases, it's not that we're buying less or replacing less. There's a replacement schedule on that. We're just buying less expensive. I think the last year's had a couple of heavy equipment items that were really expensive. So if there's no questions, we can move into the FY25 request. I, I'm sorry, Mr. President. Um, I'm curious, um, when you talk about inflation, obviously, um, this, our employees are tied to the uh, A and I um, sk salary schedules. Um, it, is there? It, it, did the legislature do anything to address inflation for uh, our employees? They did last year and the year before, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Masterson. This year, there's a minor amount of uh, money that was appropriated in the general fund for other other than us state agencies. And that, that just got passed Friday. So we're diving into the details to see what that means. But it does not appear to be any kind of a cost of living adjustment. It's more of a um, moving employees that are further away from the midpoint of market, closer to that midpoint of market. Um, but it's a small, it's a pretty small adjustment. Mr. President. Okay. Meredith, could, could you go back up a little bit on this when you talked about the housing one a year and moving forward? Could you explain that a little bit better for me? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Roberts, I might turn that over to Eric or Rick. My understanding is we have several houses at the hatchery or anywhere there's live animals, plus game warden houses and some patrol cabins and other um, housing type facilities. And uh, we're gonna do a full inventory and review of what their condition is. Do we still need them? Do we not need them? Um, what would be the replacement if necessary and or major maintenance, minor maintenance, just a full schedule of that. Well, and I'll add a little bit to that, Mr. President. So we, um, it's been a, almost 20 years ago now, we did a very thorough, we, we contracted with somebody to go look at our houses around the state and our facilities and to say, these should be your highest priorities. And we've now checked the box on that list. And we feel that we need to, we need to relook at all that to make sure that when we're spending this kind of money, that it's being allocated to the highest priority. We're not putting ourselves in any kind of um, any kind of jeopardy or risk by taking a one-year break. Um, I looked at this and I, I don't have concerns with doing that. Um, but I do think if you look at the, the average life of a house, roughly you've got to do about, um, we have about 50 warden stations and we have um, just south of that on fish houses. You've got to do about one a year. And we did two a year a couple of times. So I think we're in good shape. All right, so the FY25 budget is broken up into seven major sections. This is just each of the divisions, if you will. And then there's one pot, I'll get it over with. It's called grants. It's for the receivable grant agreements that we, the department, need under statutory authority from the commission expenditure authority for prior to reimbursement. So we need to be able to spend commission dollars that are eligible and qualify for reimbursement under those grants. And then we in turn, turn right around and request reimbursement. So this is just, it's a checkbox, if you will. Um, the 6 million is the average that we conduct in that receivable grants world on an annual basis. Um, so if there's any questions, we can talk about it. Otherwise that's all I'm gonna mention about the, of the grants pot and then we'll get into the divisions. So the one point or the 102 million 400,000 um, is broken out again, like I said, in those different divisions, there's four different pots, if you will, of funds, the m &O budget, those are just game and fish operating funds. Um, access fund is a separate fund that is made up of conservation stamp dollars and donations that is specifically earmarked for access yes. Trust fund is the interest earned off of the trust fund in Violet Corpus. Um, and those are typically approved and earmarked by the commission for habitat and conservation education projects. And then state wildlife grants, that's US Fish and Wildlife Service funds for sensitive species projects. 
that is reimbursed in most cases at a 65-35 rate. However, the 150 on there is, is for us to uh, contract for a statewide action plan coordinator so that that plan can be re rewritten and that returns at a 75% rate. So in the administration budget, this is the director's office. Um, you'll see there's significant change. I mentioned that $2.5 million shooting complex, and that's in that 0810 direct director's office admin line. Um, obviously, we're not contributing another $2.5 million for that project, and it hasn't been reallocated to anything else. So there's a significant reduction there. Our vehicle fleet, I already mentioned. Um, and then some of the other reductions in this one is the fellowship program that moves moved over to the comms division, which you'll see on the next slide as an increase. Um, and that covers admin. Comms and education. Uh, so I just mentioned the increase for this Division is the fellowship program, which is conducted with partnership through the University of Wyoming, as well as an additional Hunter Ed coordinator full-time employee. So that makes up the significant change in comms division. Fiscal division is pretty well flat. Um, that legislative expenses line, that's where the statewide cost allocation is that I just talked about. There's also damage claims in there for 2 million, as well as landowner coupons, which I think is in there for 400,000, um, SALEX, which is the law enforcement hotline, and Game Warden Special Retirement. So that's what's in that legislative expenses line. Um, everything else is pretty well standard for all of the operations of the fiscal division. Fiscal division also contains regional office management. So those folks report under the wildlife division, but there's 16 employees spread throughout all the regional offices across the state, which is also part of this due to their license um, selling responsibilities. Mr. President, may I? Ms. Wood, um, just broadly speaking, what is customer service? What, what does that include? Uh, President Ladwig, Commissioner, Masterson, that is our phone center primarily. So we have a operational phone center in the Cheyenne office. Thank you. Uh, and a second question, um, the damage claims fund is in legislated expenses, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and I, I just wonder given the, uh, given what we hear about uh, elk damages and uh, landowner claims, um, do we have enough in it? And that, I, I guess that's kind of to you and kind of to Director Nesvik. Um, did we, did we squirrel enough away in there? Yeah, Mr. President, Commissioner Masterson, yes, we did. Um, we did not make an adjustment to this. We would have if there was one legislative bill would have passed. Um, so we left it based on our past. We based it on our past expenses. However, um, there's going to be more to follow on this. I'm going to be proposing to the commission in September some modifications to our current regulation on forage consumption by specifically elk um, to address a lot of those concerns that came up through the legislative session and over this last year regarding private lands and, and overabundant elk populations. And so you'll be seeing uh, new regulation that will require us to expend more funds likely in uh, either as an add-on to this year's budget when the time comes or in next year's budget. Thank you. Uh, our services division, some of the significant impacts to the services division are utilities and property tax. So a lot of those inflationary costs impact services division in those two categories. Um, the support facilities focus in FY25 is proposed for Sheridan, Lander, and Jackson regional offices. Um, so it's shifted from 24, which I think included Casper, and I can't remember the other one. Um, 
but pretty much it's flat overall for the entire division. Fish division, um, there was, of course, the house at the hatchery is not included in the 25. We already talked about that. Um, they did increase their request for various maintenance projects at hatcheries. Uh, and then there is a slight increase in um, the boating access. Boating access, there's two projects that I think are the primary focus for FY25, and that would be the Salt River PAA. And Wheatland number three, they're proposing to add another ramp at Wheatland three. There was also um, some increase to the fish division budget for some of the new positions that we reviewed in the at the January meeting. Um, so again, overall, relatively flat. Meredith? Yes. What is the large increase in fish spawning? Or that is a mistake on you, the oh, sheet that you yeah, have. I see it's different than it is. I corrected it this morning. I apologize. I it. it was comparing the wrong yeah. number. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Um, wildlife division. Some of the significant changes in wildlife division are the addition of a new deputy chief, um, the huge increase in the bird farm deferred maintenance in Capcom is that $2 million downer overhaul project as compared to last year. Um, in feed grounds, we there's a 645,000 reduction, 600 of which is from um, anticipated need for hay. So there's 600,000 there. And some of the other changes are just minor. The Game Warren House came out of that 62X line. So there's 500. Oh, sorry. Next slide, please, Wayne. That 62X line is where the uh, Game Warren replacement house hiatus is, shows up. And then the 1690 in January, if you recall, you increased that predator management by 200. So this is just reverting to the standard amount. And that wraps up wildlife division. So in summary, uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission standard FY25 budget is being requested at $102,400,168. And that is a reduction from the FY24 budget of just under 800,000. And are there any questions on the standard budget before we go into the one time? Mr. President, um, maybe not a question for Meredith, but working on the budget subcommittee, um, Meredith, this is better numbers than we were anticipating based on legislative output. So uh, you should be very proud of this budget. It's very well done. I support it 100 percent. It looks great. Mr. President, um, I may also mention there will be a couple of changes. As you know, this is the preliminary approval of the FY25 budget. We will come back to you in July per statutory requirement for the final approval of the budget. As Brian mentioned, there's a couple of le legislative things that we need to work through. There are two that we already know of, and that is for game worn retirement and regular retirement. So there'll be some increases in there for that. I'm anticipating won't be more than half a million, um, but there will be some changes. So the Commission FY25 one-time budget, there are no new projects in this request. These are all projects that had been approved in prior years for multi-year funding. Um, the list is there, as you can see, the Mule Deer Initiative, Wyoming Range Mule Deer Wild Harvest Initiative are all in their final year as approved by the Commission in previous um, fiscal years. And then we are in year three of the five-year mule deer study and year three of the long-term Bear River Divide easement. So the total one-time project for 25 request is 3.1 million. So if there are no questions, I would just like to request commission approval of your FY25 preliminary standard budget 
of $102,400,168 and the approval of the FY25 Commission's one-time budget of $3,129,826. Um, an authorization to begin entering into grants and contract agreements uh, with an effective date of July 1. Thank you, Meredith. Is there any questions? Uh, Mr. President, um, also being on that budget subcommittee, I really appreciate uh, Ms. Wood's work on it and your patience. Um, it's a real educational process when you start to dig into this and um, it's very appreciated. Um, look forward to uh, further further dives that you'll uh, supervise. Uh, I would move to uh, give that preliminary approval to the budget as presented. Second. Motion has been made by Commissioner Masterson and seconded by Commissioner Jolovich to approve the budget and the preliminary approval of the budget and the standard budget with one-time projects in it. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Mr. President, uh, I can't miss an opportunity to jab the fish division. Um, they got everything they wanted. <laughs> and, and the fish division thanks you, Mr. As, as appropriate, Mr. <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> okay, we'll vote all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Preliminary budget is approved. Thank you. Uh, item number six, Sean Beebe. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesbick. Uh, agenda item number six this morning is an update to our chapter 23. Uh, which essentially provides for some new definitions and clarity for some of the enforcement items there. Uh, the main revisions consist of uh, the department's ability to exclude, withhold, and revoke access granted by the uh, permission slip or permit to lands acquired or administered by the department, as well as camping equipment that's been uh, abandoned or left behind uh, longer than the um, allowed camping date. And the other item is <clears throat> regarding the uh, use of hunting blinds on commission owned lands. We kicked these out for public comment and we received one back as supportive of the, the changes. And with that and any questions the commission might have, we're uh, asking that the commission approve chapter 23 as proposed. Are there any questions? Is there a motion? President, I will move uh, to accept the department's recommendation for chapter 23. Second. Sorry. I wasn't on. I made the motion, Tony. <laughs> Second. Commissioner Bell seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go on to item seven, the discussion of the sublet antelope migration corridor. Jill Randall. And associates. Good morning, President Lagwig, Director Nesvik, and Commissioners. Today's an exciting day. We are finally bringing a uh, sublet antelope migration corridor in front of you. It's been a long time coming. I'm uh, pretty happy to be able to kick off our presentation to you and um, hopefully give you a lot of information that um, I'm sure some of it won't be new to you but we're gonna to try to give a, a pretty comprehensive overview of the process of part the department has been through here recently.
I'm going to just kind of outline here what we're going to go through. Uh, the general concept is we wanted to give you a high level overview of the threat evaluation the department recently completed, including the public outreach and stakeholder input that we got. Um, and the way we'll do that, I'll start out with kind of talking through science, um, the analysis and maps that we uh, developed with our data. And then Will Schultz will be talking through some of the policy components. Our public comment um, period will be covered by uh, Doug Brigmeyer, and then we'll, we'll finally kind of look at some next steps and outline that for you as well. Some of you have seen this slide before, uh, this information, but we want to just make sure everyone's on the same, uh, same page to get started with um, the science kind of behind big game migration. Most everybody knows connectivity is very important to get between winter and summer ranges. The other component of it is the nutritional benefit that our animals gain when they migrate. Um, that season of migration in the spring in particular is really critical to get the optimal forage opportunity. So during that month to um, three months that they're in that seasonal habitat, um, they, they're able to maximize and get the best potential nutrition from those plants that are greening up. We do have resident migratory and nomadic individuals, even within what we consider our migratory populations. There's a lot of different strategies that the individuals will use. And we're all familiar with those really exciting long distance, 150 mile migrations that get a lot of press and coverage, but those medium and short distance migrations are also critically important to these populations. Some of the animals that um, will just seasonally move a few miles uh, between a distinct winter and summer range are still a really essential strategy for some of these uh, individuals in the population. We try to provide that diversity of strategies so that we have kind of resilience in these herds um, since we don't really know what's gonna be coming in the future with changes on the landscape. And uh, it's important to realize that not all parts of the corridor are created equal. Uh, our data helps us um, prioritize and determine um, the differences between the kind of different components of the corridor. So this map here is uh, it's GPS data points from all of our collared individuals that we use. This is only the migration season for those individuals. So as you can see, it is a kind of a a big footprint of um, collar points. So these are all the individual locations that we gained from the individuals that were used for this analysis. 415 individuals and 816 sequences are what we ended up including in the analysis. Over the last 20 years, uh, we collected data. This is a phenomenal data set. Uh, literally, um, the sample size and the extensive measures that we have in this um, data is world-class. Um, there, there's very few populations anywhere that can rival this amount of data over this number of years. Um, so something to, to be very proud of that we have this kind of data to go into the analysis. Um, just to give context, we have a, a standard that we use of three years and 40 individuals as kind of the minimum for what we would want to use for any kind of analysis for corridors for you know, creating those maps. You can clearly see we far exceeded that on this one. So we're feeling really confident with our data. Just to give you a little better um, outlook on what that data looks like, we had a lot of different studies that we were able to pull data from. Um, these studies go you know, back as far as 2002, some of the early work um, to look at barriers, offenses, some of the movements between Grand Teton National Park and down into the Upper Green River Basin, and a whole variety of different objectives from this research. And um, most recently, the department's been leading a project to kind of fill in some of the gaps because our regional biologists kind of looked at the maps and the data we had and said, we realize there's movements that we don't have captured through these other um, projects. We did, we did initiate a study in 2020 that is currently ongoing that, that's gathering data that we were able to use in this um, final analysis for the corridor. 
So going from the map that had all the brown dots on it, um, that, that map is great, but it doesn't really help focus us and prioritize us for management actions. So it's really important that uh, we were able to you know, boil it down into some of these most important areas. And the polygons you see on this map, um, they range from Grand Teton and Jackson Hole on the very north end, all the way down to I-80, um, Rock Springs and Green River on the south end. And the, um, the high, area, high use areas are in uh, maroon, the medium use areas are in orange, and then the gray footprint are the, the lower use areas that had two or more individuals that overlapped. I'm gonna kind of walk you through a few uh, zoomed in maps, if you would. It's such a huge footprint that it's hard to really make sense of a lot of it. So we, we tried to break it down a little bit better. This is the northernmost portion of the corridor. And this is the portion that, that goes into Grand Teton National Park, migrates through the Grovant and the Upper Green um, on Forest Service land. These are some pretty unique individuals because they go through habitat. You don't necessarily consider pronghorn habitat up on uh, forested areas, yet they're able to navigate through annually. This photo you see here is in the Red Hills. That's in the Grovant, one of those places where they, they literally follow nose to tail on a, a path, um, a trail, and um, pretty exciting to see some of the differences we have throughout different parts of the corridor, this being the north end. Um, the central part here, this is the area um, that includes Pinedale. Um, we have Trapper's Point in there, which a lot of you are aware of here west of town. That's the area don't think my pointer's working, but it's the area just, um, it's the area where you see a lot of the, the red habitat just west of Pinedale there, if you can navigate with those um, highways that are on the map. One of the things I wanted to point out, there are two distinct legs that go into Bondurant Basin that you'll see on the north end of that map. That's another one of those kind of unique habitats that our animals are able to navigate, navigate through forested habitat um, and get down into that important summer range in uh, Bondurant Basin. You also see um, some of the areas on the southern portion of this map are those connectivity areas between summer ranges and those crucial winter ranges that the animals move to on the most severe winters. Um, so even though there's not high use areas through there, it's real important habitat for um, those individuals on, on the years that they really need to push south into the areas with less snow. The southwest corner here, this is the area around Kemmer down to Green River. Um, the corridor here is, um, it kind of moves a little more of an east-west pattern than northwest, but um, still moving across the elevational gradients into those winter ranges on the south end with less snow and up into more productive habitats um, in their summer range in the northwest part. Mr. President, I did. can you go back a slide? Sure. Um, and this this doesn't relate spe specifically to the corridor, but it just stops at that at the highway. Is that? I mean, did you? It, it almost looks like it, uh, you erased it because you wanted to focus us on the the corridor. Um, that's just it's just striking to me the way it just stops. President Ladwig, Commissioner Masterson, um, we did do a mapping exercise after the original analysis to remove some of that. There were very few individuals that went down there. There were a couple very small isolated polygons, and we felt like it was not a true representation of the migratory habitats to prioritize sure. for people. So we did make a distinct cut there at the highway. That's also the herd unit boundary. So we felt like it was a, a justified... Sure. I already do that. So yes, your observation is is correct. It is a stark line right. there. And I'm not being, don't misunderstand, I'm not being critical. Um, it just, you know, talk about the, the need for uh, wildlife underpasses or overpasses. You know, if that isn't a great illustration, even if you put the few, you know, individuals, if that isn't an illustration of how desperately needed they are, I don't know what is. But hey, anyway, sorry for the, Oh, that's editorial fine. comment. Um, thank you. Absolutely. 
Um, here in the southeast corner, this is kind of the red desert vicinity. Um, you'll see I-80 down across the bottom, the red desert, and then Highway 28 kind of cuts through there. And um, it goes up into that area between Boulder and Farson where there's a, a pretty distinct um, corridor that goes north and south um, just east of the highway. I wanna talk a little bit more about the analysis that we use. So a lot of you have heard about the Brownian bridge movement model. This is the analysis method we used for the three corridors that we have delineated prior to this and designated the Mule Deer corridors. We are fortunate to work with um, the best, some of the best scientists in the world on movement ecology at the University of Wyoming. And um, they were able to do, develop a new analysis method called the line buffer method. They published on this method recently and the department felt very comfortable with shifting to kind of the new and better analysis methods for this corridor. So the high, medium, and low use polygons were delineated using this line buffer analysis. It's very simple to understand compared to a lot of the models that um, we use for, for other purposes in management. Literally the, the GPS points that were collected um, you know, every two hours or however frequent, there's a line that we put in to connect those points. And then that line is buffered by 300 meters on each side to give us a polygon. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but it really gives us a better sense of, of that swath of habitat, that variation that might exist between those data points that wasn't collected. And it gives us confidence that we're, we're using kind of simple yet effective um, analysis for prioritizing those habitats. Um, the high use areas are areas that have 20% of the individuals overlap in that area. Um, I think of those kind of as the interstates. Um, those are the areas where a lot of individuals are, are running in the same area. Those are the high priority areas. Medium use has at least 10% of the sampled population um, that is represented in that polygon. Those are kind of like your state highways, if you would. And then the, uh, the low use areas, those are all the areas where we have two or more individual polygons that are overlapping. So those are like your county roads. I still need to get on a county road to uh, get home to my, my house uh, every day, but most of the traffic I get to is, is out on the state highway. So similar to what animals are doing along the migration. Our stopover areas, these are the most important areas for foraging, for resting, recovering along those migrations. We still use the Brownian bridge movement model for that analysis. That is the best and latest, um, I guess, analysis that we're using. So that has not changed. And in this corridor, we looked at the top 5% of time from each of those individuals to get those polygons for stopover habitat. Just to reiterate, we only included migratory individuals in this analysis. There were a lot of individuals that were either resident or nomadic. Um, as antelope populations do, they tend to, to have a variety of those strategies, more so than, than a lot of the deer that we're familiar with. So only those migratory individuals were included. We also included um, kind of a division into subherds in our analysis. And the reason we did this is because the sampling intensity is very different throughout the herd. For example, the north end had um, three or four times as many collared individuals as the southwest or the southeast corner. If we had only done one single analysis, the only high use areas would end up being the areas that had the most individuals that were collared. Instead, we divided it into four different subherds, ran individual analyses so that we could get a better idea on each of those different landscapes of the most important habitats for migration. And then we merged all that together into the maps that you see here. So I want to kind of run through the threat evaluation. Um, this is the document that we took out to the public. And the whole purpose of the threat evaluation is for the department to take a high level look at the different threats and protections that are in place for this corridor and for this population of individuals. So I'm just going to hit on some of the real high points. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at some of the more detailed information in the threat evaluation. But some of those primary threats that, that we 
identified within this threat evaluation are really revolving around the general concept of human impacts. Um, whether you're talking subdivisions, roads, fences, energy development, um, just people being on the landscape is a disturbance and it, it does cause habitat fragmentation. So those are some of the, the most significant threats that we see and the fact that we will probably just see more and not less of those on the landscape as we move forward is um, something we, we focused a fair bit of effort in, in the threat evaluation. Also, for example, last winter, it was very apparent to us that those individuals that had the ability to move south in that extreme winter that we experienced, those individuals had a higher likelihood of survival. So that connectivity to get them into those crucial winter ranges on those most severe winters is really essential. There are, there's a ton of diversity across this herd unit because the you know the threats on the north end look quite a bit different than the threats on the south end so we've really tried to um, identify all those different components throughout the the threat evaluation this is a new map for a lot of people we um we pulled this together after we uh, pre presented the threat evaluation to the public it's a data set the department had previously uh, pulled together a few years ago to help with our statewide habitat planning effort. It really looks at overall intactness, or if you want to think of it the other opposite way, fragmentation of habitat. And it's not focusing on one individual component of it. It's really looking collectively at everything from housing developments to roads to energy development, uh, met towers. There's all kinds of different components that are brought in here. I think the bottom line take home that we would like the commission to, to see from this is that even though we're in this great wide open landscape of Western Wyoming, there's still a lot of habitat fragmentation that has occurred. And we should expect to see that as a, a threat moving into the future, just as a you know reality that this is a landscape that, that humans are have fragmented and um, hopefully the conservation of this corridor can help assure persistence in spite of of these conditions. Mr. President. Uh, may I? Um, can you go back to your um, threat evaluation, the one right before that? Um, what I'm curious about is you have a, a value of intactness. Um, could you just give me one, one level deeper on how you define that, um, because it says habitat disturbance from all combined sources, and I'm trying to figure out, uh, I'm zero in, zero intact, that means it's intact. The yes. darker means it's intact. So that would be a zero value. Yes, President Lagwig and Commissioner Masterson, it is kind of an inverse way that you might be logically thinking of things. But the light colors that you see there on the map, the 100%, those are the areas that had the highest levels of those influences on the model. So like I said, all those different disturbances that are on the landscape, those added up to get that level of 100. And so the places that you see that are light colored on that map are those places that have a higher level of disturbance, therefore less intact habitat. Sure. Um, if you had uh, a well pad, um, how are you, are you drawing a circle around that well pad to determine this or how, do you understand what I, I do? Or and a house or, you know, whatever. Our GIS staff is the, the folks that created this. And um, I would have to ask them for specific details, but I think it was really focused on the footprint that you can visually see from space with satellite imagery and things like that. The visual footprint of disturbance. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So kind of want to flip and look at the other side of the coin here, um, acknowledging the protections that are already in place in this, um, this corridor is an important component of our evaluation as well. There's a lot of public land here that does serve various forms of protection, um, everything from National Park Service land on the north to uh, wilderness or wilderness study areas 
There's some Fish and Wildlife Service refuges that are included in this, as well as some commission-owned land that all have various levels of protection. The Path of the Pronghorn on Bridge of Teton National Forest, that was um, designated in 2008 and is one of the areas that people are, um, they recognize, they've heard about that, and um, it is afforded protections through the Bridge of Teton Forest Plan. Other protections that the department manages and that we have a, a higher level of influence on include some of our crucial winter, winter ranges and um, the fact that we have um, the sublet mule deer migration corridor does overlap a portion of this, um, particular, particularly in the northern portion of the Upper Green River Basin, there is some overlap there. So there's some protection afforded that, um, similar to what Director Nesvik talked about earlier, Sagegrass core area does um, also overlap with portions of this corridor and there are some protections afforded through that. The exciting part, highlighting some of the conservation efforts underway. Um, exciting for me at least. Uh, this has been an area and a landscape where a lot of proactive work has happened over many, many years. Um, we have excellent relationships with working lands, private landowners throughout the corridor who have done things like conservation easements, uh, fence modifications, invasive species work. There's also been a strong history of wildlife crossings um, and those projects throughout this corridor that provide great conservation for this population, including Trappers Point, the Dry Piney Project recently completed this fall. Um, and even along Highway 28, we've done quite a bit of work with modifying the right-of-way fence, um, installing some extra gates to help permeability and help critters get across the highway. We also have um, the USDA Wyoming Big Game Partnership Program that has been a real exciting opportunity for the department over the last few years. And we are able to um, really bring a lot of extra resources into the, um, to the state and to our private landowners through that program. There have been some great examples that I have here on this slide of work that has happened in other corridors. I'm not specifically referring to the sublet antelope corridor in this case, but just as an example, we're able to leverage a lot of federal funding and bring in a lot of extra resources to the state um, to complete conservation actions uh, because of the elevated priority when these corridors are designated, it really draws a lot of attention and helps us bring in extra resources. So the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation excuse me, has um, contributed over $2.7 million to the state, to some of our projects that the department is applying for these funds and receiving. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program on private land, almost $600,000. And the NRCS um, RCPP program has brought in over $11 million for work on private land. And then the USDA uh, Big Game Initiative that I just mentioned, um, there's been approximately $30 million that has been brought in just in the last few years for our work with uh, private lands. So a lot of really excellent opportunities for conservation when we're able to highlight these corridors and prioritize the landscapes through the, the analysis with our data. And I'm gonna turn the Presentation over to Will Schultz. Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, uh, Will Schultz, supervisor of the Habitat Protection Program. Uh, my part in this uh, presentation today is to explain um, a little bit more about the designation process and uh, provide some information regarding the executive order. Uh, in, in 2020, the uh, Wyoming Mule Deer and Antelope Migration Corridor Protection Executive Order was created. And as you may recall, uh, there were three mule deer herds that were uh, provided uh, immediate uh, designation under that executive order, the Bags, uh, Platte Valley, and Sublet Mule Deer Herds. And so this is the first time since that process took place that uh, we're bringing a herd forward through the, the process that's outlined in the executive order for your um, review. So thought a little bit of background might be um, useful. So 
the process. So I'm going to talk about where where we've um, how how we've come so far uh, with as as Ms. Randall explained the data collection, uh, the analysis uh, using the, the various techniques of um, Brownian bridge and uh, line buffering. Um, also, after that was done, uh, came back to the, the local personnel and got their input on uh, the mapping that was produced and also uh, completing the threat evaluation that you were provided to review. Uh, and then in November uh, of 2023, we kicked off a public outreach campaign with three meetings, uh, one in this room in November and one in Jackson and uh, one in Green River as well. Uh, also provided the public with an opportunity to provide written comment uh, through the first week in January. And uh, Deputy Chief Grimmeyer is gonna talk a little more about that. But to give you uh, an illustration of where we're at in this process, um, what Ms. Randall outlined is, is in those boxes on that top row. And we're at the end of that row uh, with bringing uh, this information to the commission. And, and at this point, the commission has uh, an option of um, essentially identifying the, the uh, migration corridor for the subland antelope herd. And if, if so, that would just become part of our uh, seasonal range up uh, map for the, uh, the herd. Uh, the other direction is to move forward and pursue uh, designation of, of the corridor. Um, and so we would start on that second line that you see in that, in that uh, figure. Um, if, if you proceed in that direction, the, uh, the department's role in that will be to move forward with the biological risk assessment. Uh, and there'll be a simultaneous um, uh, effort uh, under the uh, governor's office to um, review the, uh, the corridor under a, um, a local working group that will be um, uh, established by the governor's office. Um, but that would be the department's role moving forward would be uh, providing that biological risk assessment. Uh, at the end of those two processes, then that would be brought forward. Um, sorry. Be brought forward back uh, to the commission uh, and either determined to take it forward to the governor's office or uh, stop and uh, go back to identify. So what does this mean for me? Uh, you know, I think uh, for a lot of landowners, for uh, industry, a uh, lot, uh, lot of interest in what that, what uh, designation would mean under the, the EO. Um, and a couple of points here to, to uh, look at. It, it does not apply to a landowner's uh, activities on their own land. Um, it does not apply to valid existing rights. Those would still carry forward. Uh, state permitted activities moving forward would be reviewed by the, uh, the state agency. Uh, and, and generally they do that in consultation with the department, with uh, the Habitat Protection Program, uh, where we would look at those projects individually. Um, I can tell you in the four years that the, the executive order has been in place, uh, our, my program has uh, reviewed about 60 to 70 uh, uh, projects that had uh, overlap with one of the migration corridors. Um, they've all been able to proceed in some fashion. Um, again, we go back and we look at those individually. Um, it's, it's not painted with a broad stroke of a, a, a stipulation across the entire corridor. Uh, as, as Ms. Randall indicated, there's, there's a lot of nuances between a stopover area and a low use portion of the corridor. 
Um, a lot of the ways that we were able to work with those proponents and minimize things, uh, impact potential impacts is through either siting or timing stipulations. And the um, this these uh, four categories of protection were taken directly from the the executive order. They're not in any hierarchy of protection, uh, but. Uh, We'll start at the top with reviewing uh, the bottleneck uh, areas. Now that is, that's a uh, component of the migration corridors that is yet to be uh, identified. Uh, that would be something that the uh, risk assessment team in, in combination with a working group would review and determine if there are bottlenecks that would need a level of protection that uh, from the executive order uh, no surface disturbance or seasonal human presence. Uh, as the name implies, it's, it's talking about areas where uh, geographically migrations are, are neck down uh, to a point at which uh, it would be critical for uh, a loss of that connectivity through there. Um, high use areas is you know, another layer of the uh, and component of the entire migration corridor. Um, and in that area, it is the recommendation is you know, surface disturbance, human presence should be limited um, it, 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 and limited to the extent that it does not interfere with the functionality of the corridor. Stopovers in high use areas uh, in, in combination, uh, a little, little more sensitive to development and, and other activities. And so there is a recommendation of avoidance. Uh, in those situations, that's, that's when we work with project proponents to try to find a solution to that. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean uh, absolutely not. Uh, it, it means that uh, see if we can't avoid, if we can't avoid, then we start looking for ways to limit that impact. And then finally, low use and medium, medium uh, areas. Uh, development can occur. Uh, minimization should be considered where appropriate. And in a lot of uh, situations there, uh, it's, it's a, um, our recommendations consist of um, a recommendation of a timing stipulation during those peak migration activities through the, that particular portion of the corridor. And with that, I'll turn this over to Mr. Vermont. Thanks, Will. Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. So um, we've got just a few more slides left. I don't want you to feel like we're in a stopover area here for too long with this presentation. So um, let's see, I think we advanced one too far. All right, so um, during the last year, we've been working with um, individual stakeholders and landowners. We've been reaching out to people and trying to um, get, get in contact with folks. And as Will mentioned, we had three public meetings. We've contacted more than 50 stakeholders and about 50 landowners in, in the same, uh, same effort, trying to reach out to folks. And, and we, as, we, as I said, we had those three public meetings. One of them was in this room. And then we also posted the shape files of the maps to the website. And once we finish up today, as um, Commissioner Masterson mentioned, we, it looks like we made some changes from those earlier ones. And so people will be able to see the new shape files once we get through the meeting today. Um, during that outreach, which Will mentioned that it ended on January 5th, um, we had 17 letters and, and 293 comments, um, you know, online. So about 310 comments, 90% of those were supportive of moving this forward. So 280 comments uh, were supportive and asked us to move this process forward. We did have 3% or 10 comments that uh, were, were opposed and uh, had some concerns. And I'll, I got another slide that talks about some of the general themes uh, coming up next. Mr. President? May I ask a question? Um, 
you had I, I appreciate the the written comments and the and the letters you had the two public meetings can you comment on were they well attended um the general gist of uh yeah. maybe the because yeah the written comments are obviously important but you know in the in person meeting interaction i'm wondering what you heard and was it you know the same kind of uh expressions uh you know 90 percent in support at the public meeting or just give me a sense of that yeah. mr mr president and commissioner masterson yeah that i think the the meetings really reflected the the public comment that we received online there was there's folks there that that voice some concern about industry um concerns and um and some uh direction that the federal government may take but overall overwhelmingly um, the public sentiment was supportive of of moving this process forward. Uh, a follow up: Were they were they well attended? Yeah, so I think a um, hundred people, but we had um, thirty five in Jackson, probably like about close to that, and then um, about that many here, forty here. So general themes. Um, of of the comments that we received, basically referring to the map um, and that the science they felt the science was pretty good going to the the um, buffer method. Uh, there was comments about supporting wildlife needs over potential economic gains in Wyoming, and uh, there was also comments about the tourism economy. And then, like I mentioned, some we did have a few folks that were concerned about industry and what those impacts are. And I would just mention that you know we'll we'll. Um, gave an overview of that we've reviewed at least 60 projects on a case-by-case -case basis and we're not out to prevent that development occurring but we're trying to mitigate and place uh, place options for that to go forward but minimize that impact it has on those populations and then there was also concerns uh, from some of the folks that responded that what the federal government will do once this uh, corridor designation process moves forward So again, some of the benefits, and I think uh, Jill and, and uh, Will both mentioned some of the benefits. There's opportunities for additional funding, conservation work, uh, the, the conservation easements, the fence modifications in Sublet County. We're already, um, there's an upper green fence initiative that's uh, reaching 750 miles of fence that's been worked on. And they've got people lining up, uh, landowners that want to help uh, you know, participate in that program. And so we're working to address fence issues that might impede pronghorn movements and uh, we'll continue to do that work. Uh, there's a lot of work on vegetation enhancements. And so right now we're in the middle of season setting and it's interesting, uh, the justifications that we're seeing for pronghorn management and changes in pronghorn seasons this year, a lot of the guys are focusing on habitat quality and uh, invasive grasses. And so the work that we're doing on invasive grasses will have a direct benefit for our pronghorn. And um, when you guys see those justifications posted on the April commission notebook, take a look at some of the pronghorn uh, herds and, and you'll be able to see some of those comments about uh, uh, the habitat quality and the importance of that for pronghorn. Um, we're also, um, you know, the benefits of designation We'll, we'll provide consideration for corridor functionality and those land use decisions down the road. And then it also provides consistent management stipulations across all those public lands. So if the designation moves forward and, and Will had the flow chart showing kind of how this would move forward, but um, we'll go back and we'll draft a biological risk and opportunity assessment uh, for public comment. And then we'll finalize that and then we'll come back to the commission and we'll present that um, again to you like we're doing today. And, and that biological risk assessment, we, we're hoping that we can get something out and do something by this fall. It takes some time and we'll come back later on this fall and uh, we'll come back to you for a recommendation uh, to pursue that designation to the governor. Um, the governor's process of soliciting feedback from the public and the ultimate decision to designate will be at that level. Um, we're we're going to ask you today to to um, direct us to move forward with the designation process and to identify uh, the corridor. So, and that's it for me. I'll stand for questions. 
Um, Mr. President, I have questions and I don't know who to, to direct them to. And it's just more of a whether the department is going to be cognizant on this bottleneck. I'm kind of, um, you, you know, you, you look at these maps and you're like, holy crumba, look at the look at the size of the corridor, look at the size of things. But then when you put it in real time and you go out and look at these spots out there, boy, it's a big state. A bottleneck in Wyoming is I don't know what you could consider a bottleneck in Wyoming. I mean, it would have to be something so definitive, but I just kind of like, I don't know if it's, um, you, you know, I see that I'm trying to put it in in kind of a perception where like you look at the maps and the whole, the whole area is a corridor, but in, in real life, is it really that much of a corridor or is that just the, we've had a bigger pin that have, have marked up this area uh, so i i don't know it's more of a comment i think it's um, and i hear a lot about bottlenecks of course and then i've kind of went to look at the possible bottlenecks and i'm like okay um yeah where's the bottleneck in wyoming i mean it's not like it's a little like this it's wide expansive land so uh, i just just something i observed and would be cognizant of and Mr. President and, and Commissioner Roberts, yeah, so we're going to, once we get into the biological risk assessment, we'll take a little more in-depth um, analysis of those bottlenecks, and I think it'll be a little bit more clear. In, in the threat evaluation, we basically took a real high sky, real 30,000 foot view of things and tried to come up with some acreages on what we predict is out there for those bottlenecks. They are that geographic land area that restricts those those animals, and so it was pretty, pretty apparent when we did the deer one, you know, that you had, um, you know, the bottleneck at Fremont Lake and some of the other ones that we did where those animals were geographically constricted and they funneled through an area. Um, when you get into the pronghorn, um, we'll show some of those in the, the, the biological risk assessment, but there's, there's some obvious ones too, but, but it is a little bit different because pronghorn typically are picking out broad areas that they're moving through, but, but they still might funnel down to some areas because of human disturbance and other things. Mr. President? Yes. Uh, if I may? Yes. Um, I just wanna be clear on the, on the process um, because as, so we recommend today, then it kicks back to you, biological risk assessment, and then it comes back to us. So we're at, it's kind of like we're designating it twice. And is that, help me with that. Yeah, Mr. President and, and uh, Commissioner Masterson. So this will be to identify the corridor and then advise us to go ahead and start doing the risk assess, the biological risk assessment that moves it towards the designation. And then we'll come back to you um, hopefully yet this year with an analysis of that work that gives a little more in-depth opportunities and, and risks that are out there. And uh, the speaking of the biological risk, risk assessment, that, it, that will include public meetings and public comments as well. Yes. Correct? That's correct. Um, give me, a, if you would, a 30,000 foot description of what the biological risk assessment will do. What are you looking for? What's, what does it involve? Yeah, so just um, really just broadly, I ahead. just want to get a handle on what you'll be doing. Yes, Commissioner Masterson, the um, the risk assessment will take this large corridor, it will divide it into segments, and then we will look at each of those segments differently. Like we talked about the north end, that segment is has very different risks and opportunities to do conservation work than what we would have in the Red Desert, for example. So we'll divide it up into several segments and then we'll we'll look at things um, like density of roads and fence density and the conservation easements that are already in place in that segment, things like that. And then we'll bring it back to you as we go through each of those segments, we'll be working with the individual regional personnel on those that know that part of the corridor. This, this corridor is so huge, it actually covers four regions. <laughs> and, um, and so we have a lot of different expertise that we need to bring into those individual parts of the corridor. And that's what we'll do during that. There'll be a lot of GIS analysis that's in there, but then really kind of boiling down um, in much more detail within the segments, what those risks and opportunities are for conservation. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're going to take a 10 minute break at this time. We'll start back up right at about 11 o'clock. Need everybody to take their seats, please. Hi, Mr. Mr. President and members of the commission. But, um, just to recap, so our presentations today just highlighted where we're at in that flow chart. And this is only one step in the process towards designation, which is the identification. That's what we're asking for today is, is for the identification of the, of the corridor. And then we will go back and do a little more in-depth look at those specifics of bottlenecks and we'll break out all the, the segments of this corridor and do a more of an in-depth analysis on all those risks and other opportunities there are for um, this corridor. Okay, thank you. We'll now go into uh, public comment. Uh, I ask that uh, we have a serious amount of public comments. I ask that you keep your comments as concise, as short as possible, because we've got a stack of them. Uh, if we could stay three, four minutes presentation, we'd really appreciate it to make things move through. So the first one will be Doug Vickery. Thank you, Mr. President and commissioners. Uh, I'm a Sublette County Commissioner and I would like to thank you for being here to present your stories, if you would, of a very important topic. I'm gonna to start my, it's a question really, and you all I believe have a copy of what I'm going to ask. I'm gonna start out with our companies. And when I say our companies, the folks who are in the industries that keep us going are also involved very deeply in our communities. And that's why I have chosen to say our companies. We operate based on existing records of decision and other aging documents. We have concerns that as these documents age, the BLM may decide it is time to update them, similar to how the BLM is revisiting the Rock Springs Resource Management Plan due to its age. If a corridor is des uh, designated, will that impact the updates of these aging documents? Will it affect the conditions of approval and development, restrictions and limitations? If the answer is yes, then this could have significant implications for both local and state revenues. We know how important that is. Without it, where would we be today? Do the rules associated with the migration corridor designation fix a problem? If it is not fixing an identified issue, then why make new rules? Last winter was devastating to the antelope population. We've been told that it was due to harsh winter conditions and illness. If the corridor had already been designated, how would that have helped the antelope? Probably not. We still would have had a harsh winter and we still would have had the devastating illness. Are we giving our federal partners a tool to use against the state of Wyoming with the current push to revamp federal and land use plans and policies? We've worked hard to partner with federal agencies for years. We would like to continue to work well with them, but let's use caution as we move forward. And I'm gonna leave you with this. The devil is in the details. Whatever those details are, we need to ferret out before we can go forward. Thank you. Commissioner. Hey, Commissioner Vickery. I know that you were also going to comment as a citizen of Sublette County. Would you 
prefer to do it while you're already up there at the microphone? Oh, yes, I, yes, I would. Uh, I'm going to ask this commission to consider putting a two-year moratorium on antelope hunt areas 87 and 88. The reason I'm asking that is this. I drive across the road that is designated 40 rod. It's between 189.91 and the core highway. For years during spring and fall, you would see four or five, 600 antelope moving back and forth. Last year, during the summer, we counted 12. 12. These areas have been devastated. And yes, the winters were significant in that regards. But I believe the commission can help rebound that herd if they say, no, thank you, we're not going to allow hunting in those two areas. Just as an example, the waste management, the landfill project in 2023, 1,245 carcasses were hauled in down there. That's terrible. Year before that, 231. That's significant. To date, been 24. So that tells me with the to date of 24, there's not very many antelope left out there. We need to take care of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next input would be Mark and Selmy. <clears throat> Welcome. President Ladwig, commissioners, Director Nesvik, thank you. I attended the meeting here in Pinedale when they had the, and it was well attended and it was uh, a lot of comment. But I, I would ask you to support this portion of it. And like you said, the devil's in the details. It sounds like the details are coming after this when you dig a little deeper, but we need connectivity. Uh, Commissioner, he lives out there by 40 rod. There's a subdivision that's posed right across the highway there and the antelope go through there. And there was no, we had the meeting with those people a couple of years ago to put 55 acre lots there. And I think if we had had this corridor designated, then we could show that to the developer. I think with the biggest threat to our antelope and some of the other game is suburban development. We've lived with oil and gas and uh, mining and they're, and they're good neighbors. And I think I, I don't see a problem with that. But the suburban development, the, one of the slides showed that since uh, COVID, the people moved in here and anybody that's lived around here can testify to that. But, uh, and then there was a story going on of these. Somebody said, well, you won't be able to walk out on your back doorstep if they pass this thing. Well, I want to tell you, I want to go on my back doorstep and my grand, I don't want to hear my grandson say, Grandpa, tell me about when there used to be all the antelope and sage chickens around here. And that's, that's uh, we've got to protect what we have. So I'd urge you to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owen Samuel. Nick Dobrik. Welcome, Nick. Good morning. Congratulations, Pre President Lod Lodwig, um, Director Nesvik, Commissioners. My name is Nick Dobrich. I'm from Dubois. I work for the Wilderness Society now, where we work to unite people to protect America's wild places. There was a joke years ago, I think, when Commissioner Ansami was on the commission about if you want to have a crowd at a commission meeting, just put big game migration on the corridor, on the agenda, and you'll get a big crowd. Well, I think that stands pretty well today. Our, our organization supports moving forward with the corridor, the designation process of this corridor, and we, we want to thank the department staff for all the work they diligently put into this process that was laid out from the executive order. As you know, as you've heard, it's been four years 
since the executive order was passed. And this is the first corridor that we're having moved forward. Uh, those four years, and, we, and this is the first one. Um, as you saw, the Forest Service back in 2008 recognized the same, the same herd on their land, on the Bridger Teton. Um, so it's been a long time coming. The Game and Fish, as uh, some more historical context, the Game and Fish was, the commission was presented with uh, moving forward under their existing process before the executive order back in 2019 for this exact corridor. Um, so it's a little bit like Groundhog's Day in terms of uh, going back, but this is a new process under the governor's executive order. And um, yeah, the goal here I would say is to give land managers, um, you know, county commissions, the state, the feds, all the best information to be make the best decisions. So when we have a project move forward, basically all the information that we know exists, it's not like, this is um, some surprise information that these animals are moving through here. It's modeled well, so we know where the majority and we have the numbers now in the specific spots and where they stop over. But this is not new information and it's to provide um, moving forward with to make the best decisions. Um, you know, I was really glad to hear Director Nesvik mention moving forward with the additional corridor, the Wind River Deer um, that's in my backyard in Dubois. Um, I'm really I'm excited to see that. But also when we were here in 2019, the, the other uh, herd that was for consideration was the Wyoming range mule deer herd. And I hope I hope the department and the commission also moves forward uh, diligently with that as well. You heard a little bit about private lands and how they're exempt from the any any regulatory protection, any regulations from your decision today. However, the benefits to landowners are outstanding. Um, it provides, if you see the, the funding priorities coming out of the federal government, USDA, NRCS money, those are directed at our designated corridors. So, and there's also been additional funds that, you know, this community in Pinedale has greatly benefited from all those dollars over the decade plus, um, you know, with Trapper Point, the wild, Trapper's uh, Point, the, uh, the crossing, a ton of fence dollars, conservation easements, money. So, you know, the benefits when a corridor is formally recognized and you know, identified and designated, um, you know, those those landowners within it is not the reg the regulations, it's the it's the really the positive benefits that could be shown. You know, I'm really excited for today that uh, this is finally moving forward. Uh, Commissioner Vickery mentioned uh, driving on 40 Rod, and I have uh, family up in the Upper Green, and my family drives up that road a lot in the fall and the spring. And you know, seeing those hundreds of antelope moving through that country is really special. And you know, Wyoming, we we have something really special here. I think uh, a lot of other states, a lot of uh, other communities, really envy what we have for wildlife in Wyoming. And this process will help us keep that, moving this forward to recognize this corridor to make the right decisions. Um, we'll make, we'll continue to make, you know, what we see so as so special for, for the pronghorn, for our wildlife. Um, so yeah, that's wrapping that up. Um, yeah, thank you for your time and I'll stand if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Jasmine Allison, please forgive me if I don't pronounce these correctly. You got it right. <laughs> <laughs> um, President, Director, Commissioners, Jasmine Allison with Pure West. Um, Pure West is a, a natural gas operator. We're one of the largest in the states, um, or I'm sorry, in the state of Wyoming. And we're here in Sublet County on the Pinedale Anacline. Um, and I would just like to highlight some of the op obligations that operators on the PAPA already meet with the approval of our BLM 2008 ROD SEIS, so our Record of Decision Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, and it guides us in how we're supposed to operate on the Pinedale Anacline, um, and we, we actually, it's not just guidance, it's what we have to follow. Um, it is significant effort and covers a large amount of acreage that the sublet antelope herd utilize. Wildlife considerations and relief were a top priority within the ROD. In fact, the spacing proximity of our pad locations is due to an effort for wildlife relief. 
um, there was only to be one well pad per quarter of land section, which means one pad for um, that 640 acres divided by four. Um, and that was from 2008 forward. And that was to allow for that range connectivity that you see out there. Um, our operator movement was also designated in the rod. At the time, there could have been upwards of 45 drilling rigs in the area. The Pindle Anacline was divided into five development areas across that long linear landscape. Um, and operators were to concentrate in one area at a time to allow for wildlife relief from the rest of that area. Um, then the operators progressed together and it was a very coordinated effort. Today, since 2020, there has only been one drilling rig on the PAPA. Um, this is due to efficiencies and advancements. We likely wouldn't see as many rigs as we have in the past going forward. The activity is not even a fraction of, of what it was. The operations today still have conditions of approval that include big game steps. We try to plan our operations as best possible to be outside of those stipulation windows and not just for big game, but for all wildlife. Sage grouse is also in this part of the country. Um, but due to the abundance of all these wildlife issues um, and concerns, that is difficult to, to make that schedule work. But we do work with all of our agencies to, to guide us in the best um, placement that we could be. Truck traffic was dramatically changed um, with the build of our liquids gathering pipelines. And this is significant because it removes that truck traffic um, on those roads where all of these um, species are at. The infrastructure has um, was also designed through our rod and the NEPA process, and it allows wildlife relief as well as a large emissions re reduction, um, which is just good for the environment in general. When we are choosing a new pad location, it is based off of our reach for bottom holes, the topography, and all of the environmental attributes, so not just wildlife, but air quality, and a number of other things, including water. Uh, we internally do our own NEPA, our due diligence for avoidance. We then meet with the best choice location with the Wyoming Game and Fish and BLM and third party specialists to work through any other avoidances or best practices that we could recognize. And this means that usually three biologists have reviewed a location before final decisions are being made. Our disturbance across the Pindle Anacline, which was evaluated for near 200,000 acres, our footprint is less than 2% of that, with 87% of the pad locations having interim reclamation. Um, in case you don't know what interim reclamation is, it's a practice of performing recontouring of our soils, reapplying topsoil and seeding. This is an important step in our disturbance efforts for multi-wall pads as the needed footprint for establishing wells is different than the life cycle of a producing well um, pad within two years or really the next growing season, then, which is in fall for us, um, post the drilling of the wells on the pad, the location goes into this interim reclamation. So like we're reducing the size of that footprint, it's getting revegetated and on average, that's about 70% of the disturbance that was initially needed to, to set up those wells to be drilled. Um, this initiation process is also captured in that same rod. Um, and these are heavily trafficked by wildlife. Um, the abundance of new vegetation is a draw for wildlife as opposed to decadent sagebrush in the background. Um, the rod has a matrix trigger with it, within it for species decline. Um, this is for in the event that we are having an impact on a species and they are declining. Um, that there's mitigation measures built in and put into place. And since 2008, there has not been a matrix trigger hit for the antelope, meaning they haven't had a significant decline that we have need to tailored something. Um, and these triggers are outside of weather and acts of God. Um, last year, a significant winter along with the mycoplasma bovis were the causes of significant decline. Um, for every well that we drill, $7,500 goes into a fund designated for mitigation and monitoring. And at this point, over $27 million has gone into that POPO fund for mitigation and monitoring. And these funds help support some of the, the world-class analysis that you are seeing. Um, 
We are also active beyond what is required with our rod. Um, we have been actively working towards wildlife friendly fencing change outs and fencing removal since 2015. After last winter, we expedited that effort and north of the New Fork River, we will continue that effort south of the river. This will mean all of our locations that are producing will have wildlife friendly fencing um, and those pads um, that have established reclamation will have no fencing. We're committed beyond our requirements um, for all aspects of the environment. And we do believe that there are enough provisions in place already to support the sublet antelope herd in the area. Um, we just thought it was important to share some of the information about what is already being considered and um, being followed. That's it. Any questions? Mr. President. Yeah. So Jasmine, thank you for that. So you know what we're being asked to do today. So what's your recommendation? I, I would pause. I know that you got earlier um, guidance to look at this separately, but I do think the Rock Springs RMP and what's happening with the sage grouse RMP and all of those things layered together um, are gonna have a significant impact for this area. So, um, and, I, and I do think that the stopover and high use areas, that those do cross over the anticline, um, but we have, I think enough provisions happening already. Um, so I think it depends on how you design what what the parameters would be? So if it's if it's high use and you're saying low use, what exactly does that mean? So again, devils in the details, right? Devils in the details. Yep, totally. Mr. President, yep. um, I have a question. On could you explain to me on uh, so most of the disturbance I see that's done throughout the the whole area is from roads. Do you have a what's your policy on reclamation of those roads. Uh, it seems like we have roads going every crisscross everywhere. Do we, do you reclamate those roads? Where, what's your policy? for? We do. Yeah. So um, the longevity of oil and gas, uh, you know, a natural gas pad could be in place for 30 years, meaning the wells could produce for, for 30 years or more, and you need access to get to that location. So you're going to have an access road when they are finally reclamated, like the, the gas wells are no longer producing, the pad goes into reclamation, full reclamation, and so does the road. During the course of the thing, do you, uh, going in with roads, do you plant things? Do you uh, make it more wildlife friendly on the side of those roads or just curious? Yes, um, and we talk about things like what, what's going to happen with our plowing effort, right? So if you have a big winter, making sure that there are breaks in that plow job, you don't end up with a six foot wall extending down beyond for a long stretch of road. Um, and the top, the topography really plays a lot into where we are. Um, you have to be able to have access with the truck, right? And it to be safe through the winter. Operators do visit pads every day. Um, so they have to be drivable, passable. So that's sort of like number one is the human safety aspect. But when we're designing them, we look at all of the features. So erosional, where they're maybe coming in relationship wise to like a sage grouse like perimeter or nests that are already in place. Or if we see the finger of a corridor coming across, we do take all of those things into consideration. For an example, how many how many roads have you specifically, you know, on reclamation have you done? Is there kind of a, you have kind of a general idea on how many you've actually completed? I don't have a number. I've been here since 2007. Um, it's not a lot. Um, and I, it's not a lot because we haven't had a lot of plug and abandoned wells. Like we haven't hit that final stage of our field. This is very much a very active field. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President. I, I didn't know if it's my turn. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, there are two things you don't have to convince me of. Um, one is that uh, the the companies that operate in Sublette County are uh, are good neighbors. You don't have to convince me of that. Um, I know there are exceptions to that, but 
you know. Well, thank you. Um, I, I recognize that and I appreciate it. Um, so, and the, the second one is the, you don't have to convince me of the onerous nature of the rules and regulations you have to follow. Um, I'm very well, I get it. So just so you know, those those two things, you know, I, I get. Um, I have two questions for you. One is, um, you mentioned a, a, a mitigation fund, $27 million mitigation fund. Is that held by your company? Um, is it, where, where is no, it? No, it has a board of directors. It's um, the Popo, um, and you have BLM, Game and Fish, um, a county commissioner holds a seat um, there. It's, um, yeah. Okay. Just, I want... I want that. <laughs> we have things to do. Yeah, um, and um, just, you can review their their information too. Like they they do a lot of monitoring efforts, so mm -hmm. you can see the data collected, and you can see the data right. on this antelope herd there yeah. as well. Um, and yeah, we're welcoming new mitigation projects. You know, we we don't get as many applications as we once did. Do you? Uh, Director Nesvik, is is uh, does the department play a role in that or apply for those? A apply for yeah, projects like, um, for funding. Yeah, it has to be a project, and it does get designated a point system, um, and then that board votes on the projects to to be done with those dollars. Yeah, and so we do. We have a seat on that board. Um, Deputy Director Bruce um, serves on that board on my behalf. All right. Thank you. I I wasn't aware. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, when you look at the at the maps as they are right now, is is there a place on uh, what would be probably a bottleneck or a high use area where you could point to and say, right there, that's where we're going to have a conflict. You, if you declare that a high use area, that's a problem for us. Yes. Okay. All right. I just I I just. I this is what I specialize in and asking really obvious questions. Um, so that's what uh, that's what I had for you. Okay, can I add the the three hundred foot or not the three hundred the buffer that adds? Um, we can see some places where that maybe doesn't make sense, and I understand that there'll be new. GIS layer that comes. And so we'll review that and we'll give some feedback to right. the team too. And and you understand that today it would be, um, does the commission want to identify this? Mm -hmm. And then those devilish details come into play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Steve Martin. Welcome, Steve. Good morning, President Gladwig, Commissioners, Director Nesvig. I'm going to make mine short. I uh, would like to thank the department for and all the hard work that they did putting all this data together uh, to show this corridor and to take this process forward. I would ask that you support the department's recommendation and uh, to move this forward to the governor. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Paul Ulrich. Welcome. Yeah, good morning, Mr. President, uh, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. My name is Paul Ulrich. I am vice president of Jonah Energy. Uh, I'm also a member of the governor's uh, Sage Grouse implementation team and wanted to chat a little bit about the issue today and, and give you some thoughts and uh, to an earlier question, give you perhaps uh, some recommendations moving forward. Um, first things first, um, you're probably going to hear, you certainly have heard, Mr. President, uh, from your team about the need. Um, uh, I assume at some point during public comment, you're going to hear some some other versions of whether or not there is a need. And I'm not here to debate that or get into that particular issue. I think you're going to hear from quite a few folks on both sides. 
uh, I would ask you to take a hard look at what the need is. Is there a significant and relevant decline in population? Is there a significant deviation from historical migrations uh, based on the perceived or real threats? And, and I assure you, there are certainly some real threats. I think those are two really important questions we need to ask ourselves if a designation is made. Uh, is there a threat to the population and have we seen a deviation? Uh, and I'm not sure that threshold can be made. One of the other questions uh, I have is uh, heavy reliance on the GIS data, and I want to give you two examples. Um, uh, Director, if we could, I don't know if we're able to pull up that map um, that shows the 100 down to zero combined model. I think that's the correct one. You know what? Just the overall. Okay. Yeah, where the analysis was conducted on 100% disturbance versus zero. It's on page 15 of that PowerPoint. Excellent. Uh, Mr. President, members of the commission, I want you to focus on uh, the triangular blob that is southeast of Big Piney, that is my field, that is the Jonah field. If you look at that map based on this analysis, uh, which is part of the threat assessment, you would assume that 100% of that 30,000 acre Jonah field is disturbed. I can assure you it is not. Uh, what I can tell you is we've got, uh, we've got a few thousand acres of active disturbance. We also have 7,400 acres of reclaimed disturbance in the field that is more productive, more utilized uh, for sage grouse, for pronghorn, for insect viability uh, than what we see in undisturbed acreage within the Jonah field and without. So if you take a look at what is being labeled as 100% disturbed uh, with that uh, intactness value, it doesn't tell you the whole story. And if you zoom in, which we can't to this map, section 32, in the heart of the Jonah field, what you're going to see is a stopover area for pronghorn. That also happens to be my inventory. So uh, Mr. President, I wanna point out that there are concerns I have regarding GIS values and, and the use of GIS and GIS only to make a determination and a recommendation that are not ground truth. If they're stopping over in my inventory yard on a consistent basis for the last 20 years and getting a cup of coffee and, and having a visit with my field crew there, I'm somewhat unaware. Um, and, and I think that's an issue. I also wanna cover some of the threat assessment uh, uh, protection measure uh, protection measures that were listed and most importantly were not. Um, if you look at uh, where we are today, we've got existing NEPA over a wide swath of what is proposed uh, in some of these quarters between the Pine Island Clyde record of decision, the Jonah record of decision, and the normally pressured Lance record of decision. Um, uh, uh, those offer significant uh, uh, protections today. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we certainly have sage grouse core uh, that offer existing protections above and beyond what, we, what we've seen. I really do wanna talk about uh, risk uh, and the risk and potential risk of what a designation might mean. And I wanna make this very clear. I'm not concerned in the least on what Director Nesvik and his team is gonna do. We have worked with them for years and we have an outstanding working relationship and there is no problem we cannot solve together. My concern is not the Wyoming Game and Fish actions, stipulations or other measures based on a designation, nor is my concern the executive order or process. Uh, to be quite honest with you, Mr. President, uh, I, I like the fact that we have a process in place with lots of opportunity for public comment, interaction, and at the end, doing what we do in Wyoming best, making decisions for us, by us, 
uh, for, the, for, for us. My concern is what a designation signals to our friends at a federal level and the authorization that it allows them. And, and that there's certainly a, a, a very significant concern I have about the unknown and the unintended consequences of this designation at this time, and I'll get to that. Uh, we put ourselves in a position to seed control prematurely when we don't have a decision on the Rock Springs RMP. We're going to see major, major, major uh, challenges uh, uh, and land use planning changes proposed range wide for sage grouse by Friday with maybe an end date in a year. Us starting this process now puts us walking into the process, both eyes closed. You don't have enough information, in my opinion, to even conduct a reasonable, thoughtful risk assessment. Uh, and threat evaluation, not until we have clarity and resolution of land use planning that's ongoing in the sage grouse amendments. So I think that's a real big issue. Uh, if our goal is consistent management stipulations, um, I, I, I think uh, a designation and initiation of the process today is premature for that very reason. Uh, you don't have resolution on a major land use planning effort just to the south of us, and we don't even know the massive amount of threats that we may be facing uh, that would change the entire scope of a threat assessment uh, based on the sage grouse amendment, uh, which are coming down. So, Mr. Chairman, I excuse me, Mr. President, I'm going to try to be real brief here, um, attempt to. In that light, I do want to read a line from the executive order. Now, therefore, to preclude any need for more regulatory action or action by agencies beyond the purview of the state. We don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. Having said that, I think the process and the integrity of the process is important. I would recommend one of two possible options for you, commissioners. Uh, one is to delay a decision today until we do have resolution uh, of the land use planning effort to the south of us and resolution or at least more clarity uh, on the sage grouse amendments. Uh, or two, conversely, uh, given I do have a tremendous amount of faith in my Wyoming Game and Fish Agency, uh, you go ahead and vote to move this forward with a pending decision based on the Rock Springs and sage grouse issue pending any action moving forward. So what you could do is make the designation, recommendation for the designation today uh, and defer any action, including development of a threat assessment and development of um, your risk, excuse me, your risk assessment and threat evaluation until we have clarity on those federal actions. Uh, I don't believe for a minute that you can make, excuse me, the agency, uh, can make a proper, well thought out, measured risk assessment or threat evaluation until we have clarity on what those threats are. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioners. Appreciate the time. Sorry to be long winded. Thank you. So, Any questions, real quick? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Rich Gunzel. Ginzel. Ginzel, sorry. President Ladwig, uh, commissioners, uh, Mr. Uh, Director Nesvik, thank you for the opportunity to come and comment today. My name is Rich Ginzel. I live in Laramie. I'm a retired wildlife biologist. Uh, used to work for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. I'm a certified wildlife biologist. I've been working on pronghorns since 1978. And so I'm fairly familiar with a lot of the pronghorn uh, data in the state. And uh, I was a member of uh, the pronghorn working group the department had. But for full disclosure, I want you to know that I get most of my income from overriding oil and gas royalties from Sublette County. So just so you know, uh, I strongly recommend the commission vote to proceed with the designation uh, this process, uh, let's look at the big picture. I think it's prudent. Uh, the sublet herd is one of the most historically, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
largest and also one of the most significant in Wyoming, if not on the whole planet. Uh, it's probably the poster child for migration corridors has been through the path of the pronghorn and other things. This is one of the longest term and best documented migration routes for any pronghorn population I know of. The general migration pattern had been known to wildlife managers um, for probably about a century, but it's been studied in much greater detail with GPS collars and um, more information. So there are more threats today on these populations than we've seen before. Uh, Wyoming pronghorn populations seem to be less resilient than they used to be. And based on over 40 years of my experience uh, looking at them, they don't respond after severe winter like they used to be able to. And so I think that's a fairly uh, significant concern. Fondo ratios are declining um, um, pretty much in a lot of places. There's a brand new paper came out in January of 2004 on looking at productivity specific to Wyoming. If you'd like a copy, I'll give this to you. Um, but it documents the, uh, that there have been some long-term declines. The, um, um, this is from 1984 to 2019 is the period they cover. So it doesn't even cover last winter's uh, mortalities and stuff. But um, so there's, there's a lot to look at. Maintaining the status quo is not going to get us back in recovering pronghorn populations anymore, I don't believe. The migration corridors have not received a lot of consideration in the past land use um, management plans compared to things like a crucial winter range. The um, moving the de designation process forward really helps us to maintain these um, valued wildlife resources. It encourages cooperation and it also um, helps to identify opportunities for the, for the future. So uh, please vote to continue the designation process for this migration corridor. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. President, I have a question for Rich. Rich, I have nothing but respect for your career and your knowledge of pronghorn. So I think you're the right person to ask. We have a lot of public comments about the size of the area and distinct populations that migrate within it. Would it be better to have individual migration designations or this large proposed landmass for a migration area? Well, I think that's part of what this next process would help you to identify is to look at by segment and things like that. But I think if you look at it compared to mule deer and um, other species, you know, that have long migrations, one of the problems you have with pronghorn is that they're somewhat opportunistic. And so some of them are migratory, some of them tend to be resident, some of them tend to be nomadic. I had collared pronghorn that would stay on their summer range through a, a mild winter, whereas other ones were obligated to have to come out of higher elevations. We don't know what a bad winter is gonna look like. Pronghorn don't deal with snow anywhere near what other uh, species can do. And so a lot of times their options are, they're kind of limited. So I think, you know, I would, I think the big look is, is certainly worth it. And from an administrative standpoint and different jurisdictions and consistency, it might be good, but, but the next phase should break it out by segments and you can see if it's got, um, you know, there's more merit to looking at it that way would be my. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, sir. Would you like this? Yeah, I, I think we'd make a copy of it. Sure. You bet. Thank you. Mike Smith. Welcome, Mike. Thanks. Thank you, President. And, uh, Director Nesvik, Commission, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Mike Schmidt. I uh, reside in LaBarge, Wyoming. I was raised here in Sublette County, spent my entire, not my entire life, but all about 10 years. I pray every day and thank God every day that my dad found uh, Daniel, Wyoming from Detroit, Michigan. So all but 10 years I've spent right here. Um, I, uh, I've been in the oil and gas business my entire life ever since graduating high school here in Pinedale. Worked in the field a little bit myself, and then I ran my own businesses for the last 40 years here in 
Sublet County and part of Lincoln County. Um, if I have your permission, President Lagwood, I do have a, uh, a uh, handout I'd like to pass out to the commission. Sure. If that'd be possible. Thank you, Mike. So what I've got here is it's a uh, called job completion reports done by the game and fish department. Um, I've been to a lot of these meetings uh, on this corridor and other others. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about the threats, the impacts, um, even dollars, risks about the pronghorn herds in the sublet pronghorn herd that we're specifically talking about. But what I haven't heard much about or anything about is the actual numbers and how development has been affecting this pronghorn herd. As you can see by that handout I just gave you, the prong, let me back up here a minute. The objective per game and fish is the, the sublet pronghorn herd of about 48,000 animals. Objective is 20, plus or minus 20% either way. So that's anywhere from 38,400 animals to 57,600. I went through and gathered up this information from the Game and Fish Department. I'd done, I'd done a, like a 32-year analysis. And the reason I, I chose 32 years is because I wanted to start before any of the development happened with the Jonah Field. McMurray Oil, we'll just kind of walk down through this real quick if we can. McMurray Oil had their first three discovery wells about 1992. They really kicked the field off in 1995. The Pinedale Anticline was kicked off in the early 2000s, 2001, somewhere in that time frame. The peak drilling activity in both fields came about 2003 to 2010. There are around 60 drilling rigs, plus all the infrastructure going on. Um, compressor stations, pipelines, well location construction, reclamations, production facility hookups, you name it. It was all happening during that time frame. And I really want to want you, you to take a look at that because during that time frame, in that peak drilling, is when these pronghorn numbers hit their highest of, of the 32 year period I've got in front of you. There were over 60,000 animals at one time during the peak development years. Then we had a harsh winter in 2016. We knocked a few animals back. Over this 32 year period, this pronghorn herd has averaged nearly 44,000 animals, damn near right on target with the, with the objective of game and fish. 21 of those 32 years, or 66% of the time they were at or above objective only 11 years below objective, and two of those years were, were 38,000, just a couple hundred animals short of the bottom end of the objective. The years of 2000 to 2022, when all of the GPS work was being done, the herd actually, the average herd number actually increased 40 to almost 45,000 animals. And then of course we had a brutal winter of 22, 23, which really wiped out the herd. So before I go any further, I think what really needs to be um, highlighted here is the job that the Game and Fish Department has done through the development, the discovery, development, and the ongoing production of these, these two mega fields, some of the largest natural gas fields in the country. They've done a hell of a job managing this herd.
I, as an oil and gas operator, somebody that's been in the business my entire life, it's hard for me to support this corridor. I just don't see the need for it based on what I just gave you. I don't do this a lot, so my mouth's getting a little dry. <laughs> I'm just afraid that any further designation over what we already have, we have mule deer designation corridors. We have the sage grouse core areas. We've now got the Rock Springs Resource Management Plan up in front of us and, and additional sage grouse potential issues coming up. I just don't see another layer of government regulation helping any industry at all, whether it be oil and gas or agriculture. It's just, it'll be another tool that's being able, will be able to be used by special interest groups or even the federal government at some point down the road. Commission's gonna change, all the players here will change at some point. But what we do today can be used against industry and agriculture down the road. And I think that's something we really need to consider. It's really important for me. I, I, I like to say I run a company. We've got 60 to 70 employees, about a $3.6 million a year annual payroll. This could have a big effect on what we do at some point down the road. I'd like to see my kids and grandkids stay here. As you make your decision today, and ponder, I, I, I've got a few things I'd like you to ponder as you make that decision. Is oil and gas really hurting this herd? We were contracted last winter during the, the harsh winter 22-23 by the oil and gas operators to run around and pick up a uh, dead pronghorn. We picked up over 1,500 of them. It was sickening, but a lot of those pronghorn were laying against production units and production tanks. And the reason they were laying there is because they were out of the wind. They were using the heat produced by those facilities. And yes, the majority of them were laying up against there, but we'll never know how many pronghorn survived because of those facilities. We'll never know that number. So please take that into consideration as you, as you make your decision. The Jonah Field and the Anna Klein are 25 to 30 years old right now. Every pronghorn in this herd, all 40,000 plus of them before the brutal winter, know nothing else. From the time they hit the ground, they've been in this oil field. That's all they know. And they've survived and they procreated and they've done well. They've maintained a herd objective through all those years. I just don't understand how it can possibly detrimental or affect them. It just, the numbers don't prove it out. If this designator, and I, I heard the question earlier, if this designation would have been made, what would it have done for this herd? I don't see anything. How will it help the herd if we, if we advance the designation process? Is it gonna increase the herd? I mean, how much better can it get than nearly right on the target with the objective? If we lose oil and gas and we lose agriculture, and I'll use a comment made by Commissioner Anselmi, especially agriculture. If we lose more agriculture because of these kind of processes and regulations, we're only going to see more suburban development on these ranch lands. That's the only way those families are going to survive, is to sell that land. And that what comes with it is development, more development the very thing we're trying to avoid and protect these animals from. In closing, 
Game and Fish's tagline is conserving wildlife, serving people. Let's not forget the people part. We need the people part in order to conserve wildlife. We got to have the people. And if there's nothing here for the people, what can we do for wildlife? Thank you. Any questions for Mike? Before he runs out? I forgot about that part. <laughs> Guess not. Thank you, Mike. You bet. Thank you. Appreciate it. Zach Key? Welcome, Zach. Where are you guys? <clears throat> President, uh, Mr. Nesvik, the commission, thank you for having me up here today. You guys put me right in front of lunchtime when everybody's ready to check out. So I'll work against against that here. But mine's short and sweet. Um, I'm not going to repeat a bunch of the comments that have been said today. I'm an oil and gas. I'm, I'm an area manager for a company called SOS Well Service. And uh, I manage 60 employees. And I, I want to give you guys a snapshot, a couple thoughts. So if you guys look at the maps that were presented today in that in the uh, uh, presentation, you'll notice in those maps that where that anticline is, where that Jonah field is, it's it's rainbow colors. It's it's gray, maroon, yellow, every single color there. What that's showing you is those those antelope are in that corridor. They're in that that place they need to be, and the oil and gas is not affecting that now. I do want to be clear that I do believe that the biggest impact to us is residential development. Houses never go away. They just flat out never go away. I don't care if they're 100, 150 years old. You can drive through Kansas and there's, there's just old houses there that, that are crashing to the ground and they're still there today. Oil and gas goes away. And when we go away, we leave uh, uh, the, the area better than we've ever than it existed before. I mean, we're doing all the noxious weed stuff every year. We're, we're providing better forage for the animals. I mean, we take our job serious. And I was glad to hear today in these uh, presentations that some of the people said that we are good partners. And that's, that's a change in verbiage I haven't heard in a long time because I've always felt like we weren't viewed as good partners and I know we are. I mean, SOS Well Service, to list a couple things, we uh, wrapped a uh, swab rig, a half million dollar swab rig and a conservation wrap. It's got a bison, a pronghorn, a mule deer, a sage grouse, all on that encompassing Wyoming. And every single year we take some of our gross profits that are sometimes not even there and we issue uh, money to, uh, to the wildlife fund and we issue that, that money for these, these highway crossings. So to hear that we're, we're good stewards was, was uh, nice to hear today. But with that being said, I just wanna hit the last layer of this. So. Me as an area manager, I'm managing 60 people, four workover rigs, four swab rigs, 17 roustabout crews, contract pumpers, pipeline operators, everything you can think of. I, I have as many headaches in, in a different way as you guys. And with that being said, there's a lot of work today. And, and, and where, why I'm worried about the federal overreach down the road is where I'm going with this. There's a lot of the work I do today. I, I, I can't even describe it. November 15th, I'll put it in simple terms. November 15th, I lay people off. I tell them that they have to go home and tell their families that they're out for, out for work till May 1st. Why is that? There's so many layers to the, to the uh, regulation today. I mean, we got the sage grouse, we got the burrowing owls, we got raptor stipulations, we have the mule deer uh, corridor. Now we're gonna have the sublet corridor. And I'm not saying that we don't do that. I love wildlife as much as everybody else. But what I'm asking you guys to do is be very, very thoughtful in the process of developing that, that uh, program. Because today, if we can't do the work with it, three days or less, it's probably not going to happen until those corridor stipulations lift. Today, everything is reviewed so deep and in so much detail that a lot of the projects are held off. They're not economical. There's too much regulation in, involved in everything else. So, so today, the business of oil and gas is already extremely tough. And the thing that everybody needs to think about is, is we are the majority of the tax revenues of this state. The energy and oil and gas, coal mining, all that is the majority of the revenues. Our kids' as iPads in school, our school buses, our fuel, our, our uh, you know, everything that we do in this community, as everybody knows, 
is, is primarily funded by our energy in the state of Wyoming. And I just ask that, I know this corridor is gonna move forward. I just ask that we're very, very thoughtful about it and understand that all the layers that are already in place today make it extremely difficult for us to operate. And I'm just worried that this will be another layer of things that are gonna make it extremely difficult to operate. So that's all I have today. Any questions for Zach? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Megan Riley. Welcome. Hello, President Ladwig, Director Nesvik, members of the commission. Um, my name is Megan Riley with the Wyoming Outdoor Council. And on behalf of my organization's membership, I wanted to add our voice of wholesart wholehearted support to the department's recommendation to move forward with this process. I don't have much to add that wasn't covered in the presentation that we all listened to, but I would like to point out that it's a lot easier to maintain habitat integrity than it is to try to restore something after it's been degraded. And I think anything that helps our biologists have a say in keeping this habitat functional for sublet pronghorn is a good thing. And I would urge you to vote in favor of the department's recommendation. And I thank you for the opportunity to comment. Any questions for Megan? Thank you. Josh Metten. Welcome, Josh. Hello. Um, congratulations, President Ludwig. Um, Director Nesvik, members of the board, my name is Josh Metten. I'm the Wyoming Field Manager for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. I live in Cody, Wyoming. I have a lot of fond memories of uh, both getting to hunt antelope um, within the sublet herd and also um, enjoy experiencing them in places like Grand Teton National Park. Um, this is a truly an iconic herd and I appreciate the work that our biologists have put into this proposal and your consideration of the designation process. Um, the TRCP was part of a coalition of six Wyoming uh, sports people's organizations who sent a letter of support for the designation process. We encourage you to continue moving forward with that um, because it provides the opportunity to get into the details of um, the concerns that we're hearing today. Um, so we would ask that you do that. Um, Wyoming is changing. Um, we've, we are gonna continue to see population growth, um, especially in this, this part of the state due to the abundant and beautiful um, resources that we have here. Um, people want to live here and that's gonna continue. Um, another area that I wanted to highlight um, is the TRCP is currently working on analysis of the, the solar PEIS, um, Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement. Um, and one area of concern with that is that there is a significant um, acreage of conflict between areas that could be leased for solar development and um, important wildlife habitat. Crucial winter range and existing migration corridors can help cover some of that, but with in just looking at the proposed corridor for sublet antelope, there is a significant area of land um, that could be open for solar development. And that is an, ex if you get a solar field, that excludes wildlife. We have already seen that happen with Sweetwater Solar. So I would encourage you to move forward with this process and, um, and also other designations because that provides us with the tools to address concerns like this. Um, as a state, we can take the lead and be the ones that are dr driving forward with this instead of being told by the feds where we're gonna develop solar, where we're gonna develop things. Um, I My perspective on, on a, moving forward on this versus waiting is that if we, 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 we should move forward as a state and we should be directing and leading the voice of how we're, how we're managing migrations in Wyoming and we and, and, and not doing so we're, we are opening up the opportunity for um, the feds to come in and try and tell us what to do. And I don't think that that's what we want to do as a state. I'll stand for any questions. Mr. President, I have a question. Go ahead. Explain that on the solar thing again to me. Um, 
explain what you said about the solar. About solar? Uh huh. So the solar PIS is currently in draft form, and there are they've they have an identified acreages of um, of land that would be um, could be proposed for leasing uh, for for a solar development pro project. Um, there's we're we're doing a mapping analysis of where those areas are and if there are conflict areas. Um, we'll be submitting comments. I know the Game of Fish is submitting comments. Other organizations are submitting comments on that. And if we can get out in front of that and sub and um, and propose areas for exclusion to that that will would not be developed, um, we can avoid conflict. There's currently the potential for build out of solar in Wyoming means that there could be we could build out all the solar we want in the state. Um, while avoiding conflict, um, high conflict areas for wildlife. And that's what we'd like to see um, with that. Well, and I don't know if I'm right, but from what I read from the RMP, the federal government is kind of given a blank check for anything that was a green energy, as far as access and stuff from the RMP. Yeah. I don't remember which plan it was that I seen, but it, it had kind of excluded you know, if it was a solar or a wind farm, it was going to be okay. But if it was oil and gas or coal, it was going to be bad. That's kind of what, and so you're saying that, that it, um, that your opponent is saying that if, for us to designate the corridor is going to help with going against the solar? It, providing designated corridors can provide an opportunity to identify high value habitats to avoid and, and ask for exclusion of those habitats for, from, from development from, from solar. Mm -hmm. And so we don't currently have that with the sublet antelope corridor. And so it's hard for us to ask to not develop those corridors because there isn't a current, it's not currently designated as a state. Because the RMP I read was, was uh, they were absolutely for solar and green energy so i and this is this is a different process from the rmp yeah. okay thank you anything else thank you thank you <clears throat> megan smith Mr. President, the Commission, Director Nesvik, thank you for having us today. Megan Smith, I'm with the Board of Supervisors of the Sublet County Conservation District, and thank you for being here. Um, on behalf of the Sublet County Conservation District, I stand here today to voice our support for you to move forward with this proposed corridor designation. Um, we'd like you to move forward and complete this biological risk assessment. The Conservation District would like to stress that the department does keep in mind our prior uh, concerns that we already um, submitted in our written comments as you move through the process. Um, but thank you today again for being here and letting us show our support. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Colin McKee. Is he online? Online. I see him here in the room. Good day. Oh, Can I hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, can. great. Great. Uh, well, thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Colin McKee. I'm a regulatory affairs director for the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. And so, uh, President Lagwood, congratulations on nomination and commissioners. Um, I uh, hope everyone's having a good day. And I will say quickly, Commissioner uh, uh, Masterson, very good to see you. It's been way too long, but um, congratulations on the appointment. So there, there's there been a lot of ground covered. Uh, I think I've scratched off most of what I intended to talk about today. Um, the one thing I do want to, uh, uh, I guess, impress upon is 
um, oil and gas industry is concerned for how the federal government may intend to use uh, a migration corridor. And, and we, we do have you know, very fresh memory of, of how far their intentions could go with um, the Rock Springs Resource Management Plan. Uh, there, there is a migration corridor uh, within that BLM field office. And what the BLM was was um, intending to do there was to make the entire corridor uh, no surface occupancy within the corridor and a half mile buffer on either side of it. Uh, and they were also proposing to withdraw the whole corridor from uh, mineral leasing and to make it a rights of way exclusion area. Um, the, the the comment period for the Rock Springs RMP on the draft just finished up a couple of months ago. I would expect we'd see a final of that uh, in the next couple of months, and so we'll we'll have a better indication of where the BLM really intends to go with with management of a migration corridor. But um, you know, compared to more nuanced management philosophy from the Game and Fish Department, where you have different areas identified and and commensurate um uh management techniques in there the blm just did a blanket um no surface occupancy and so when you when you look at the um, proposed corridor in front of us today it right now covers 2.8 million acres and 2.1 million of those acres are federally managed um and so and and, and a lot of those acres that are federally managed overlap with where uh current oil and gas activity is occurring so um, so we, we do, like I said, just it, it's unfortunate that we have a fresh, uh, fresh memory of, of how far the feds may go with something like this. Um, but we, we certainly do appreciate the work of the department. Um, I think that was really, oh, one other thing, I'll uh, throw a shout out for, for solar projects or any large industrial projects. Um, the state of Wyoming has a process through the industrial siting council. Where, where large industrial projects are reviewed uh, and, and it goes through a consultation uh, with, I believe, about 20 other state entities, including Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And, and I believe it was due to the poor siting of a solar project a number of years ago that solar energy is now uh, jurisdictional through industrial siting. Um, so I, I throw that out there. Um, I, I appreciate the two um, proposals that Mr. Ulrich provided to either, you know, defer action today, or um, if you do propose to move forward, um, make it contingent upon, you know, the department's ability to incorporate what's coming in for Sagehouse RMPs and Rock Springs, incorporate that into the um, risk assessment so we have a, a real look at what, what this corridor would accomplish. Um, but any any waiting would not have an effect on on their solar projects industrial projects would still um, have the ability for the state to review and and append any mitigating uh, um, conditions so with with that happy to answer any questions and thank you again for letting me attend virtually any questions i guess i mr president um i one of my questions is, is and, and it's been suggested for waiting, and then on the other hand, everybody's saying, oh, you can't wait or the feds will have it all. Is, could you address that a little bit for me? Uh, yeah, Mr. President, well, it, it would be my, my best guess is that if the state of Wyoming moves forward and designates uh, a, a migration corridor here, that increases the likelihood that the federal government would um, would want to incorporate the migration corridor into their land use plans. So, so, you know, I think, I think that's, that's the concern, um, you know, considering all of the, the uh, activity mitigation activities that, that Ms. Allison and, and others had, had spoke about, you know, it, it seems that there's, there are a lot of, um, things in place that are protecting the herd. I think you can choose kind of, uh, well, yeah, there, there are lots of things in place protecting the herd, but I think that's the concern is that if the state starts to move forward in this, it encourages the federal government to do the same. Um, and, and then it gets to a place where we don't have as much control over what they ultimately do within the corridor, if that helped. And did, and I, 
I just well, I kind of like to hear from Angie if you got it <laughs> or no. I, I I'm just kidding. I mean, you know, because I'm just not, you know, for so long it's for my opinion it's it's been that the we the state's rights we want to have it we want to do our own corridor we want folks of Wyoming to be part of it we want to make our own thing. Now I'm hearing that if we do that, then the feds are going to jump on board with that. My understanding was they would, we would, we could come back to the Fed and say, we've done it. So I didn't know. So, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think we kind of need you here. Was that to Angie or me? Angie. Yeah, for Angie, real quick. Okay. Um, Mr. President, Director, Commissioners, great question. Um, you heard a lot of testimony about and public comments regarding. Um, let the state lead, let the state continue to lead. Um, you know, some of the great things our governor has done is put this first ever and only executive order in place for migration corridors, which has some protections on them. The best thing I like about this executive order is the fact there are no stipulations in it. I know you heard that word today, but it's very specific case by case basis. So we can continue to work with our stakeholders like the oil and gas folks and others to find a way to develop that continues to sustain the corridor. This question though about the relationship with a new designated corridor and the federal government. Gosh, I wish it was in our control, but I think that's what you heard today is the unknown and what we're sort of tossing back and forth is how this influences today, but really tomorrow. In the Rock Springs RMP, it talks about those protections on migration corridors, and it also says any future corridors identified by the game and fish. So it lays it out pretty clear in the draft. That is an Alt B. Now, if they would go with the cooperator Alt D in the language of the migration corridor that's in that alternative, it refers to Governor Gordon's executive order. That's what we'd like to see. Thank you for the NGO conservation community in the room, um, Petroleum Association and others who also put that in their recommendations to BLM that that's what they would like to see. So it's really incredible that the stakeholders in this room are all on the same page saying, let the state continue to drive the bus. I think one other thing to toss around, even though we seem to be on the same page, again, not having the ability to control what the, what the federal government does, is what if we don't do anything? What if we don't move the corridor forward in identification? What does that say to our federal partners? Does it say that Wyoming is taking a step back from migration, being a leaders across the nation? So. It, there's a risk there too. If we don't do anything, the risk may be that they need to step in. As we know, and as we continue to say, the federal government today wants to have a piece of migration. They wanna have their name on it. Um, so I have no doubt that if we don't go forward, they will continue to try to have their name on it as well. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think what it says is there's risks either way. We just have to sort through the noise to see which way we want to go. Thank you. Sorry about putting you on the spot, but we needed you. Anybody else have anything for Mr. McGee? Thank you, Colin. Appreciate your time. Matt. Okay. That has a trio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's not what it says on here. <laughs> <laughs> President Matt. Ladwig, Director, members of the Commission, thanks so much. My name is Matt Cousacrio. I work with Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Um, on behalf of our member supporters, um, our organization, we'd ask that you uh, pursue the designation option. Um, and I just want to re-highlight a couple of things that have been brought up, um, both 
through the department's presentation and um, some of the comments, but um, Wyoming leads the nation in migration science. Um, Jill Randall mentioned some of the best people that are working on creating the maps and, and um, highlighting the, the migration routes, the corridors, the models. Um, we, we have some of the best terrestrial migration ecologists in the world working at UW right now um, and working hand in hand with the department to put some of these things together. Um, so if there's questions about why the maps look the way they look, um, we've got the right people to answer those questions in the state here. Um, Deputy Director Bruce really did touch on um, sort of the next main point that I wanted to, to raise, and that is about the relationship between federal and state control. The designation provides a recognition of important habitat, right? And, and then it, it gives the state the department and the commission a louder voice when it comes to um, when it comes to federal actions that um, land management actions that impact the state's wildlife. The state has a public trust responsibility to manage wildlife, and obviously, federal land management actions impact those decisions. But having a louder voice, um, recognizing the importance of, of specific habitats, lets the commission, the state, the department speak eloquently and, and explicitly about those habitats that matter. Um, we've heard a little bit about uh, you know, so, some of the existing regulatory um, issues that um, producers have on the landscape right now, but the way that the executive order is crafted, um, permanent, you know, currently authorized activities that are already existing, permitted prior to a designation of a corridor are not subject to any of the issues, right? So if we get a if we get a corridor designation eventually, the state's not going to suggest um, that there be existing stipulation or regulation on activities that are currently already permitted. And then number four here, um, although the executive order doesn't specifically impact private lands, as has been mentioned a number of times, the designation, again, a recognition of the importance of the habitat does provide some prioritization for some federal programs, some other dollars to come into conservation measures for private landowners. So, you know, we heard about maybe the loss of agriculture should a designation happen. Um, a designation actually offers those agricultural producers a another channel to, to access some federal funding um, through partnerships like the USDA Migratory Big Game Initiative. Um, and I think that's all I've got. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Thank you. We're getting close. Linda Baker. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. President, Commissioners, Director Nesbick. Uh, my name is Linda Baker with the Upper Green River Alliance here in Pinedale. I'm a landowner and a stakeholder in Sublette County, where I've been a resident for 43 years. I timely submitted a comment letter to the Game and Fish Commission and Department regarding the Sublette Pronghorn Migration Corridor Threat Evaluation. <clears throat> Today, I'd like to make three additional points for your consideration. Point number one, and I know you've heard this before, local control does not apply to local, private, or federal lands. The first recommendation from state and local migration corridor working groups emphasized the importance of state-led state -led management. However, the governor's executive order only applies to state permitted projects on state lands. The EO doesn't apply to actions taken on private lands by private landowners. And the EO doesn't dictate federal policy on federally managed lands. Wyoming's control of Wyoming's wildlife does not apply to private or federal lands where migration corridors lie. Point number two, economics, prices, and the world's demand for natural gas are the major drivers of natural gas development in the United States. It makes sense that designation of the sublet pronghorn migration corridor may be a concern for natural gas producers and the state of Wyoming's economy. However, in the past eight years, the United States has become the world's number one supplier of natural gas, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Europe has become the biggest importer of American natural gas, 
while China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Vietnam are expected to be the main growth markets in the future. It comes down to economics. The U.S. natural gas price experienced a 62% drop in 2023. Record high natural gas production that outpaced growth in natural gas consumption was the primary driver of lower prices in 2023. Production continues to grow in the United States, which keeps prices low, while there is a major demand growth in the rest of the world. Point number three. The Commission's decision to designate the sublet pronghorn migration corridor is the only truly local management decision within the Commission's power. The Upper Green River Alliance respectfully requests that the Commission follows the science and department recommendations to designate the sublet pronghorn migration corridor. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Sarah Domek, Domek. She's on Zoom. Mr. President, Commissioners, and Director Nesvik, thank you for the opportunity to comment. <clears throat> I'm Sarah Domek, the Migration Program Director for the Wyoming Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. I'm based in Dubois, but I grew up in the Kendall Valley, so this is um, close to me personally and professionally. Um, the Nature Conservancy has worked alongside partners within the Sublet Antelope Migration Corridor for over a decade, particularly supporting and connecting landowners and agencies with resources, such as the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, a precursor to the Big Game Partnership Program through the USDA, to assist willing landowners to make on-the-ground impact through conservation easements, habitat leases, wildlife-friendly fencing, and enhancements within migratory big game habitat. We're truly invested in the collaborative process to identify solutions that can serve wildlife and support the economy. Um, I think it's important to point out that the people of Wyoming um, support corridor protections. When you look at polling across the state, it shows that 64% of the people of Wyoming view conserving land corridors, which wildlife use for migration is extremely or very important. And it also reveals that people of our state know how important it is to preserve family farms and ranches and open spaces. And um, we're confident that Wyoming can and, and will conserve migratory big game herds, but it's timely and important to do so with this designation process moving forward now. Um, TNC strongly supports the, the recommendation to pursue the designation process and um, especially want to point out that those federal funding access opportunities as part of this opportunity is a really important um, aspect. So thank you for your service to Wyoming's wildlife and attention to this important issue. Are there any questions for Sarah? Thank you, Sarah. That's all the uh, comment forms we have at this time. Could we go ahead and vote or take a... Well, you can have some discussion with the commission. Okay. We're get cutting short on time. Is there any commission discussion on this process? Mr. President, yes. I was just gonna see if um we could pull up that the 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 chart on where we're at now and what's been asked for us to do. It's page 22 in that presentation. Thanks, Wayne. I think, Mr. Mr. President, I guess while we're while we're pulling that up, it's a really interesting conversation about urban sprawl and density in Wyoming. So, what do we hate more? And so, it's something for our communities to think about as we continue to grow. Um, we might want to think about some of those things inside of our towns to make density a little easier instead of moving that outside that, that affects our wildlife. So, now that's me talking as a, a commissioner, a, a game and fish commissioner. Mm -hmm. I'll let you other commissioners figure that out. And Doug, I think I have a question for you. So my understanding is we're, 
on this chart less than halfway through the process, but time-wise, because this started in, in April of 2020, a lot of that research that, that we've done, that's been, I mean, we're compiling all of that, a lot of the things that we saw earlier in this presentation. What is your what is it your anticipation? Because your recommendation is to take the left arrow, not not for us to to identify a corridor now, but to take the left arrow over to the to the to the next row, I guess, and and have the department um, pursue that designation. What's your what the question is? What is what is your what is the potential timeline to get to the first stakeholder input box and then the second stakeholder input box? Yes, Mr. President, Commissioner Bell, um, it is a staff's recommendation that we, um, the commission, identify the corridor and then we move, start moving on the left path to um, create the biological risk assessment. Okay, so, so you're asking us to do both of those? To, to make a vote that identifies the corridor, that is our recommendation. And then we will start the process to come back to you after we do a full um, biological risk assessment. So just to be real clear, Mr. President, if I may, the commission does have the option to designate the corridor, but not move, move to the next step. Okay, so that's where the yellow box is right there, um, just straight down. But what the department's recommending is, is that you don't go to that step. You go, you identify it and say, move on to the designation process. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, thank you. I appreciate that. But I think I have another question now. So <laughs> does that allow us to pump the brakes? I guess um, it, it looks like it does. If we, if we move on to uh, pursue the designation of the corridor and the department does the risk assessment, we take more stakeholder and, you know, more yes. stakeholder um, input. We can, at that point, how long does that take? And then because I'm looking at this, it, then we actually make, we, you know, we're actually making a decision at what point then. So I'm, I'm curious on the timeline. Um, and I, the reason I ask is because the, of the, the things that are coming out in the, in the Rock Springs RMP and, and sage grouse implementation plans and those kind of things. So I'm curious how that time frame you think will, how long will that take the game of fish to do that? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Bell, um, we believe that we can start working on that, but it'll take us, um, you know, with all the analysis and all the outreach, we'd be looking at the later this year when we would have something um, that we'd be comfortable bringing back that has the detail of that analysis. So. Yeah, I would say, I would just add to that, Mr. President, we control the timeline. There's no forcing mechanism in that process that directs a timeline for us. And, and, you know, I, I'll add a few things here. I think this might be the right time. So, you know, first of all, there's been some excellent points made here today. And the bottom line is, is we cannot be assured of what decisions the BLM is going to make in the future. Um, I think that the, the point that was made by Mr. Ulrich about, you know, how can you, if you don't know what those major land use decisions are going to be, how can you do this biological assessment? And, and my, I think that's valid. Um, I think my response to that, though, is, is if the commission does move this forward, we have the ability to control this timeline to where we don't complete any biological risk assessment until we have close to completion or we know where these resource management plans or other sage grouse amendments or other plans are going. Um, I, I think we can do that. You know, the reason that I've felt strongly that we needed to bring this forward is because I do believe that when you weigh the risks, we Wyoming is in a better position when we are leading and we need to lead on this issue. Um, we've done it before and been successful. I have a lot of disappointment in what came out in the draft um, Rock Springs RMP. Um, there's a lot of things in there that, you know, we really felt strongly what should have been deferred to the state. Other land management decisions have deferred to the state successfully, but there is still, I have hope that they will, respond to the governor's task force and the recommendations that came in basically kind of round two of commenting and that they will um, defer these decisions to the state, as Angie pointed out in alternative D. Um, it is important to, to realize too, as Angie brought up, that identification in our governor's executive order does not necessarily mean the same thing in, in, in the federal government. They're 
use of the word identified does not refer in any way to our executive order. They could interpret that any way they want. They could say, yeah, in accordance with the executive order, or they could say they identified it because they put it on a piece of paper. Um, I think that's important for, for folks to remember. I think it's, it's an advantageous that we're able to, with a straight face, make a recommendation, not just here, but on anything, defer to the state to manage the wildlife that we have sovereign authority to manage unless they're listed. I feel strongly that we are always in a better position if we're able to say that with a straight face because we do have a plan and we have thought this through and we have good science. Um, you know, why th there are some excellent questions here today about, so why is this needed? And I would say, first of all, I do think that the leadership role is really important, but I think it's important to remember when the governor contemplated this, it was a long public process to develop the executive order. Um, really, when you boil down what, what um, the executive order sought to do was to, on a case-by-case -case basis, figure out ways to do our absolute best to not have surface disturbance in the most important habitats. That's at the end of the day what the, what the EO attempts to achieve. And, um, and I think to this point, we've achieved that and we've done it cooperatively with all, all stakeholders. Uh, I think that doing this gives some guidance. It does not, um, it does not have an effect on private land. However, it does give local governments that do make decisions on private land with zoning and those kind of things, something to refer to. This is an important habitat. It's a, it's a migration corridor. Um, and then I think, you know, lastly, I would say that it, it does, as it's been pointed out today, that it does an identification or a designation does prioritize conservation focus. So whether that's because of funding or whether that's because of habitat improvement projects or actions, there's a lot of ground across the state where we have needs, but we don't have all the resources to do that. Migration corridor or habitat, other habitat designations give some guidance and prioritization. And so with that, Mr. President, I would stop and ask if I... So in a, in a question, go ahead. Uh, no, Mr. President, Mike, question was going to be after your comments. I thought you were making comments. Um, you don't know what my comment was. I don't. So, <laughs> so I think uh, I'm, I'm kind of hanging with Rusty here. I, I kind of understand our flow chart, but then we're just going to give a recommendation backed with our science to the governor. What's the governor's process then for a designation? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he has to run it by attorney general Hill and more layers because I, I, I strongly support Wyoming taking the lead, pending it doesn't hamper oil and gas, and it doesn't set us up for the unknown with those outstanding federal agency actions. So, Mr. President, Commissioner Brokaw, following, if, if the process was to move forward um, and we came back to the commission, um, we could come back with one of two recommendations. One would be yeah, you should you should recommend to the governor that he designate this corridor, or it could be, no, don't recommend to the governor that he designate the corridor. If the answer is, and the commission accepts it, recommend to the governor to designate the corridor, then he initiates his own process of a robust public engagement. You know, when we did those um, processes in the three mule deer herds, some of them lasted several months, some of them lasted a couple months, but it is an, an engagement with a local working group made up of all the stakeholder groups, made up of local county um, governments, commissioners, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's a whole nother consideration and set of public input that's specific only to the designation part of the process. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Mr. President, may I? Yes. Um, I'm uh, I'm really uh, wrestling with this um, because I hear I'm hearing both sides of the story, and um, I think everybody uh, I really appreciate the points, and I think everybody has a good point. Um, Mr. Ulrich, now I don't see him. There he is. Um, I I appreciate your points and uh, those made by what was it? 
Pier West. Um, I appreciate that. And, you know, the good neighbors always come to these meetings. So, you know, the troublemakers, you know, they kind of skip them. Um, and I hear what you're saying um, about this turning into a cudgel, um, you know, or BLM leveraging it somehow. Uh, and that's possible. That's absolutely possible. Um, but what's what's tipping the scale for me is doing nothing and giving the, and, you know, not, get, if we do nothing, then what are the, what does our, what do our friends in Washington do? And the potential for what they could do, um, at least we're doing, we're showing something. We have science to back it up. If we attack the Rocky, uh, the RMP, we can show why we did this and why it was a better solution. And it gives, I almost see it as a defensive move for us, that it might be better to, that it is better to do it because then we can, we can at least put a flag in the ground, <laughs> literally. Um, I hear your concern, um, but I also hear uh, a department, I hear uh, the public, I hear um, support for this and um, I, I would support pass, passing this along for a, a more detailed analysis um, by the department, your risk assessment. And uh, please, uh, I'm, I'm talking to Pierre West and Mr. Ulrich because I wrote your names down, um, and, but please participate in this. Um, we really need you to participate. And your, your comments are constructive and helpful, and please bring them at all stages, okay? Um, I, so I just, I guess I just wanted to comment. I support it, and I appreciate uh, and uh, would adopt Director Nesvik's uh, expression of the need for it. Um, I think he did it better than I. So with that, uh, barring other comments, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion. Um, or Mr. Brokaw, Commissioner Brokaw could have the honor. No, um, I was just going to say, I, I would like to second what I think you made was a motion, <laughs> Commissioner Masterson. I saw the red light, so I thought you, uh... anyway. Um, so I would move to identify the corridor and continue the process to further evaluate the sublet antelope migration corridor for potential designation. And I'd note that I just read uh, that off of the memo. So for purposes of the minutes, you can use that. That would be my motion. I'd second that motion. Okay, motion has been made and seconded to have the department identify the corridor and then go into the steps needed to designate the corridor, which is involving uh, input from stakeholders, uh, bio biologic risk assessment, so on and so forth. Is that correct? With the person that nominated and seconded? Uh, I, uh, I'll, I want to make sure that the language is right for the for the motion. I just read it off of the memo, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. So yeah, the way I understood um, the motion was that oh, we have a hand up back here. If you want to wish to entertain that, I like what I've heard today, and I wanted to just make sure that I think as part of the, from my understanding, as part of the uh, 
the process of doing the assessment is a step that has stakeholder input. That means the community two, and the people are going to be steps. involved. Two steps. Mm -hmm. That there's two different chances for stakeholder involvement in the process. So I think I hope that answers your question. Okay. So the motion Did you that have I anything to say? No. I was just going to say that the way I understood the motion was is that the the commission would vote to approve the department's recommendation to identify the corridor and move to the next step in the designation process. And that that's, I think, summarizes the motion. He's, he's less wordier than I am, but he got the message across. Is there any further discussion? The, Mr. President, I think on this, on this flow chart, the actual decision may not even come until late this year or potentially in 2025. So this process is still going to be uh, take a while, um, which it should. A lot of stakeholder input, which is the people, which is the people speaking for the animals and the people speaking for oil and gas. I think that's really important to, to Commissioner Masterson's make sure that we have all those stakeholders, which is everybody um, involved in that process going forward, which is going to take most of another year. 12 months probably. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess we're ready for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. You have your directions to identify a court order and carry on. Thank everybody for your input. Appreciate Thank it. you. I think we're going to... Yeah, I'm back at 1.30. Yeah, what time is it? Yeah, like at 1.30. No. I think that's we was going to be back at 1.20. So. Good number. Yeah, for the public, too, we're, we're going to probably adjust the agenda to, to move the next topic to later in the day or tomorrow. And then uh, so we can move on to the next two agenda items. I know there's a lot of folks here that are here for the feed ground plan, and so we want to make sure we get to that this afternoon. We're recessed till one thirty. For being here, thank you. Uh, we're going to start the afternoon off with uh, talking about the uh, mule deer research efforts in Wyoming. Uh, Dr. Hall, Mr. Freylake, Dr. Monteith, you're on. This one? Oh, yeah, that one. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, President Ladwig, uh, Director Nesvik, members of the commission for allowing me the privilege today to give you an update on uh, the department's mule deer monitoring program. So uh, as, um, as President Ladwig mentioned, my name is Ember Hall. And I'd uh, before I begin this overview, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author on this presentation, Lucas Olson. Let's see if I can find the right button. Nope. I did, okay. So in uh, 2022, you may remember that you approved what really is a state-of-the-art monitoring program for mule deer populations in Wyoming. And I'll pause here and say, this is a state-of-the-art program for Wyoming, but it's also a state-of-the-art program in the entirety of the West. This is a very robust program that's giving us really good information on what's going on with our mule deer populations across the state. The program focuses on six areas that we consider critical to management. For purposes of today's discussion, I'm just gonna talk about four of those. Maybe. There we go. Um, so those, those four are disease assessments, some reliable information on herd size, access to data that's accurate and immediately available, and then meaningful assessments of survival and some related parameters therein. 
So we'll get started first with talking about reliable information on herd size. So a cornerstone of management is really understanding how many animals you have in a population. And that seems easy, right? Like if you wanna know how many animals you have, well, just go count them. And that seems like something that's really straightforward. But in reality, especially with cryptic animals like mule deer, it's kind of a tricky business. And for any of you that have hunted mule deer, you understand that, right? You can sort of gain a ridge, set up, and be glassing, maybe see four or five mule deers in a, in a basin, mule deer in a basin below you, and then something changes. The light changes, animals move, you move, and you see, oh, wait a minute, there were three others that were hanging out there in the trees. So those are the sorts of things that we have to think about when we're trying to get an accurate, an accurate assessment of abundance or how many deer we have in a herd. So the industry standard to address this is what's called sightability surveys. These surveys are very robust. They're also very time time intensive and expensive. So in the past, prior to the initiation of this program, we had the resources to collect this type of survey information on one herd per year. Now there are 37 recognized mule deer herds in the state. It's not difficult math to understand that it would have taken us 37 years to get this kind of reliable information on all of our herds. With the resources that you awarded to us, along with some efficiencies we've been able to gain in our survey design, we conducted these surveys for eight herds last year. Those are shown in the sort of beige color on the map, as well as eight herds this year. Those are shown in the green color also on that same map. You'll notice the Wyoming range herd. It's sort of the, for those that don't know, it's kind of that blob shaped herd over on the Western side of the state. For that herd, it's, a, it's neither green nor beige, and that's because we did a very, we took a really unprecedented step, and we surveyed that herd two years in a row. You don't normally need to do anything like that, but managers in particular were really interested in being able to quantify to the best of our ability what was going on in response to the, the winter that we experienced last winter. So... One of the most important things that influences how many animals we have in a herd is how well different age and sex cohorts survive within that herd. Now, age and sex cohort, that's just a fancy biological way of saying adult females, adult males, and juveniles. The way that we monitor survival is, as many of you probably know, is through the use of GPS collars. Those are shown there on the right-hand side of the screen. GPS collars can let us know when and where an animal died but we have the added advantage because they are recording locations for us, we have the added advantage of being able to learn a ton about these animals while they're wearing the collar. So we can think about things like movement patterns, seasonal, uh, seasonal range use, drivers of herd performance, effectiveness of habitat treatments, and the list sort of goes on and on. So having these collars is just a real treat to be able to learn a lot more about um, the animals that we are managing. So starting in November of 2022, uh, we identified in collaboration with the department's mule deer working group, we identified five herds that we wanted to enroll in an, in, in, in an intensive study program. I'm going to highlight these herds here on the map for you because um, we are going to talk about them kind of <clears throat> on and off throughout these slides. So we'll start in the east and work our way west. So the first herd is the Laramie Mountains. That's the, far, the herd in the far southeast corner of the state. In the center of the state, we have the Sweetwater Herd. Kind of north central is the North Bighorn Herd. Over by Cody and uh, Yellowstone National Park, we have the Upper Shoshone Mule Deer Herd. And then finally, where we're sitting today is the Wyoming Range Herd. Now within each of these herds, we um, marked 80 does, 30 bucks, and 100 juveniles with a collar. When I say juveniles here, I want to be clear. These are not what we would call neonates. These are individuals that were at least six months of age. So we conducted that first round of captures um, in November of 2022 to January of 2023. We did a second round of captures that we just wrapped up in January of this year. The purpose of that second round of captures was really to just do what we call maintain sample size. So collar individuals to replace those that died and then uh, replace collars for any individuals who, um, whose collars had, had dropped. Our juvenile collars actually drop in most cases, not all, they drop in the summertime. So we wanted to mark a new cohort of juveniles for study. 
I'm really proud to say that we're 16 months into this effort and we're already learning new things. And I wanna share just a couple of, the, couple of those things with you today. So when we began this project, one of the really core tenants for us was making sure that we were providing data to managers on the timeframe that they needed to be making the decisions that we need to make as managers. So a near real-time data component was, was really critically important to us. So in collaboration with the University of Wyoming, Dr. Jared Merkel, we developed these um, sort of weekly email updates. So at the beginning of the week, Every manager in each of these five focal herds receives an email that says, this is how many animals died in your herd over the last seven days. These are how many animals you have remaining on air. And then they're served up an interactive map. And this interactive map lets them see movements of individuals that have occurred over the last two weeks. So it's providing that real-time, hands-on data to our managers that we think is, is critically important. Now, as the data accumulates sort of week after week after week, we can start to learn a lot about these bigger picture ideas and bigger picture questions that we have. So what we wanna share with you here is information on survival for the calendar year 2023. So from January 1, 2023 through December 31, 2023. I'm gonna walk you through this figure orientation because I'm gonna serve you up three in a row. So kind of orient you to what's going on here. On the x-axis or this horizontal axis, we have month, so, so essentially time. And on the y-axis, we have percent survival. It's probably pretty intuitive, but at 100% survival, that means every individual that was marked is alive. It's a very happy place to be. And that, of course, continues all the way down to zero, which is where everything that we marked is dead. And that is a very unfortunate and very sad place to be. We have an inset map there so that you can just sort of remain oriented to where these herds are in space. All right, so first up is the doe survival that we saw over the last calendar year. There's a couple things that are probably gonna jump out at you pretty quickly. One of them is that the Wyoming range had a very different survival percentage over that time frame than the rest of our herds. I'm not gonna say too, too much about the Wyoming range because we have the good fortune of having Gary Freilich, the district biologist for this herd here with us today, along with Dr. Kevin Monteith, who's done quite a bit of work in the Wyoming range over the years. So I'm not gonna say a whole lot about that right now, but just note that there is a significant separation. And a lot of that, of course, is due to, to the effects of this last winter. The rest of our herds group pretty closely up towards the sort of 70 to upper 70% survival range. That's a little bit lower than what we see in one of the more authoritative studies on doe survival from Colorado, Idaho, and Montana. So not quite where we would want it, but, but certainly moving towards that end. The other thing I'd like you to notice from this figure is that if you're an adult female and you can survive from January to say June, in general, after that, you're doing pretty good for the rest of the year. There's some wiggle room in there, but that is definitely the hardest time for these animals. And I don't think that's a surprise to anybody here, but I think it's worth pointing out just while we have a visual to look at. We see a very similar pattern for bucks over the last calendar year. Again, Wyoming range coming in quite low, but the rest of the herds really being in that sort of 50 to say 70% range. A couple of things you can notice here, bucks do display that same pattern of, of sort of needing to get through those winter months. You can see the effect of harvest on bucks as that picks up in September and October. Um, so sort of an artifact of the math that I just wanna make sure you're aware of here is that it, it does look like these numbers are dropping really quickly for bucks. If you'll remember from a couple slides ago, we only marked 30 in each herd. So it's sort of like a proportional loss, right? So for like every buck that we lose, it's just a bigger drop and that's nothing to do with the ecology and everything to do with the math. So the last cohort we wanted to show you is the data from those juveniles that we marked. Um, last winter was hard. If you lived in the Western side of the state, nobody needs me to tell you that. Um, if you were a juvenile mule deer in the Wyoming range, it was incredibly hard. So every single one of the marked individuals that we had in the Wyoming range did not survive to the end of our monitoring period. And one thing I will draw your attention to here for juveniles, we monitor survival 
um, from January 1 through about the end of May. So this is a little bit different sort of time horizon on your x-axis than we showed you previously. But that was a that was a shocking number. I think even as we realized the winter was going to be significant, I'm not sure anybody would have said it was going to be that significant. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The remaining herds, 41% for uh, sweetwater juveniles, all the way up to just shy of 70% for the juveniles in the Laramie Mountains. These numbers do spread out a little bit. We sort of expected that, right? So if you're a juvenile, and this, you know, this holds for like most mammalian taxa for sure, and probably most animal taxa in general, the juveniles have it the hardest, right? You're small bodied, you're often naive, you don't really know how to navigate the world. So we expect to see kind of more variable survival for juveniles and also lower survival relative to those adult counterparts. I wouldn't put a ton of stock in these numbers in isolation. I'm pretty excited to get data from the next couple of years so we can better understand what's going on kind of big picture with these, um, with these younger animals across these five herds. All right, so I've talked a little bit about winter. Um, I think it's important to put some context on winter and so that's what we're trying to do here. So for this map that's here on the left-hand side, this is a depiction, there's a bar across the title there, but this is a depiction of the number of days where we had greater than one foot of snow on the ground. And on the left, this is showing you the, the average, right? So for the last two decades, basically, this is the number of days where you have more than a foot of snow on the ground. And the, the colors here correspond to that beige color is zero to 30. And then the numbers sort of the days sort of accumulate in magnitude as that blue color darkens. So on the left is what it looks like normally. On the right hand side is what we saw last winter. So the winter of 22, 23. Obviously there's a lot more blue on that map for 22, 23, but I want you to notice that there's not a lot more blue everywhere. So in particular, I'd encourage you to pay attention to these two areas that I've highlighted here with this dashed circle. Essentially, these two areas, this is where we're seeing a very substantial change in terms of this winter metric, in terms of the number of days where you've got more than a foot of snow on the ground that these deer have to navigate. Definitely very, very substantial changes there. But also note, there aren't substantial changes statewide. So another way to kind of think about this is for each of these five herds, we've calculated the number of days above that sort of usual number in which those animals had to deal with more than a foot of snow. So in the Wyoming range, it was really big, 68 days more that those animals were coping with this foot of snow on the ground compared to what they would in sort of that, that two decade average. Sweetwater that in the center of the state follows sort of closely behind there, also experiencing that pretty significant winter. But the Laramie Mountains, Upper Shoshone, over by Cody, North Bighorn, just west of Sheridan, they really experienced, based on this metric, a pretty normal winter. That doesn't mean that there wasn't winter. It doesn't mean we didn't deal with snow, those of us living in those parts of the state. But it just means from a, from a deer perspective, it wasn't nearly what those other two herds experienced. And I think this is important to remember. I think the narrative is kind of out there that winter was bad and winter was bad everywhere. That doesn't really seem to be the case for all of our big game herds. So I just urge you to kind of keep that in mind as you move forward and you're thinking about the ecology and biology of these herds. We get the question a lot, how does this winter compare to last winter? That's what we're showing here on this figure. So on that horizontal axis, we have the week of the year. So starting with January 1st, all the way to June 18th, 2023. Last winter is shown in that darker green color. 2024 is shown in the gray. And the number of mortalities experienced during each of those weeks is there on that, that vertical axis. Um, so if you ask me, how does this winter compare to last winter? I'll answer you very truthfully and say, we're not sure yet. Right? We know that we have, we can get late spring snowstorms here. We know that Wyoming sort of deals the winter that it wants to deal. Um, so we don't know, we're certainly not through winter, but based on what we've seen so far, the comparison between 2023 and 2024 is that we are seeing fewer mortalities. And that's really good news for these deer herds. So we talked a lot about snow. 
Um, snow, of course, is not the only thing out there that, that kills mule deer on the landscape. So when we started this program, we decided to, or you helped us decide, to invest very strategically in two herds. And these two herds are where we conduct what are, what's called cause of mortality work. This work is incredibly intensive, it's very costly, and it takes a lot of staff time. But at the end of the day, it's worth it, and it's really the only way that we can sort of critically deduce what's causing deer to die in, in um, our herd. So we picked these two herds for a number of reasons that I won't go into now. But basically what happens is those of us involved in the project, the local managers, as well as those of us on the statewide team, if a collar goes into mortality, we get, a, we get an alert and staff sort of snap into action at that point, securing permissions and getting out to investigate that mortality just as soon as we possibly can. Now, there can be a gradient of what you find when you arrive, and I'm sure some of our key staff on the project can tell you there can be a huge gradient in what you find um, when you arrive. It's, it's really always sort of a kind of a case by case situation. Sometimes we have really nice intact carcasses like what you see on the left there, and we can do a, a really wonderful full necropsy. And sometimes we get to the site and all we have is a collar that's left. Obviously, we can't deduce a whole lot from a single collar, but we do everything that we can. So what I'm going to show you right now is some very preliminary data just from the past um, year from these two herds, and it's a partial assessment of the cases that we're working on. We are working in collaboration with a pathologist um, who just, it takes time to go through all of these cases and assess all of the tissues that we are collecting. And my hat's off to Dr. Sam Allen and her team for really helping us navigate this part of the work. So. The first thing I'll say is we found a lot of collars that didn't have carcasses connected to them. That is highly disappointing. Um, we expected it, happens all the time in these sorts of studies, but you always want to answer that question that you're setting out to answer. So we are making some adjustments to our collar programming to try to help with that, to be able to report a little bit more robust information. But for now, I can tell you of the cases that we have been able to assess, it is the leading suspects that you would sort of consider when you're having this conversation. Disease certainly is playing a big role in some of these herds. Of the testable samples that we were able to collect and submit from these two herds combined, 15% of those tested positive for chronic wasting disease. We also have seen a number of cases of emaciation, which can signal any host of other factors that might be going on, as well as, of course, predation, vehicle collisions, and then trailing pretty far down the list and only applying to our male cohort, we do see um, mortalities as a result of harvest. Okay, everything I've been reporting on here has come from collar data. I did want to very briefly daylight for you that we've had a really cool opportunity to pilot some new technology as part of this project. Um, these are solar ear tags. They are really, they have the potential, I'll say, to be really useful for those animals that we wanna outfit with some sort of an instrument, but whose necks are going to change size during the period in which they're enrolled or under study. So that's of course your, your rutting males as well as growing, growing juveniles. So we've been piloting these tags. I'm not gonna get into a lot of the detail here, but I'll say preliminary results indicate they could be a good option. They do have some trade-offs. They can't carry as much data as our collars do. They have ripped out in a couple of cases, but on balance, we're pretty pleased with this performance and we think they may be able to offer us an alternative for those animals that can be a little bit trickier to fit with a traditional collar. Okay, I'd like to spend my, my remaining few minutes to talk, switch gears a little bit and talk with you about the newest component of this project. So this um, component that I'm gonna talk about was part of the original vision that was approved in 2022. It just takes a little while to get some of this stuff up off the ground. So just last week, we wrapped up captures of 120 elk in Southeast Wyoming with a very um, tight focus on the influence of elk harvest pressure and basically how that harvest pressure influences things like elk movement, herd behavior, and mule deer distributions. So as those of you, I, I suspect most of you are probably aware that we do have Elk populations that are well above objective in many parts of the state, and in particular in the south and southeast part of the state. So uh, hunt area six, especially managers have 
really stepped up alongside sports persons and landowners to try some new tools and techniques to bring that population within objective. They've set out to do that over a pretty limited time frame, and what that means would be a, if, if we're successful in this effort would be around a 60% reduction in that elk herd over a relatively truncated time frame. The really nice sort of natural experiment that we have here is that this elk reduction does correspond to the Laramie Mountains mule deer herd where we already have, we already have marked mule deer in place. So it's a nice opportunity to be able to take advantage of management actions that are already happening, already on the ground, to be able to understand how these um, changes in elk abundance might be affecting mule deer, as well as um, elk vulnerability to harvest, which of course is of prime interest to our managers. From a management perspective, um, we are really eager to understand a little bit more about how we can shape vulnerability of elk to harvest, get better harvest on those individuals that, that we're trying to remove. Um, also allow us to better understand these formation of for the formation of large herds. Those of you familiar with elk ecology may know that in some places they can form into, re, excuse me, really large herds. Like we're talking 300, 400, 800. They can form into very large herds. So this work is going to help us understand when, why, and how those large herds form. And then, as I said before, hopefully provide us with a lens of how mule deer respond to a given level of elk reduction. That's the majority of what I have for you today, except to say that I'm pretty sure there are about 50 people that could be up here talking to you about this project, not just me. Um, I want to give a, a tremendous shout out to all of the field managers. This project operates in almost every region, and we absolutely could not do this work without them. They are as instrumental as anyone to making this project happen. We also lean heavily on a number of work units and four out of five divisions within um, the department. So uh, thanks to all of them. And then finally, a big thanks to our partners. Um, again, we couldn't do this work without strong partnerships and particularly a really standout partnership that we have with the University of Wyoming. That's everything I have for you now. I would defer um, President Ladwig to your judgment if you wanna take questions now or if you wanna wait for the other two presenters and take them as a group. Later. Okay, great, thank you. Next. Mr. Braley. Thanks, Amber. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Wyoming Range Mule Deer Managers, uh, I want to extend my thanks to you for allowing us this opportunity to present and showcase the Wyoming Range Mule Deer Herd. It's been an important component of the state of Wyoming and arguably the Intermountain West for many, many years. And I think the program today, I think, will solidify the importance of this herd, uh, not only to the state, but as again, to the Intermountain West. The history and current status of the herd uh, is long in its longevity and interest. Um, it goes back to 1982 when some of our predecessors who initiated the, the Wyoming Range herd uh, first conceptualized how to go about understanding the connections and the factors that make the Wyoming range such a unique, uh, not only area, but a mule deer herd. Our predecessors had an acute understanding of people, habitat, land use, predation, and the item that's going to receive a great deal of discussion uh, over the last year, and certainly today, is weather. So what we want to do is establish those connections, understand those connections, and do our level best as deer managers to portray those to you and the public. The Wyoming Range Herd is one of the largest mule deer populations in Wyoming, arguably uh, in the Inner Mountain West and, and probably even in uh, North America. It extends on the north from the Snake River Canyon on, in this area, uh, all the way south, 
to I-80 encompasses 5 hunt areas. It's managed by three wildlife districts, Jackson, Pinedale, and Green River. Uh, it's also, to me, uh, a herd, uh, uh, one unified herd, but a deer herd that comprises two parts. And of those two parts, a uh, lion, its many differences and connections. It's also one of the uh, uh, one of the most important deer herds in, in our, certainly to our constituents. Uh, it's as diverse and divergent as our publics are. If you look at the land ownership, uh, the different type of landscapes, uh, the geology, the plant communities, and the people that come to the Wyoming range to hunt, photograph, and observe big bucks. Uh, there's no other place like it. Uh, what I also see, and what many of you may not be able to understand or pick up, and this is, is a puzzle. And so it's incumbent upon the Wyoming Range Deer Managers to understand what the pieces of that puzzle are and come to better understand how we can portray those to the public uh, through our efforts at data collection. Pieces of the puzzle typically come to us in the form of data sets. And when it comes to managing the Wyoming Range Herd, it's really actually pretty simple, at least on paper. Our population objective is 40,000 deer. Uh, we strive to maintain 30 to 40 bucks in the postseason. Actually, that's 30 to 45 bucks in the postseason population. And uh, uh, because it is special management, that's why that uh, criteria of 30 to 45 bucks is really a centerpiece for special management deer herds in the state of Wyoming. The Wyoming range is one of seven uh, to eight herds, I believe, in the state that are managed under this special management designation. Another objective that we have is to promote population growth. And that's pretty easily done because we haven't, we typically have not harvested the reproductive segment of the population. That would be doe deer. And uh, we haven't done that in at least 30 years in the Grays River, which uh, many view as the deer factory of the Wyoming range. So that's the, one of the major uh, ideas and concepts on how we want to promote population growth. Another goal is to retain bucks in the post hunt population. And we do that by ensuring that we don't hunt bucks on the winter ranges. We don't hunt them during the migration, the fall migration that is. And we do our level best to make sure that those seasons uh, are designed to ideally end uh, before any substantial weather event occurs or more importantly, perhaps, is not run the season, on the, especially in the north areas, into uh, the October 15th elk hunt, or even close to it. We wanna to try to minimize uh, buck harvest because in my humble view, I think the, the retention of bucks in the postseason population, uh, arguably, uh, these bucks are just as important to us when the public can see them on the winter ranges after the hunting season as they are when they're pursuing them in the high country of the Wyoming and salt ranges. Uh, with that in mind, we try to close the northern areas, 143, 144, 145, uh, on or before October 6th. Uh, we minimize that chance of, of weather uh, making those buck deer vulnerable. And so even, even with that in mind, uh, two years ago in 2022, our hunting season was still one of the longest mule deer hunts in North America, certainly in Wyoming. On a general license, it was uh, 22 days. I alluded to earlier about the pieces of the puzzle, and there are many pieces in the Wyoming range, and it's incumbent upon deer managers in the Wyoming range or any deer manager anywhere, perhaps, to come to understand and identify what those pieces of the puzzle are. And so I'll run through a few of them, and, and they are many and diverse. So we have a component that we uh, try to monitor and make every effort to monitor uh, disease uh, surveillance in the Wyoming range herd, much like we do throughout Wyoming. Uh, specifically uh, chronic wasting disease and try to keep uh, uh, an idea on, on the prevalence and where it's occurring in the deer herd. Um, one of the things that we try to do too is understand and, and really try to minimize and eliminate highway, highway mortality. And Mr. President, um, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't um, recognize the commission for their support on, in my view, one of the uh, foremost conservation success stories in modern Wyoming range history. And that's the, the construction and completion of the Dry Piney Project, uh, which was completed last year. And that 17 mile stretch of Highway 189 
uh, between Big Piney and La Barge um, uh, is nothing but a success story. The animals are using the underpasses in mass. Uh, the fence that guides those animals to the under, underpass structures uh, is, a, is a total success story. And it wasn't that long ago when uh, 150 to 200 animals, mule deer, were were killed by vehicles on this stretch of highway. So um, uh, certainly a, a salute to the commission for your work with YDOT and, and making uh, a success story out of the Dry Piney Project, which has been a long time in coming. Other factors that go into pieces of the puzzle in the Wyoming range is um, certainly with the predation and large carnivore management, the commission has stepped up in, in addressing those issues. Um, in my, certainly uh, winter mortality, which may be uh, the ultimate arbiter in determining population growth in the Wyoming range is a big deal. And uh, Ember just talked a, a little bit about uh, that uh, and the importance of winter mortality, especially after the 2023 winter in the Wyoming range. And I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment as well. Um, the other thing we do is we manage and really document uh, harvest. And, and we want a really good assessment and, and understanding of, of harvest mortality, uh, age class of animals. And so what we do every year is, is we man the, sorry about that. We man check stations and in the field, we check uh, harvested animals. And of course, uh, what we do in, in the Jackson region is we man the Grays River check station. You may understand or realize that the Grays River Check Station is one of the longest running check stations in Wyoming, perhaps even uh, Western United States and North America. It's been in effect since 1929, and we make every effort to man that check station every year uh, to collect the information that we need to better manage the Wyoming range herd. As you know, some of the biggest and best bucks in North America come from the Wyoming range, and we take great pains to uh, not only uh, examine those bucks, but to collect the data. And so what we've been doing uh, for over uh, close to 35 years is we've been measuring buck deer that we examine with uh, spread and then the um, number of points per antler. And amazingly to me is that uh, the potential of this herd is phenomenal. And, and I think the antler data uh, uh, will reaffirm that. And in fact, uh, in, in most years, up to 40% of all two-year-old bucks are four-pointer or better. Certainly uh, almost 80% of all three-year-old bucks are four-pointer or better. And so uh, that ability for this population to produce trophy class bucks uh, is, in my view, certainly unrivaled. The other thing that we try to do is we, we collect biological sample, biological data, and we do that um, with what I call the keystone data sets. And uh, those are ratios, uh, buck ratios and fawn ratios. The way we do that is from that helicopter, that's called a Bell 47 helicopter. We, deer managers, I climb in that helicopter every uh, November or December, depending on, uh, uh, depending on uh, budget and schedules. And what we, wh what we do is we conduct our surveys. And what you see here are, are two different types of surveys uh, and two different flight patterns that uh, allow us to collect two different sets of data. Uh, the first set of data, uh, what we call composition, and the second set is called abundance. Uh, everyone wants to know, as I alluded to a moment ago, the buck-doe ratios. And the way we collect that typically in November, December is, is by flying the core winter ranges uh, in that helicopter. And so we can uh, count and classify enough uh, sufficient number of deer to derive our buck ratios and our fawn ratios. A little bit more later, a little bit later in the program, I'll describe uh, our abundance surveys, uh, which will be coming up. So from those uh, composition surveys, uh, we are able to derive uh, fawn ratios in this case. And you can see that the data goes back to 1982, which is when the herd was conceptualized and developed and you can see, um, as we've been talking about over the last year and since the 2023 winter, the, the dramatic effect that that winter had on fawn production. I alluded to earlier also that the Wyoming range herd is, is also a, a tale of two deer herds. And so one thing that's a couple things that are not apparent is when you start scratching the surface 
of the Wyoming range herd is, is uh, uh, some of the winter range data sets that are unique to places like Labarge. And so, you know, even though this is uh, one of the lowest fawn ratios we've seen in the history of, of, the, of the deer herd, just two years ago, our fawn ratio in, in Labarge was almost 80 fawns per hundred. It was 79. So the capability and potential of this deer herd is there and will always remain so. Our buck ratio, recall that I said uh, a moment ago that our minimum management minimum of 30 bucks per hundred. Uh, you can see that uh, also 2023 resulted in one of the lowest proportion of bucks um, in the history of the herd as well. And uh, again, uh, delving into some of the nuance of, of management in the Wyoming range herd is looking at the, the buck ratios off that Labarge winter range, which is where a substantial portion of, of the Grays River population spends the winter. Just two years ago, the buck ratio was 40. And uh, um, the year before that, it was 45 bucks per hundred, just phenomenal ratios uh, in this deer herd and the capability of it. Uh, and, and certainly as, as past year uh, reflected the effects of the 2023 winter. Other data sets that we use, pieces of the puzzle, our harvest, for example, um, we rely quite a bit on harvest estimates. And uh, um, as to no surprise, you know, 2023 was one of the lowest harvests we've seen in the Wyoming range in, in 30 plus years. Um, hunter numbers were, were half, about 2,800 hunters hunted the herd last year as compared to uh, in 2022, we had almost 5,000 hunters who harvested about 1,780 buck deer. So. Uh, the winter uh, absolutely, without question, was uh, substantial in this population. One of the things I want to point out, too, is one of the longest term data sets that we have in the Wyoming range is our change in ratio data set. Um, deer managers in the Wyoming range started collecting this data uh, back in 1989, I believe. And what it does, uh, how we use it as deer managers is one additional data point. And the more data points that we have to look at the wide range of issues in the Wyoming range, the better we can be as managers uh, rather than just rely on one source. And so uh, our predecessors started uh, collecting the data uh, in December and, and uh, along with our herd composition data, buck dogs and, and fawns. And so um, the comparison is uh, uh, the proportion of adults to fawns in December, and then uh, gearing up, which we're currently uh, doing right now, is uh, for our spring classifications where we can uh, compare December to April uh, adult to fawn ratios. And that gives, a relative, that gives us a relative index on how severe the winter was and what kind of losses uh, we had in percentage terms of the, the juvenile or fawn segment of the population. You can see uh, the Wyoming range herd is, is no stranger to uh, extreme, uh, above normal extreme winter mortality. You can see it, uh, it persists throughout the, the last 30 years. And I'm sure uh, pretty confident it goes back to the, when the deer herd was inception because of the frequency of severe winters in Western Wyoming. One thing um, I was gonna ask you to re remember because you're gonna see this again uh, th this time period between 2011 and, and 2017 uh, are notable. And so um, th that data set will show up in a moment. And I want you uh, to remember and recall that uh, one of the questions you're going to be receiving, which we'll probably hear a little bit later today, and certainly uh, um, is on the minds of many people, is, is what does uh, re recovery of the Wyoming range deer herd look like? The other um, biological data point I, uh, I described too, the uh, uh, composition survey and the abundance survey. And what we did um, uh, over in three years, actually 2018, um, 2023, and, and again in 2024, we did what we call abundance surveys. And so we, we made every effort to, to uh, delineate count blocks, subunits in, in the Wyoming range herd, and then we flew those intensively. And you may recall the uh, the composition survey was looked like a uh, uh, like a bowl of spaghetti noodles. Whereas in the uh, when we fly the abundance survey, that's a little bit more intensive uh, with quarter mile transects, 
very, very intensive effort to count uh, every deer on the landscape. And that's exactly what we've been doing um, in 2023 and then again in 2024. And so uh, based on that, we're able to uh, come up with a, a population estimate uh, that is important, especially this year, because everybody, including the Game and Fish Department, really wanted to get uh, provide the insight to the public on, on exactly how many deer were on the landscape. And so you can see, um, you can see in 2018, our first survey, uh, we had about 30,000 deer in the population, same in, in, in February of 2023. And then of course the, uh, the resulting uh, effect in, in the population estimate of the 2023 winter uh, has us right at 11,000 deer currently. This is a, a depiction of how we use the citability surveys, which we've been fortunate enough to, to be able to collect over the last couple of years and, and tie that back uh, to the population estimates. You know, going back to 1990, uh, our population objective was 38,000 deer. And you can re see that some of our estimates during that time period were in excess of 50,000 deer. Shortly after that, 1994, we increased the population objective to 50,000 deer, and that objective was in effect until 2016, at which time uh, deer managers uh, thought, uh, based on the data sets that we have and our population estimates, it would be appropriate to lower it to 40,000 deer. Uh, our current estimate, as you see, is uh, 11,000 deer. One of the things that uh, have come full circle uh, is, is people and the involvement uh, with people in the management and public sentiment, public opinion, uh, plays a big role in the management of the deer herd and uh, in any deer herd for that matter, but certainly in the Wyoming range. And, and you can see uh, during that period I outlined just a moment ago in our change in ratio, uh, what is the major arbiter in, in uh, allowing a population, especially in Western Wyoming, especially the Wyoming range herd to increase. And, and as you can see, uh, public sentiment is, is tied directly to deer numbers. And you can see also that in 2016, when we were approaching 40,000 deer, uh, I would argue that 76% uh, hunter satisfaction in the Grays River is uh, certainly one of the highest uh, public satisfaction uh, levels that uh, of any general licensed mule deer population in North America. It's just incredible uh, to me to see that level of, uh, of deer numbers uh, approaching 40,000 deer, quality of bucks being taken, and a general, uh, a general theme of, of, of support uh, for the Wyoming range herd. That's not so much the case anymore, especially after the 2023 season and, and the effects of the winter. And so um, if you were to ask me, um, which I think many things uh, of this nature are on the minds of, of all of us is what the discovery of, of the Wyoming range herd look like? Uh, to me, it looks like uh, um, consecutive years of extremely mild open winter conditions uh, that will allow this population to increase and not suffer to extreme winter mortality. But uh, in the end, we're gonna need a lot of help uh, from the weather and uh, favorable, favorable conditions uh, in the future. Thank you. Mr. President. I have I have one question for sure. Gary, if I could. Um, thanks, Gary. Um, on, can we go back to slide page 14 on the Nugget Canyon one? Or I, I'm trying to, so I'm trying to put together on the Wyoming range mule deer. <clears throat> now they're coming, coming from the side of the Snake River and they're coming over the top. What, what dictates whether they're going to go the Kimmer route or the LaBarge route when they do it? And so, uh, go back to the map. Yeah. To, you know, oh, so when you, you mentioned the, the Nugget Canyon deer, what's that pin represent? And um, what's it besides? That pin is uh, uh, from a previous, not related to this. Map. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. If, if we go back to the uh, to the map, which would be a second or third slide, I'm glad you're bringing this up, Commissioner, because I, I think uh, 
what I'd like to describe would be the uh, uh, the dynamic of, of deer movements of deer movements in the Wyoming range and uh, and what we've come to uh, understand about that there you go that migratory pattern and so uh, there, there are several studies um, that the department initiated and, and I'll go back to nine in the 1970s uh, it, back in the 1970s, along just south of uh, Labarge and through Nugget Canyon, uh, department personnel uh, would capture deer in clover traps and put neck bands on them. And, and lo and behold, uh, a lot of the deer that were caught in Nugget Canyon and south of Labarge Creek, Muddy Creek, uh, Slate Creek would show up uh, in the Smith's Fork, the Grays River, East Slope of the Wyoming Range. And then in 1989, uh, the department issued um, uh, a radio collaring effort, initiated a, a project just north of Evanston in the Leroy country. And we collared a doe back then that would migrate and spent two summers uh, in West Bailey Creek, one of the longest migratory uh, deer, certainly in Wyoming, certainly in the Wyoming range at that time period. And so based on that movement, and that's how we added uh, 134 into the Wyoming range herd. Um, there's been another study uh, in the early 2000s uh, in the Mesa and Labarge country, I'm sorry, in, in, in the Mesa and Pinedale area where there was quite a bit of movement along the slope of the Wyoming range from deer uh, that spend the, the winter in the ryegrass and, and the Mesa. And so there's a, a great intermixing uh, in the Wyoming range, but but you can see the migratory behaviors uh, coming off the Labarge, Ryegrass Winter Ranges uh, into the Grays River through McDougal Gap and Blind Bull Creek every spring. Uh, you can see the, the, the mass movement of mule deer from the Southern Winter Ranges uh, near Woodruff Downs Reservoir, Nugget Canyon, into the Smith's Fork, crossing Labarge Creek Road into the Grays River, into the Salt River and the east slope of the Wyoming range. And so it's it's really, as I said a moment ago, a tale of two deer herds encompassed into one the Wyoming range, but it's all based on uh, largely the movements of those deer over the last 40, 50, 60 years and how we've better, been able to better understand those type of movements and, and manage the populations effectively, uh, in my view, um, it, September seasons versus October seasons. So it all is, it intermixes very nicely. And, and uh, I think with the public component of it all uh, in trying to get that level of understanding and acceptance out there, it's certainly been one of the challenges, not only for, for the current cadre of, of deer managers, but also going back to uh, uh, those folks at the time the deer herd was conceptualized. One, one last question, Mr. President. Um, if so, the Snake River deer that are on, let's say, if you're traveling to Jackson from Afton on the left hand side up around Red Creek, and that, where do they don't cross the Snake River? They Correct. go, okay. Correct. Exactly. And that's a good point. So the, the boundary really is the, uh, the Snake River for the Wyoming range herd. Uh, we do from uh, the sublet herd, which is the population to the east. You know, there's the, the Hoback uh, to the Red Desert, Red Desert with the Hoback population and, and, and some of those deer that spend the winter north of Rock Springs. Uh, they migrate as far as Munger Mountain, Jackson Hole. There was one that, that one deer that, that did a phenomenal walk about uh, a couple of years ago that went into Island Park. But, but the, for the Wyoming range herd, um, uh, the Snake River boundary is, is pretty much an effective boundary and all deer uh, most deer uh, from that geographic feature are headed south into Woodruff Narrows Reservoir, uh, Evanston Country, or uh, somewhere between the ryegrass and uh, Kimmer. What an amazing herd. It truly is. Thank you. Mr. President, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here today. 
I appreciate you uh, giving me some time to continue to talk about uh, a bit about this amazing deer herd that's been uh, the focal point of part of this discussion. Uh, not to belabor conversation associated with winter. I think we've heard so much about it, uh, but the reality is, at least for this deer population in particular, the winter has been a hard reset for it. Uh, the reality is we've been able to learn a lot from it, what that means to the biology and the ecology of deer in general, and certainly this deer herd. That's part of what I'm going to attempt to convey to you today. Uh, before I get into the project itself, of course, I'm going to talk to you about the Wyoming Age Mule Deer Project uh, that has been ongoing since 2013. We certainly have the power of information that we carry with us to this day. We wouldn't be here having this discussion today without the broad sweep of funders that have seen the value uh, and made this work possible. And certainly, especially to this date, given how far we've come, uh, we had some uh, budget woes uh, back in the early part of the project that Muley Fanatic Foundation stepped up to basically overcome those challenges for us at that period of time to keep us going. Uh, also, Wyoming Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust has been a, certainly a key funder uh, for early phases of the work. And then the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission has played a very uh, important role in keeping us going to this date. I'd also like to acknowledge that this work, uh, the goal of it being a genuine and true collaboration from its exception to its design and to its subsequent execution. Also, I'd like to acknowledge members of my team. In particular, there's been five students that have led various components of this project. Absolutely amazing people are the bloodline of this work. Uh, this, the work we do is intensive, it's not easy, and this is certainly probably our most demanding field project that exists that we execute. Uh, and so these people pour their hearts and souls into this work. I just happen to be the one that gets to be here and talk about it today. The Wyoming Range Mule Deer Project is an intensive project designed to collect various components of individual animals and follow them as long as we can through their lives in ways that integrate the seasonal experiences that they have, where they go, the habitats that they occupy, and how they're influenced by their environment in either positive or negative ways. <clears throat> From that, and since 2015, another element of it that we've been striving to do is to start from day one. That is, there's been a missing component in the lives of deer that we've, we've kind of failed to be able to address very well. And so we've been doing our best to follow mom alongside their offspring for as long as we can to see them all the way through adulthood. And I'll be talking about a brief component of that piece in a little bit. But essentially what we're doing our very best to do is to basically tell these animal stories. Now, of course, one individual story, story is seemingly just an anecdote, but when we can bridge multiple stories together, it yields the power of information to get under the hood of what we see occurring at the population level and understand the mechanisms that are feeding into these processes. Mr. President, I'm sorry. You can't show a video and just keep going. <laughs> Did you put who, who a said? GoPro on Why? here? <laughs> Why can't I? Because, you know, I mean, you, you've <laughs> got to say something. Did, I did. A, I said, a GoPro camera or something? Not a GoPro. It's a it's a, a GPS collar that's fitted with a camera. And the um, that was on um, the dough? That was on that was on mom. What you note, what you note in the video See if I can go back and restart it again. Right away at the beginning of the video, there's a sequence. You see her collared fawn. That's a collared fawn right there, and the other one is right there. So, yeah, she's outfitted with the camera collar, uh, and her twin fawns are collared as well. And then there's somebody else's fawn uh, that she bumps into as she's moving along. Yeah. Mr. President, how do we know that you're just not carrying like a deer head with a faith. camera on you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. President. Thank you, doctor. Maybe I was. <laughs> hmm. Now we'll see if we can get past it. It's going to make you watch it a couple of times. Okay, so as I mentioned, 
Although it wasn't planned with the initial phases of this work or this project, when we encountered the 1617 winter, it inevitably meant a shift for us and some of our focus to understand what winter means for this population and for deer in general. And as it turns out, it's a story that's continued to be recurring ever since 1617. And I'll be talking a bit more about those pieces, but the reality is because of the design of our work and encountering these winters, although it has, has been seemingly detrimental to the herd, although I'll speak a bit more about the positives of that as well, because we've been doing what we've doing, we understand winter now better than we ever have for any deer population. Okay, so I'm gonna base, just work through a handful of questions as we go through to set the stage for this. This is adult survival of our females within this population since we began. As a general rule, adult female survival is quite high, though you will notice the downturns in 1617, 18, 19 winter, and then of course, uh, the most recent, re recent winter that is vivid in all of our memories. <clears throat> okay, so our first question, how do animals survive a bad winter? Because the reality is some of them do. And so what sets animals apart that actually make it through a bad winter? There's a number of factors that go into affect survival of these adult females during this period of time. It's intuitive, I suppose, but the reality is the amount of snow that they experience, and Ember showed a brief uh, panel on this as well relative to what that has meant for the population in the Wyoming range, but animals that are exposed to more deeper snow for a longer period of time experience lower survival as is shown in this figure here. There's two different lines there because it affects old and young animals slightly differently. And the reality is bad winters affect older animals far worse than younger animals. So animals that are in the prime of their age or younger have a higher, notwithstanding juveniles, but otherwise have a higher probability of surviving winters. They're just better equipped and able to go through that as opposed to the older, more senile, I suppose you could say, um, that struggle to make it through bad winters. In addition to that, the food that's present on their landscape is absolutely critical. So if you can imagine when we're talking bad winters, the one thing for you to think about is all that matters for that animal through the course of that winter is that it can meet its daily energy requirements. Now, of course, winter influences those energy requirements by the cold and deep snow that they experience, but they need to be able to meet that energy requirement through the winter. So more food present within their home range, which is largely a function of the sagebrush that's present for this population and its ability to persist above the snow line that in hel helps equip these animals to, to have higher probability of surviving a winter. But the other side of that deficit of meeting those daily energy requirements for these animals, sure, they have the immediate food that's there, but what's absolutely critical for these animals is the amount of fat that they have with them at the start of winter. So this is basically the energy that they put on their backs during the summer, they carry with them down to winter, and it's absolutely critical for their survival. So what you'll note here is that animals that are very fat, so pushing 15% body fat at the beginning of winter, they're almost invincible when it comes to winter. 22, 23 winter certainly affected that, that invincibility to some degree, but basically animals that enter winter that fat, they're pretty much invin invincible. And that's because they get to mobilize that fat and use it to help meet their daily metabolic requirements as they persist through winter. And so what that tells us is that there's a thresholds and fat that it takes for these animals to survive. And I think it's easy to look at a figure like that and think, okay, fatter deer means higher probability of surviving a winter. That's a good thing. And it is, but maybe it's not quite as convincing, but when we, if we actually take and break this apart and look at the winter that we just experienced this past year, these are three survivorship curves. Ember showed similar data across the deer populations that she's looking at. The blue lines is, is for fawns in the Wyoming range. The green line is for males. The orange line is for females. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that orange line and we're gonna break it apart. And we're gonna break it apart by the threshold of females that entered the 22, 23 winter at 15% fat or better and those that entered below it. The moment we break that apart, even at something as coarse as saying, are you fat or are you not as fat? And we see very different survival line between those two categories of animals. So basically what we're looking at is animals that were under 15% body fat, we begin losing them on the 15th of February. Animals that entered winter at over 15% body fat, we didn't start losing them till the 15th of March. And then the reality is, is those curves just continue to dwindle down. 
but basically those animals had those fat reserves to meet their basic energy requirements on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality is had this past winter broke earlier, it's a whole idea. You can take and you can move that line to see it. Well, if the winter would have broke earlier, we would have been far better off as opposed to basically going all the way till the end of April, if not into May. So essentially fat plays a major role in these animals ability to persist through a winter, any winter for that matter, but certainly a bad winter. Well, how do animals gain fat? Maybe this is intuitive. The fat they're bringing with them is coming from summer. There's a number of factors that affect it. The age of the animal, whether or not they had surviving offspring because lactation is expensive. And then the other side of that is what that meant for the summer range that they experience. What we're seeing here is this relationship between fat change in animals and basically their food base on summer range. Their food base being dictated by basically two metrics. And we see this functioning at the population level from the amount of moisture that occurs on their summer range. The reality is, is even though it's something we can't control, but the moisture that they experience on their summer range plays a big role in the food that's grown there that helps them put on fat. And then the number of animals that are in the population. I think it's hard for us to wrestle sometimes with the idea that more is maybe not always better for metrics such as this, but the reality is the more animals that are there, the more competition there is for food. And it's basically this push and pull relative to resources that are there and the number of mouths that are trying to take advantage and use those resources. As I mentioned, the 16, 17 winter, this is just a very simple visual of what we see with regards to body fat in the population as we go from one season to the next. So the low is March, the high is December, you see it fluctuate through time. And then what's in blue there is the population size that we've experienced. You'll note the subsequent population climb that occurred during the 16, 17 winter, and it initiated a reset within the population where we had lower density of deer within the population. And if you just glance at that figure from left to right, what you'll note is from roughly that split, we had far thinner deer on the left side, far fatter deer on the right side. I'll be talking about this more in just a little bit here as well. But just remember that visual with regards to the 16, 17 winter. And if we take and plug and play these various attributes that we know through our models that are data driven from the Wyoming range and basically project out what we would see with regards to fat during a good summer, and then they'll subsequently experience a moderate winter. And we simply fluctuate the number of animals within the population relative to what that means for fat gain, as you'll see on the, on the bottom from starting, starting with fall fat of 12% to 14% to 16% across those various levels. And what that does with regards to those winters is it equates to different levels of expected survival because as those factors influence how fat animals are in autumn, the winter they then experience, it influences their probability of survival over that winter. The reality is with the 16, 17 winter, and I'll point this out again later, the fat levels entering the 16, 17 winter we're at one of the lows that we've seen through the course of our study within this population. Had we entered the six, had we entered the 22, 23 winter at 16, 17 fat levels, based on our models, we would have projected less than 10% survival of adult females. Because of the resets that have occurred within this population to the bad winters prior to the 22, 23 winter, the deer that were left reaped the benefits of that and we're far fatter going into the 22-23 winter. And I'll show that a little bit more here as we progress. Okay, so as we think about the consequences of bad winter, and the reality is of the winter we just experienced on winter ranges, this is what that landscape looked like. Deer's not gonna survive very well in that, is it? And it's gonna be pockets that are gonna remain with regards to those processes. So since, if we think about winter distribution of animals, where we see animals are at, on, are at on winter range. One of the goals of our work is as we lose animals to various causes and in particular bad winters, we've worked to maintain our collar distribution from where we, where we started initially. So one area as an example in particular, South of Nugget Canyon on Sillam Ridge, after the 1819 winter, we went back in there to put collars back in that area because we lost animals in there and we were always wanting to return that similar collar distribution there. The reality is we couldn't find any animals. Basically from there, almost all the way to Red Eye Basin. And these were areas where we had always seen deer. So it caused us to scratch our head. Why is this happening? Why are we seeing this change in the distribution of deer on winter range? 
And so as we been, began thinking about that, we thought maybe there's two things that could be going on. One is behavior. So when animals experience a more intense environment, so if we take that environment, turn to red, when they experience a more intense environment, are they just simply moving around in that landscape, basically being pushed by snow to alleviate the consequences that they're experiencing? And maybe once pushed, so having lower fidelity to their winter range, maybe once pushed, they find a new winter range and then they just stay there. And that's why we're not seeing animals in places we've seen them before. Or the reality is the other side of that is I know all of you appreciate mule deer are incredibly faithful animals. That is once an adult, they hold strong to their summer range, to their winter range and the migratory route that they use. They're incredibly faithful to it. They exhibit high fidelity to it. So the other reality is, is it possible that once we experience these severe conditions, especially within these pockets, are we simply losing the animals within those pockets so there's no longer animals occupying that habitat? So with our data from, and then from these historic winters, what we've sought to do is address these two questions. Are deer being pushed? And if they're being pushed by winter, are they simply finding a new winter range? Or are we losing these animals and thus then the consequence of it being gaps in the distribution? And so the reality is, and maybe not surprising, so this is snow depth on the x-axis and then on the y is how faithful they were to their winter range. So on the left is highly faithful animals, on the right are animals that are being less faithful. So what we're seeing here is exactly what you expect. As animals experience more snow in their current winter, they're, being, they're basically exhibiting this pattern of being further away from last year's winter range. So they're being displaced by those winter conditions. But the reality is while they were displaced, they didn't find a new winter range and stay there. Animals returned to their winter range the following year as opposed to staying to this new winter range. And so when we dug then further, if animals were displaced or held strong to their, to their winter home range, played functionally no role, no role in whether or not they survived. It didn't matter in those decisions whether they were pushed or not as to whether or not they survived. As we just talked, and even as we reinstituted this modeling process, as we had talked, the factors that influence survival over winter is the snow they experience, how old they were, and how fat they were. And so if we took that then one step further and looked at these processes with regards to winter distribution on the landscape and these pockets where we no longer had deer that we had had deer before, the reasons we didn't have them there is because they died. So it wasn't that animals had shifted and found a new winter range and then didn't come back. It was because they had actually died. So it functionally created vacant space. Now the, the, the trick here within this is that in that process, these animals and these pockets, animals that die, remember what influences winter survival. Yes, the conditions they experience, but it's how much fat they brought with them from summer range. So this whole idea that what helps hold strong to the winter distribution of animals that we have isn't just what happens on winter range, it's actually what happens on summer range and the fat that they bring to winter range that helps hold strong to that winter distribution of animals and their ability to persist through a winter. And so it begs the question then on a winter like we just had, where we lost 70% of adult females, what the consequences of that are over time with regards to distribution of animals. And I think we take that one step further and the last question that I'm gonna to work to address briefly with you is this process of migration. And we've been talking about this for a little while relative to how animals learn to migrate. We all appreciate the notion that as an adult, they hold strong and are incredibly faithful to their migratory route. But where did that migratory route come from? Did the young inherit it from mom? And then that's the, wind, that's the migratory route they adopt, or do they just figure, out, figure it out some other way? The only way for us to get that is, as I mentioned before, start from day one, follow offspring alongside mom. And we've been working to do that. The reality is, as it turns out, trying to learn something like this to get a newborn fawn all the way to three years of age so we can layer on the foundation of what happens in those, what we've called lost years of life because we know so very little about it. When you have bad winners, three bad winners in a decade, which basically each of those bad winners at least wipe out one cohort of fawns, if not two, the following year, very hard to do that. Uh, out of over 200 female fawns that we've collared, 12 of them have made it to three years of age that we've been able to monitor alongside mom. And these are their migratory routes. Don't worry about the details here, but basically when you see all the lines stacked on top of each other, that's mom's migratory route that fawn walked with mom with, 
And then that's Fawn adopting mom's migratory route after that. And only a handful deviate from that that I'll get to in a minute. Y'all will probably remember me talking about the idea of a rose petal hypothesis, where if you inherit space from mom over time, if I go back to that figure real quick, basically the top of each one of them are the animal's summer range or their natal range. What you'll note is that almost all of them converge at that point. What that means is regardless of the few that found a different migratory route, they almost all held strong to that natal range, as in adopted the summer range adjacent to where they were born. So they basically in large part comply with the, this idea of the rose petal hypothesis where we have clusters of matrilineal lines of females on the landscape that basically create the deer that are occupying the landscape that we see. And then we have this migratory route that, that connects them. And so we may see this visual at the population level of where deer are, but what's going on under the hood of all that are these matrilineal lines of females that occupy a landscape. And so what we know or what's likely to have happened from this past bad winter, and we saw it even within our marked segment of animals, we had entire family groups of animals that were wiped out. When you lose 70% of your females, it's almost inevitable in the various death zones that were created across the landscape. So we potentially end up with gaps in distribution. It's gaps in distribution that I just mentioned that we saw on winter range and we tested, and then we're potentially gonna see it on summer range as well as these animals inherit space from mom uh, and occupying those natal ranges. So potentially deer habitat in the absence of deer. I will note, and I wanna flag very briefly, four of those 12 female fawns broke the rules. They did something different. What is pretty remarkable to me, and honestly not what I expected, they found different migratory routes. One of them in particular that I will, that I will highlight also found a different summer range. She's the only one of the 12 that found a different summer range. But what they found new of was a different winter range, and it's not what I would have expected. So what you notice in each one of them, they basically, they went from south winter range to the northern winter range, which is not what I've expected to have happen if they were going to switch. I will flag one, it's F452. So F452 was actually born after the 2018-19 bad winter. She's one of the few surviving fawns from that bad winter. Uh, this was the migratory route that she took with mom from basically down close to Evanston, Whitney Canyon country, uh, up into the heart of the Wyoming range. She followed that, that first spring migration back with mom, but then she deviated and ended up over in the salt range. And then that following fall, she decided to actually go to the LaBarge winter range and actually cross the river. And she's established that as her migratory route since that period of time and has continued to use it thereafter. What is noteworthy about her as a yearling, she produced a fawn and reared it all the way through and then lost the fawn during winter. As a two-year-old, she, as a two-year-old during 2022, she reared that fawn all the way through. Her fawn was the last of the surviving radio marked fawns to die during the 22, 23 winter, made it all the way to March 1st. And then we lost her that day. So she's amazing mom, but she's one that's clearly broken the mold has found perhaps a different pathway to success. What is noteworthy with regards to this is if animals aren't making use of the landscape, it's functionally not integrating that habitat into the population. So these ideas of these vacant spaces that may well have occurred, we're certainly seeing on winter range, are likely to occur on summer ranges as well. Needing to reoccupy those spaces is gonna be critical to being able to get the, get the population back up to levels that we maybe once saw historically, potentially. Finally, a little bit of hope. This is our fat levels that we've seen within this population since we started our work in March 2020, 2013. And what you'll note from right, the purple bars are there are abundance estimates within the population to the left or the, um, the higher level of abundance. We've been on a more positive fat trajectory ever since the 1617 winter which was very important for us as we went into the 22-23 winter. I will note, so that, that line represents how fat the females were in December 23. So after the bad winter, after that summer, but these are the lactating females. So these are the ones that su successfully reared fawns. They incur the cost of lactation. Back that blue line all the way back out, from, from in 2013 to 2014, 2015, 2016, even non-lactating females, so females that didn't rear fawns, 
were not as fat during that phase of the deer herd than our lactating females were in 2023. Amazing levels of fat that we're seeing within the deer population now compared with them prior to 26, 2017. Finally, as of yesterday, uh, we just conducted our March captures. That's the line for where they're at in March. What you'll note is we are fatter now this March than we have ever seen in this deer population since we started our work in 2013. So certainly the surviving animals reaping the benefits of the environment that currently exists, both with regards to moisture levels, the fewer mouths to feed, um, they're fat, robust, and we're excited to see what that means for us going forward with regards to this deer population. With that, I thank you very much for your time and attention. Yeah. Wow. Mr. President, I have one quick question. So you're at 18 and 0.5% body fat on the, is what you're seeing on the, this, the last slide. That's 18. For, yeah. So for non-lactating females, 19% body fat for lactating females, 13% body fat this past December. Wow. Wow is right. Yeah. Impressively fat animals. Yep. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that they progress. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Appreciate it. We're going to take a break. Hold on, hold on a second. Oh. We did have two public comments. Public comments. <laughs> Boy, you guys are sharp. Uh, Ted Jenkins. Thank you, President Ludwig. Congratulations, Director Nesvik. Commission, I... Uh, Stand in front of you of listening to that presentation is, you know, I guess optimistic, hopefully optimistic, but in reality, my heart's broken. Uh, this Wyoming range mule deer herd has been uh, near and dear to my heart for my whole life and uh, for my whole family's, uh, you know, for several generations. Um, I'm just a little uh, wondering from you guys, uh, I know that we're, here we are, uh, the the number is uh, eleven thousand proposed on the herd, and I think that's being extremely generous from uh, what I've seen on the landscape and what I see on the winter ranges and stuff like that. I really, I really think that is being generous. Uh, and the concerns are buck to doe ratio. Obviously, uh, you know we knew the fawn survival rate was going to be really, really low, if at all, and especially the fawns if they ever if they ever produced this last summer, which there was a few fawns on the landscape, but I mean, I'm here to tell you where I traditionally set and look for these mule deer in the fall, where I'd set, you know, in the prime hours of glassing, going from seeing 35 to 50 head of deer to really have to look to find a deer. And I, I believe we lost more than a two thirds, I believe we lost at least three quarters of this deer herd in my estimation. Uh, I'm a, I guess what I would pose a question to you guys is where do we draw the line in the sand on this deer herd of where we start making some aggressive changes to the way we manage them? I've heard over the last couple of years and especially since our bad winter that harvesting buck mule deer doesn't necessarily change the population but on the other cheek, you guys are saying, just like Gary just proposed that they'd like to shut that season down before the elk season starts in the Wyoming range to try to save some bucks. So, I mean, with that, you know, if, if really, if hunting buck mule deer doesn't change population, then why do we shorten our hunting seasons and why do we cut non-resident tags in this area? I mean, that's, that's, Talking out both sides of the mouth there, I really would. To me personally, I think hunting buck mule deer does affect the population, and I'd love to see some major aggressive changes to the way how we hunt mule deer, especially in the Wyoming range. Uh, with that being said, I'll I'll, I'll keep it short because I know we're kind of short on time today, and I appreciate your time. Thank you.
close enough. Yeah, uh, I'm the same as Ted. This deer herd means a lot to us. Uh, I've been guiding and outfitting and living in the Grays River since 1978, living there full time in the center of the Grays River. Uh, my wife, daughter, and son-in-law run the Box Y Lodge, and I work for them uh, for the last 30 years. And when I started my outfitting business there, my, my own business in 1984, there were 3,800 non-resident deer tags. Now there's 350, from 3,800 to 350, but still no limitation on the residents. There's only five places in the West that consistently, over the last 50 some years, consistently produce big deer. The Grays River is one of them. And it's the only one you can buy a tag over the counter. That's gotta change sometime if we wanna keep this deer herd. I always saw it, you couldn't shoot them out. That's what I always felt. They had so many places to hide in the Grays River. The genetics are there. The habitat is there. The reason the one side of that herd is the Salt River mountain range. It's full of minerals. That's why we have the antler growth we have there. There's more animals in Boone and Crockett from Lincoln County, Wyoming, than anywhere in North America. One reason is the mule deer we have, the elk, we're diversified. We have everything in that area. But this mule deer herd, in my opinion, I went through the deer wars. I was in Pennsylvania visiting family. I'm not born and raised here. I've only been here 45 years. I was in Pennsylvania visiting family and Jay Lawson, that all the respect in the world for, called me. So we're having a meeting in Pinedale. The governor called a meeting. It's emergency, you gotta be there. And I'm talking to him on my phone. I'm like, well, I don't know if I can be there or not. And we're visiting back and forth. And he goes, Tim, it starts tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in Pinedale. And I said, I don't know if I can be there. I'm in Pennsylvania. He goes, oh, I had no idea. We drove straight through to get here. I've been involved in this a long time. Nothing was brought up today through all these presentations about predation, nothing. When I started my hunting business in that area, we had a two lion quota for that area that they showed on that map. A lot of years, two lions weren't killed, maybe only one. Now that quota is about 58 and it's filled every year. Predation was never brought up. It never is. I don't understand it. I don't know why it's never talked about. Uh, Gary, who I get along with very good, have all the respect and role for Gary, said we haven't hunted those areas for 30 years. That's not true. Archers could hunt them until just a couple years ago and they finally stopped it. So you can't say we've not hit, hit our reproductive segment. Uh, and the other side of it, I'm sorry, became nationwide. Uh, you can't feed wildlife. Don't work. Can't do it. You can't keep saying that. Yes, it can. That chart showed what happened last winter, and I think that chart proves that them deer should have been supplemented last winter. I think it proves it. The other states did it. Go look at the charts, what they lost compared to us. Our neighboring states fed them. We chose not to. Why wasn't this season shut down this past fall? Why is it going to be shut down this fall? All the sportsmen are asking for it. That meeting that happened last year in Pinedale here, I couldn't be here. I was out of town on business. But that was the number one thing that was said at that meeting. Shut the seasons down. Antelope and deer, shut them down. You cut 50 non-resident tags. That's it. Something's got to change. I always said it couldn't be shot out. What's changing that a lot is this predation and this long-range shooting. It has changed everything. I don't know where you draw the line on that. I don't, I don't think we should all have to use open-sighted 3030s. But I always saw it. They have too many places to hide and get away from you. That is tough country to hunt. If you're in a guy in the Grays River, you play or plan on quitting when you're about 40. You're going to be shot. And as far as predation, we got our lion quota raised 50% in that area last year in the Grays River. We had to fight 
to get that. And the head biologist statement was, well, we're gonna raise it, enough people want it, we're gonna do it, but it will have nothing to do with our deer numbers. How can you make that statement? I guide in Alaska every year. The Chattanooga caribou herd is one of the biggest in the world. It's been dwindling for 20 years. Predation, number one problem, predation. Wolf season opened wide open the last 15 years. This year, the Alaska Game and Fish Department aerial gunned 96 grizzly bears. The, pride of, the bear season's wide open. You can hunt them all the time. They can't get the hunters. So they arrow gun 96 grizzlies to try to help that caribou herd come back. Where's our predator management? One of your head biologists in this state, 1988, I went to every commission meeting for 17 years unless it was during hunting season. For a 17 year period. In 1988, after a commission, I hope it's still this way. This first one I've been to in a long time. You really got a lot talked out and done at breakfast, lunch, supper or over a beer in the two or three days around the commission meeting. That's how you got talked out. And one of your head biologists at that time told me, he said, I fought at a commission meeting over an issue. And he told me that night over supper, Tim, you're in for a war. And this is what he said to me. We got a new breed of biologist taught by a new breed of professors. And you're going to see major changes across the country. And it's not going to be in sportsmen's favor. And that's the way I feel about it. And my phone number is on them comment sheets. I want to call it two more times. I'll say more then. I don't want to take up everybody's time today. I talked two minutes longer than I wanted to. Please call me. I would love to visit with any of you, any amount of time you want. I will drive to where you're at. I am going to get back involved. Thank you for your time. Got to think. Mr. President, I have a question. Yeah. I don't want Dr. Hall to get off too free here. Excellent presentation. I commend your work. I'm reviewing, remembering the budget. And we go back to those commission approved um, years of funding. The Mule Deer Initiative, we're at 10 of, year 10 of 10. The Wyoming Range, five of five. Those are the studies you were presenting today. President Ladwig, uh, Commissioner Brokaw, no, that's not correct. So the Mule Deer Initiative and the Wyoming Range funds that are in, that are each marking sort of their end end of term to payment, those were separate from what I talked about. So my work or our work, I should say, is in that five year, it's like maybe two lines down on that slide you're probably looking at, that's like mm -hmm. the five year Wyoming mule deer herd work. It should be in year three of five. You are three of five. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, um, Dr. Hall, um, you had a slide during your presentation that uh, had mortality causes on it. Correct. Is it possible for you to ship an email to the commission and just let us know what approximate percentages those were? I don't know if you had them ranked or not, but if you have just rough ideas of percentages, would you mind shipping that to us? Yeah, President Ladwig, um, Commissioner Masterson, absolutely. I'd be happy to do Thank that. You. I would just urge a little bit of caution that we this is still, some of this is still preliminary data, so I'll sort of provide those caveats when I send that information. Bet. Thanks. Feed ground management plan update. John Lund and Cheyenne Stewart. President Ladwig, members of the commission, Director Nesbitt, welcome to Pinedale. Um, we've heard a lot of um, important discussions today and some, some major issues um, that throughout Western Wyoming here, and we've got one more for you by, for, the, for the day. Um, 
Today we'll be presenting our elk feed ground management plan for final approval. Um, as, as you know, you've received updates in the past, but this, this plan is the result of a committee of game and fish employees who have worked over the last several years um, on this process. And um, as well as a very dedicated group of stakeholders that have helped us out throughout this program, this process. Um, I want to just take this this second to acknowledge the work that they have all put into this. This has been an amazing uh, few years, and it has been a major lift and a uh, different workload than everybody is normally accustomed to. And they have done an outstanding job working on this this plan. Um, so with that, um, today, the purpose of today, what are we here for? Um, right now, I'm going to give just a very brief background overview of, of the process. Brad did a really good job at that, at the, I believe, January meeting. And uh, so I'm not going to beat that to death but I'm gonna just provide the, the quick 30,000 foot view of this process and what we've been through and, um, and, and how, how we got here. Um, once I'm done, which will just be in a few minutes, I'm gonna turn it over to the Jackson Wildlife Management Coordinator, Cheyenne Stewart, and she's gonna present the plan in detail um, for all of you. And ultimately at the end of this discussion, we're gonna be asking you for your approval of our plan. So this was a graphic that I believe you saw last at the last meeting that Brad provided um, as an update or as a just a roadmap of the where we've been and how we got to where we're at. And just so a quick overview, um, this all began with the statewide CWD plan. And during that plan, it was very obvious very quickly that feed grounds were, was too big of an issue and too complex to be included in that CWD management plan. And so the commission directed uh, the department to create this, seed, this elk feed grounds process um, in lieu of that. And so um, we, we began that in 2020 and um, we broke it down into different phases is what we called it, but phase one was the very beginning of this process. And um, that involved several public meetings around the state where we presented feed ground information, gathered input, um, as well as gathering um, interest for future stakeholders to be in the process. Um, in that part of the, the, in phase one, that's where we, we established that this was not a consensus based process. Um, this was a process where we would be collecting information um, from the public, from stakeholders, but we were not looking for consensus within the group. That was a little bit different than the CWD plan. Um, phase two, again, 2021-ish. And um, again, that, that was the, the major theme of that process was we did a large effort in what we called shared learning. Um, we presented everything and anything there is to know about elk feed grounds from all the way from the history um, to disease information to current feed ground operations um, throughout that process. And um, again, to, for us to give that information out, but also to solicit information from the public and from those stakeholders for us so we could incorporate ideas into this plan. From that, uh, following phase two, that's when we began, we took all that information and we drafted our plan and we um, put that plan out to the public here. It's been several months ago now. That plan went out to the public. We received significant input, um, written comments, as well as um, at public meetings and, and, and so on. We took all of that information over the last several months and incorporated it into this final draft plan. Oops. Okay, so what is different? What from the draft that came out several months ago to the one that's in front of you today? Um, we spent a great amount of time on just making general 
um, revisions to the plan, editorial, um, clarifying things. Um, but one of the biggest things we did was just simply cleaning it up. Uh, we, we removed a lot of redundancies and inconsistencies throughout the plan, just made it more, um, I don't want to say legible, but uh, more user-friendly as far as reading. Um, we added some summaries to some of the processes, like section one of each part of the plan will have a, a summary. Um, we added some tables and figures throughout the um, throughout the plan to, to help clarify everything that's in it, um, as well as the actual implementation of the plan. We spent put quite a bit of effort into just clarifying what's what's in there and what we intended to to do. Some of the major changes. Um, or edits, I should say, is we did add information about production values of cattle operations. Um, that was something that was not in there. Um, we clarified our sideboards. As you know, we've had some very um, clear sideboards throughout the process that we promised that we would not uh, violate. Um, we didn't change what's in the sideboards. We just simply clarified them to make sure everybody understood and that we were all on the same page. Um, we added information on brucellosis and CWD management. Brucellosis is a major issue, obviously, and in the original draft, we didn't talk about it very much. And we did that intentionally because we have a different process for brucellosis management, but it became clear that it needed to be included in here. Um, and then we also clarified um, feed ground management action plans. We had a lot of questions on those plans. And so we provided quite a bit of clarification on those. All of this is the result of public input that we received, either written or, or in-person verbal comments. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, just a quick timeline of where we of the feed ground process and, and the history behind it. It's, a, it's spelled out in the plan, but this is just a quick, quick version. Um, you know, this all started basically in the early 1900s when um, after some severe winter events, mainly in the Jackson area, um, we saw, or the, the public at the time saw some significant winter mortality on elk in the Jackson area. They became concerned about it, just like they're concerned now about the issues we face today. Um, about that same time, the public began some feeding operations on their own. And um, fast forward to 1912, you know, this, this continued on until then. And in 1912, federal funding was actually allocated for the purpose of feeding elk. And, um, and this is on what we now know as the National Elk Refuge. Oh, about 1929, that's when the department finally um, became involved in a feeding and damage compensation program. So we began feeding elk as well as compensating people were, who were having damage issues with elk. And then about 1934, um, the, that's where we began a state and federal cooperative uh, brucellosis um, management program. And then forward to about not roughly the 1960s, and you can see that map. That is a, a map of our current feed ground system. And, and since about the 60s, we've been operating um, in that fashion or some version of that. We've made, certainly made changes throughout the, that time, um, but that's, that's about where we've um, started that where, how we currently operate our feed ground program. So one thing we've discussed on our uh, regular basis throughout the, the feed ground management plan process and the public process is, is we've just, it, it always comes up, why did you begin feeding elk and, and why do we feed elk now? And we, we keep uh, bringing this up um, throughout the entire process. So before we go into the, the bulk of the plan, just as a um, one last time, these are the reasons that many of them are how we began feeding and many of them are the reason we continue to feed. Um, but obviously today, uh, one of our major reasons to feed is to reduce damage on private lands, as well as reducing commingling with cattle. 
um, elk and cattle commingling in the winter time is um, not acceptable, especially this time of the year, the later we go into pregnancy periods for, for cattle. And um, that is a absolute priority for us when it happens right now. Um, obviously elk feed grounds help reduce wintertime mortality. And with that, it allows us to maintain population objectives uh, despite limited winter ranges in cases. And um, as well as that, it does help, feed grounds do help us reduce competition to other wildlife species on winter range. So this quote is a good segue for me to transition and, and let Cheyenne take over on the presentation. Um, she will handle, she will, she will go through this plan and um, we will have lots of time at the end for questions. And we've got our entire committee here uh, to answer any of those questions as they come up. So I'm going to show you. Oops. President Lag Ladwig, Commission Director Nozvik. I'm Cheyenne Stewart, the Wildlife Management Coordinator for Jackson, and maybe the most recent member of this committee. So um, I'll dig in a little bit to what we know about CWD and feed grounds, and then talk about the plan specifically. So this quote is from a report 20 years ago on feed grounds. What started as a logical solution to some very real problems has become one of the most complex and controversial wildlife management challenges of the 21st century. And I think Brad did a great job of explaining this in January where you pull on one string and six other strings unravel. And so um, now 20 years later, since this quote was written, it's even more complicated and more controversial given what we've learned about chronic wasting disease. And CWD is a big deal but it doesn't mean that all the other biological, social, political, and economic factors that, that are related to feed grounds just go away or become any less important. So this is a map of the progression of CWD detections and elk herd units across time. And you can kind of see how CWD is marching its way towards the feed ground system. And as you'll remember, CWD is transmitted from animal to animal. And then as you get higher prevalence, so the proportion of the herd that's infected with CWD, as that increases, you get more chances of infection going from animal to environment to animal as well. So then the big question is, how will CWD behave? How will it affect our populations in the feed ground system? So what do we know? In free ranging native winter range populations, we do get really high densities, large congregations of elk. Um, Dr. Amber Hall was describing that earlier with the program that she's working on. So you get really high densities of elk naturally, that's part of their behavior but in the winter, they can only eat any stem once. So forage availability requires that they're constantly foraging and moving to find available forage. Um, and then they migrate or move off of winter ranges as well. And what we see in these herds is prevalence ranges from about one to 14%. On the totally opposite end of the spectrum, when you have captive elk herds, the densities are managed by the managers, they're predetermined, but the animals are confined to fenced areas year round, year after year. And in these systems, prevalences range from 59 to 100%. And remember, CWD is 100% fatal. Feed grounds are somewhere in between. So we have large densities, large congregations of elk on winter feed, feeding in the same feeding acreage every single day for up to five months over the winter, and then returning to those same acreages year after year after year. But they migrate, they disperse and leave those feed grounds. And so you're, you don't have that same um, impact as a captive herd, they're spending their spring, summer, and fall ranges somewhere else. And we don't know the range of CWD because we have never observed CWD in a feed ground system. So 
what do we do when you don't know? Um, so just to specify what we don't know, because we haven't observed it. So the first bullet point is how quickly will that prevalence increase? So will CWE basically get worse at a similar rate to a native range herd or much faster? And the second bullet, how high will that prevalence get? Are we gonna be closer to that like one to 14% or are we gonna be closer to that 60 to 100%? And then the third bullet is as we hit different prevalence rates with that animal to animal and environment to animal contamination, how will that affect specifically our, our cervid populations? So not just elk, but also deer and moose. And so these are very specific things that we don't know. We don't know the number of population decline at what prevalences, um, but we have learned an incredible amount of information. And so we do have an idea of some trends and some expectations. And so this figure right here is just current prevalence of, of elk herds across the state. Um, so like I said, there's, there's things that we expect to happen based on a large body of knowledge and what's become a pretty sophisticated level of, of analysis and, and research. Um, there's still a lot of assumptions that we have to make because we don't know the answers, but because we have research management and statistical no modeling, we've gained a whole lot of information. And I'll just back up a little and dive specifically into the statistical modeling piece. We've talked a lot about modeling today. So I think the first time, I and mean, we talked about it with pronghorn with the migration designation, there's modeling approaches that tell us what to expect for pronghorn migration. We heard about it for mule deer winter range survival. We know what to expect for adult doe survival based on how fat they are coming into the winter. So statistical models, they're not a crystal ball, they're not perfect, but when you get a lot of different information aligning and showing the similar expectations, it gives us a better idea, more confidence of what to expect in the future when we don't know what's gonna happen. And so what we expect is that CWD prevalence in the feed ground system will increase faster and get higher than in free ranging elk. We also expect that mortality from CWD itself as well from, as from hunting will be additive. And basically what that means is that it will cause population reduction or decline. And we expect that management can slow the spread and in particular early management. If you do management while you're still at low or zero prevalence, you have a lot more options um, to have long-term effects than if you wait till when prevalence is much higher. Now, this is a figure, again, just to show some of the expectations that the body of literature has kind of coalesced on. This is not our research. It's not based on our data or management, but I just wanna kind of walk through the general expectation of how CWD will affect this system. So this black line here is under a current management scenario. So continued feeding. And you can see the population is pretty stable, does well, and you reach the shoulder and that's that additive mortality where CWD mortality plus harvest causes population decline. This darker gray line is a scenario where feeding just stopped. Again, that is not what this plan does. That is not what we're saying we want to do. This is just a modeling exercise to help us understand expectations. And in this scenario, you have an immediate population decline. And that is due to right now we have more elk than we have winter range to support. So you'd have immediate decline until you have, um, you kind of reach equilibrium of you have enough habitat to sustain those elk numbers over the winter. And then you can see a more stable population. And this crossover point right here is essentially where a no feeding scenario 
that population starts to perform better than the feeding scenario. And basically, because it's released from that burden of high CWD mortality. Once again, we're not proposing that we stop feeding. That is not what this plan is intended to do. Um, but just to get a general expectation of what the body of, of statistical mo modeling with those research projects are showing. Mr. President. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the graph. It's, it's helpful, but <clears throat> um, as you say, you, you know, it's kind of an extrapolation. Is that a fair way to put it um, based on the evidence that you have of mortality and all the data you've gathered. Um, I'm just trying to, how, you know, can I hang my hat on that? Or, you know, you are, you, you people are the experts in this, you know, this probably better than anyone in the country. So it may be the, as good as we can get, but President Ladwig, Commissioner Masterson, um, there are a large number of assumptions that go into this model because there's so much that maybe we know the existing conditions, but it's hard to predict the future conditions. One example for, for that's relevant to us is uh, we know in the past how we've managed our hunting seasons based on where we're at compared to population objective. We don't know if our, you know, whatever example, you know, whatever herd this is gets to 1500 elk, how we would respond for management. And so this is, this graph is from a very robust analysis done by USGS um, that they did on behalf of the Bridger Teton National Forest um, for their draft EIS assessment. And so it, it's a huge um, effort to get there. Um, I don't think I would hang my head on, on it because there are so many assumptions and so many things that will change two, five, 10, 20 years out from today. But again, so my intent to show this to you is to basically say, if you hold all, all else even, this is how we expect CWD might affect these herds. And I did specifically um, not want to highlight, this is an example from one herd unit. And to me, that's almost irrelevant because when it comes to the number of elk and the year you, you reach that crossover point, to me, that falls more in the what we don't know range. They, they can predict it and, and, and do a decent job of giving us an idea. Um, but I, I think it's more the concept rather than the actual years or population numbers, if that helps. No. Yeah. So then what do we do with that? <laughs> Where do we go from here? Um, so again, the reasons that we feed elk haven't gone away, but the risks to cervid health has changed. And so it is vital, it is critical to the department that we have management direction so that our decisions, our recommendations are in line and kind of we know what goals we're striving toward both in the short and long term. Um, one thing I've learned just through this process is how important language is and being clear and uh, consistent. And so a lot of what you'll see on these slides are copy pasted from the plan and I may read them almost verbatim. I hate doing that, but it's, it's um, in this case on, on purpose. So the management direction kind of summarizes that feed grounds maximize hunting opportunity while limiting winter mortality, elk damage, disease risks to cattle, and competition with other wintering wildlife. However, Feed grounds present significant concerns for disease transmission, habitat management, and the long-term health of these elk populations. Given the department's responsibility to manage for healthy and sustainable elk, deer, and moose populations over the long term, CWD cannot be disregarded. 
and no strategies can be implemented to accomplish the goals without adhering to the sideboards. And I will get into what those strategies, goals, and sideboards are. So because this plan needs to fit into the framework by which the department functions, and because of concern we heard from stakeholders of what are sideboards and how do we know you will adhere to them, uh, we actually changed the order. So in the plan, in, in the current version of the plan, the sideboards come before the goals to try to make that very clear. Uh, John mentioned this, but we updated the language of the sideboards in our current plan as compared to the last draft plan. The intent is, is the same as the original intent. We just found in our comments that um, the language had some ambiguity. So people were interpreting them in multiple ways. And so we wanted to be as clear as possible and leave no room, as, as little room for interpretation as possible. So the first sideboard is to adhere to standard department process for elk herd unit population objective review with public process and commission approval for any proposed changes. Prioritize hunting opportunities as the primary tool to manage elk populations toward commission approved herd unit objectives. Minimize elk damage to private property, disease transmission to livestock, and negative economic impacts to livestock producers. And minimize competition with other wintering wildlife species. So given the sideboards, the plan has two specific goals. The first being to promote elk health by limiting disease transmission while we are providing supplemental feed. And the second is to reduce the reliance of elk on supplemental feed while we adhere to the sideboards. So we have our goals, we have our sideboards. How do we get there? Through this process, we identified over 100 strategies that can help us get there. And they're categorized by management topic. Some strategies are repeated because they're relevant to more management topics. Please don't even try to read through these. The point is to show you there are a lot of strategies that we outlined, and it's really easy to find one or two that you don't like and get stuck on it because you can't see how it would work in the system or the feed ground that's near to you or near to your operation or your um, favorite honey hole for hunting. It's really easy to pick one and say, this does not work for me. I do not support this strategy. But the plan recognizes that not all these strategies will work for all the feed grounds or all the herd units. So through the feed ground management action plans, and I'll get into that next, the idea is that you can pick and choose which is the right strategies for this feed ground and for this herd unit. What are the most appropriate ones that work for affected stakeholders and to reach those goals. And so it's very likely that our fee ground management action plans will have a unique combination of these strategies that will move into implementation or to action. The one strategy I will highlight so that it's not a surprise to you, we do recommend that the feed ground quotas come out of commission policy and go into our herd unit objectives. And this gives us as managers more clarity of how we're supposed to manage to those numbers, where those numbers come from, and how we might um, make sure that they're biologically, sociologically, appropriate numbers. Um, but pulling them out of commission policy still gives you um, management authority because you approve our herd unit objective changes. So you would see those feed ground quotas through our herd unit objective review process. It looks like there may be a question. Jesse, that we do in one sentence really well at the beginning. Can you repeat it? <laughs> <laughs> you want us to 
specific, uh, President Ladwig, Commissioner Masters, and specific to the fee ground quotas? Okay, so currently the fee ground quotas are listed in commission policy. We would like to remove those from commission policy and incorporate them into our herd unit objectives. So instead of them all being in one place in the policy, they would be within the six herd unit objectives of the six herd units that have feed grounds. And again, through the process of updating those objectives, uh, you would approve those updated objectives. So um, a little bit more about feed ground management action plans or FMAPs. So again, there are six herd units between Pinedale and Jackson region that have feed grounds, three in Jackson, three in Pinedale. Some of those, herd, most of those herd units have more than one feed ground. And so the feed ground management action plans would be one per herd unit and include all the feed grounds within those herd units. And again, each herd unit, each feed ground is unique. And a, a really key thing we heard over and over through this whole process from our stakeholders and from the public was that this plan had to be adaptable and had to be able to deal with those nuances. And these FMAPs is how we intend to do that, to be adaptable and deal with those nuances. So the overarching plan, the one we're talking about today, it's very directive about the overarching directions, sideboards, and goals. It is adaptive about the strategies. It doesn't say you shall implement all these strategies. It is adaptive. What the FMAPs will say based on the unique challenges, opportunities, concerns, and the potentially impacted stakeholders at each fee ground, and then this is where they will become more directive, we will assess all of the uh, strategies at each fee ground, but then we'll implement the appropriate combination of, of strategies at each fee ground. So essentially when we're done with this FMAP process, and I'll get a little more into that process in a minute, um, the FMAP will basically be a playbook. For this herd unit with this fee grounds, this, these are the actions that we will take that are in line with the goals and sideboards of the overarching plan. And the strategies we pull from that are appropriate based on our input from who's affected, from the public and internal moving towards those goals. Um, but I guess I'll just emphasize again, this framework allows us to be adaptable both in time We'll review these annually and update them as needed and in space. They will be unique based on the needs of a fee ground and herd unit. Um, again, John said this, but I'll say it again. There's a lot of people that spend a lot of time and effort, um, maybe some of it fun, maybe some of it frustrated, but we got incredible input from the stakeholders that stuck with us through that process, as well as the public. Um, a lot of the stakeholders are here in the room today, so thank you for continuing to participate in the process. We also had a lot of department personnel time and non-department experts that participate in this, so just wanted to make sure, um, just take this opportunity on, on behalf of the committee to say thank you. And then again, similar to the CWD management plan, we're presenting this plan today for you with a request for approval. Specifically, that includes the direction, sideboards, goals, the plans to update commission policy, and that suite of strategies that we'll assess in this forthcoming FMAP process. And then if you do decide to approve the plan today, it would kick off that FMAP process. Step one of that would be Jackson and Pinedale deciding which herd unit to start with. They'll each have three. There's a lot of factors that will go into that decision uh, based on priority and urgency. And then we'll have some internal homework to do. For example, identifying affected, potentially affected stakeholders, um, doing calculations such as if we know low density feeding is a really good strategy to reduce um, disease and we know the acreage of a feed ground, 
based on the acreages of our feed grounds, like how many elk can we support with low density feeding season long? Those are just the types of homework that we need to do. That's two examples of a long list. Once we kind of do our homework, then we have this really cool opportunity to sit at the table with our potentially affected stakeholders and say, what are the hurdles here? And what does it take to get over, under, and around them? And what can we do in the short term, near term, and decades term um, to reach toward those goals? And then also bring that process out to the public. And then again, like I said, get this FMAP playbook that we can implement at that herd unit level, and then we'll move on to the next herd unit. Um, I guess before I finish, I'll just say it's it's really easy to see what we have in common here, which is an innate kind of desire and um, responsibility to ensure that we have enduring wildlife populations in the face of CWD. And I think it's really diverse of the concerns and the way people think we can get that done. But if we remember that we're all in this room for the same reason, to make sure that our future generations have these same healthy, thriving populations as we do, then I think it makes it easier for us to sit around the table and talk through those obstacles and figure out ways to get around them so we can, we can chart a path forward now um, while we have this awesome opportunity to do that. And with that, we have a bunch of the committee here to field any questions and thank you for your time. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Rokaw. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so maybe not a specific question yet, but order of our process here. Are we gonna go through the plan and look at specific language? Are we gonna take public comment? Or well, what's your intent, Mr. President? We have public comment that I'm sure we're gonna take before we take any action. Certainly. And as far as going through the whole plan, I, we probably don't have that kind of time, do we? Well, we'll, yeah, it's a hundred pages long, but if there are specific parts of the plan that the commission decides are important to do a deeper dive on after we hear from public comment, we will gladly, we've got the team here to do it. We'll gladly move through whatever the commission might want us to take up. But my recommendation would be to, unless there's a burning question from the commission to move into public comment. I bring nothing to the table, Mr. President. I'll turn my bike mic on. Uh, first one is Brian Taylor. And just while he's on the way up, what we'll do, we'll take all the in-house comments first, and then we'll do the Zoom comments at the end. President Ladwig, uh, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, I appreciate the opportunity to comment here today. It's going to be real brief, but I was involved with this from the first meeting, I believe it was the 1st of February in 2022. The only one I missed was on the 31st of August last. It was fall to me. I was getting ready to go to the hills for two months, so I didn't make that one, but it was a long, drawn-out process. In some ways, I was very frustrated. In a lot of ways, I was. But I think you have a parity here today with just exactly what you dealt with with this corridor thing. You got to take a step somewhere. And I think CWD is a uh, concern. I think you would be naive to think it's not something we should be concerned about. But uh, it was mentioned there in the back of the room just a minute ago that where CWD started is the place where you're having to decide to reduce the herd number by 60%. So it's obviously not a demise for the elk as it is the deer. But uh, moving forward with these things, we need to move slowly when we make any changes. This winter up where I'm at in the Grovon Valley is a good example of that. We went from maybe the mildest winter I saw through February till 
we had a storm where it snowed 28 inches and basically one in 24 hour period. We went to winter in a hurry and it can change a lot fast. And the densities can change on these uh, winter elk management areas, I like to call them. I wish we would have never started them, called them feed grounds because it sounds bad. It sounds like a feed lot. But they're a winter elk management area. And that's the way you manage wildlife or elk and wildlife for the most part in Western Wyoming because the commingling with other species now has never been greater where I'm at. I can view approximately 10 miles of ridge lines from our ranch house with a spotting scope, and I've never seen more commingling with the bighorn sheep the last than the last couple of years. At times there was bighorn sheep, deer, and elk as if one unit this year. And then the big storm hit, now it's even worse. But move slowly. You got to start somewhere. Um, I'm hoping to stay involved. I think one thing that needs to be addressed is predators. Uh, like Mr. Haberberger addressed, predators are a huge concern when you start dealing with large numbers of elk combining in one spot where I'm at. You can go from a small number to over a thousand overnight because of the large predators on the landscape. But uh, I'm I'm I, I'm very pleased to hear the adaptive word. Let's not set it in concrete on any of this. Move slowly. We're gonna it's it's gonna be a learning process for everybody. Thanks for for the opportunity to comment. I appreciate your time. Anybody have any questions? No, thank you, sir. Steve Martin. Good afternoon, President Ludwig, uh, members of the commission, um, Director Nesbitt. Steve Martin, I'm a local sportsman, also was a member of the stakeholders group that uh, started this process. Um, and I, I just want to support the, the plan and, and hopefully you will approve it so that we can start managing our feed grounds and uh, hopefully managing brucellosis and CWD as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dustin Child. Welcome. President, Commission, Director Nesvik, thanks for this opportunity to get up here and speak. Um, my name is Dustin Child. I'm an outfitter here locally. I have seven hunting camps that we operate from the just south of the Teton Mountains all the way down into the Wyoming range. Um, I've grown up here, grew up in Cokeville, Wyoming. I started guiding elk hunters or guiding hunters in 1994. This will be 31 years guiding hunters. I've been an outfitter for 20, 20, 21 years as an outfitter. So um, I've been in this a long time. Uh, I know the area well. Um, and I, I've read this plan. I, when, I, when I was emailed this plan, I started to read it. And I kind of got bogged down in the first 30 pages of it. And I'm just like, I got bogged down and I just quit reading it, got frustrated and I quit reading it. And I picked it up yesterday morning. I knew I was coming here. And so I started reading it and I, and I powered through and got to page 50. And um, when I, when I got to page, page 50, that's when I really started to hit the meat and potatoes of, of what is in this. And I had some serious concern and I wish I'd have read it earlier. Cause I, I started calling other people and making phone calls and asking people what they thought and trying to become more, more aware of what was happening right here. And, and as I read through this, I have some major concerns about the way it is written. And I agree with, with Brian Taylor that you're at a crossroads here and you need to make a decision. Um, Western Wyoming, we've just listened to a pronghorn presentation and a mule deer presentation. Our herds, the, the deer and antelope, are in dire straits right now, right now for one reason or another. They're, they're in hard shape. The one thing that we have is elk. Our elk hunting in western Wyoming is really good. It's as good as I've seen it in 30 years. And there's one reason it is, and that's because of these feed grounds. These feed grounds work. They have worked for over 100 years. 
We have healthy populations of elk. We have lots of elk for the sportsmen, for viewing, for whatever you would like. Um, and, and the reason these the, the elk with these feed grounds have been able to survive the wolves, the large carnivores, uh, the, the bad winners, brucellosis. I remember the brucellosis task force that took place and was very popular here in the Pinedale area. Um, the feed grounds have persevered and they have kept the elk have persevered, been able to persevere because of these feed grounds. Um, and so we need to continue to feed these elk and feed them. And what I worry about is this, this um, management plan that's being proposed right now. There's a couple of things that I'm just going to read through it. It's on page 52. And if, if I ask any of you before you go on and you approve this plan, read pages 50 through 57, and that will really give you an idea of what this plan has in it. And a couple of my, my um, concerns, it says herd objective. This is on page 52. Encourage managers to review elk herd population objectives in consideration of available native range and LD, low density feeding capacity on feed grounds. Um, as I read through this, through those five or six pages, there's a lot of talk on lowering uh, elk numbers, of uh, managing elk numbers to the natural native winter range and low density feeding. Uh, in Western Wyoming right now, I just drove through Bondurant, through the Hoback, and like Brian Taylor said, there's winter there. There is a lot of snow. There is no native winter range showing. They, they all, there's none, none for them. If they're not getting fed right now, they're eating pine needles or snowflakes. They're, they're, they're in rough shape. So as this plan goes through, it talks a lot about um, lowering objectives to meet, from what I read on it, to meet available native winter range and low density feeding. Albert Summers, Representative Summers, a couple of years ago passed a bill through the legislation, as you're all aware of, that pretty well put the, the closure of a feed ground in the, in the hands of the governor, the commission, and the livestock board. Um, I see this plan as a way to, for the department not to shut close feed grounds down because they can't really do that without the governor's stamp on it. But this is a way to reduce the number of elk being fed. For example, in the Horse Creek feed ground in the Hoback, which is an area that I hunt and, and have for a long time, there's, there's um, that the Fall Creek Elk Herd has an objective of 4,400 animals on it. Camp Creek has an objective uh, of 1,250 elk. Camp Creek, I think, is 900. Um, my fear is if this is proved, if the if you commissioners approve this right now, they are going to the wildlife managers are going to look at this feed ground and they're going to go the the Camp Creek and the Horse Creek feed grounds. The 1,250 head elk is too many, too many elk on there. I've, I've already heard. I've been told that several times by individuals in this room. <laughs> um, there's too many in, in, in Camp Creek also. That's 900 head elk. We need to lower that. And this gives them the authority to do that. And where it gives it the authority to do it is right here which Cheyenne just asked this commission for, and it is the paragraph right below that. It says commission policy, fee ground quotas, remove fee ground quotas from commission policy and incorporate them into herd objectives. That takes the power, the way I read this, away from you guys. So if they want to take that horse creek feed ground from 1,250, it goes to 800. Uh, there's no commission. You're not able to vote on it. I'm not able to come up here and speak against it. That's the way I read this. What, that is, that is how I've understood it. I've asked a couple of individuals in this room, and I've got a couple of different responses uh, from, from the department individuals on how, the, how they understand that. So this is a major, major, uh, I, I want to see this stay in the commission. I want to see this stay in the commission's hands that you guys have to vote if they are going to lower these objectives. And I make a prediction that if this is passed today or when this is passed as written, if it's passed as written, that a year or within five years, when the Fall Creek Elk Herd is objective is revisited, that they will be presenting to lower that objective. That is my prediction. And that these feed ground quotas will be also being lowered. So they're not gonna quit feeding elk, they're just gonna lower these objectives. They're gonna lower the objectives. Um, 
if you go into page 57, it says native winter range objectives. Adjust herd objectives to what can be sustained in the absence of feed grounds. Following the department herd objective review process, reduce densities of elk via harvest to achieve new objectives over a determined time frame to maintain harvest and primary management tools. This is what this is full of: reduce, reduce, reduce. Um, and and what's very concerning to me is if you go to page fifty three. It talks about auxiliary management. When I read this, I was terrified. Auxiliary management, I didn't really understand what it was. It says, consider non-traditional hunting seasons in areas where herds are over-objective. Emergency feeding is being considered or hunting season strategies have been ineffective. So the way I read this is it gives the department the ability to do whatever means necessary to bring these herds into objective. I was just told by um, Gary Freilich a little bit ago, they're having a hard time getting the big piney herd right up here under objective. They counted it and it's over objective by quite a bit. He just told me, Gary said, hunting seasons have not been effective up there for one reason or another. If hunting seasons are not working, what's the alternative, aerial gunning? And maybe no one in this room right now has the intention to aerial gun elk to get these herds into objective. But if this is passed and you can, the commission, you give them the opportunity to do this, they get the green light. Maybe 10, 15 years from now, it's a whole different commission. It's a whole different staff here. I'm probably, I won't even be here. But maybe someone in 15 years, because of this plan that you passed today, they'll have to aerial gun elk. The Horse Creek feed ground, it's winter closure, December 1st. It goes into winter closure. No human presence after December 1st. You can't hunt cow elk on there after that. That's when, the, like this year, we had late snows. The elk didn't show up till the middle, later part of December. You can't even hunt them on there if you, you, you wanted to because it's a forest service winter closure. The only way to get to those elk, helicopter and a machine gun. Um, that's the kind of stuff, yeah, it's maybe a little radical, but that's the kind of stuff that I read in here. Um, and what scares me is Cheyenne was referring to um, some data on here, and excuse me, and I apologize for, for going over and go, going so long, but I feel this is very important, um, about the Bridger Teton National Forest. They just had their, they put a, a panel of eight so-called experts together and come up with a recommendation to what they should do with the forest park and the Del Creek feed grounds. The recommendation of those experts was to immediately quit feeding elk. Um, if I have the report, if any of you want to contact me and I'll get it to you, there is an individual that works for the, for the department. And I don't, I, I don't want to be mean or throw anyone's names out, but it's Ben Wise. Ben Wise is part of that panel of eight. And his recommendation was to immediately quit feeding elk, like right now. Um, he works for the department. He's going to be someone that's going to be making these decisions. And, and that's what, that's what terrifies me that possibly this gives the, the the department without commission oversight pretty much the ability to really drastically reduce these feed grounds. They're not going to quit feeding elk. They're just going to lower it. So um, that's my concern with this. I asked the commission to postpone this. I know we need a, a plan to go forward. I am in full support of, of a plan. Postpone this. Do not sign this today. Kick. Let, let's study this more. The, the one thing that we have in Western Wyoming it, that is good to hunt right now is elk. That's it. Our moose, bighorn sheep, antelope, deer, bear hunting is pretty good. <laughs> but other than, but in the, in, the, in the big game sector, elk is what we have. Let's not mess that up. Let's proceed with caution. I, and, that, and that is my recommendation, is just to proceed, understand what auxiliary management means, understand why they're taking the commission's um, ability uh, on the feed ground when it, when it says right there on the remove feed ground quotas from commission policy. Let's fully understand why they're wanting to do that. Anyway, um, that's all I have to say and thank you very much for your time. Mr. Mr. President, any questions? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. So on page 50, uh, which is the, where you start with the meat and potatoes and I agree with you. Um, at the bottom of the first paragraph under direction, the very last sentence says, 
no strategies can be implemented to accomplish the goals without adhering to the sideboard. So really important to look at what that sideboards is. And the sideboards are designed and put in there to make sure that the stakeholders, uh, the public and stakeholders um, have assurances to, that, that these four things, and it says as such, the department will continue to, it doesn't say should or could, it says will. And then it says adhere to standard department process for elk herd unit population objective review with public processes and commission approval for any changes. What do you think about that? Are you okay with that? Yes, yes. And, and uh, Commissioner Bell, President, um, um, yes, thank you. And I have read that. And, and when I read this document, I, I read it and I, I get excited about it because there's some things I really like about, about it. But when I read this plan also, there's things that I, I have concerns about, about the auxiliary management, removing it from the commission. It kind of almost talks out both sides of its mouth. And, and I've talked to several people about this that have read it, and they've said the same thing. And one of their concerns uh, is, or, you know, several of the concerns is, is, is it's a way, it, it, it comes down to the personnel that's in that position. It gives them a lot of ability, the way I read this, to do what they want. Because, yes, it says that. But did you, did you also notice that they removed the word and they changed it from the last draft from public support to public process, that that word, from what I have read, and and I've had I had this brought up to me also by 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 someone uh, that it's went from public support to public process. So now this no longer has to have public support. They have to do. They can just go through the process of it. That's what I fear. So, th thank you. Yeah, real quick on auxiliary management, Dustin. So it's a pretty new term um, to the department. It's something that was recently implemented by the commission. It is a commission regulation. It was implemented to address um, specifically, you know, it's for all big game, but we've used it for elk in places where the normal, the normal process of hunting seasons um, isn't working. And those auxiliary management seasons do not include aerial gunning elk. It's usually on, actually to this point, it's been exclusively on private land where there's a private land issue where um, there's extra licenses allocated. It's still, you have to use all the normal means of take, but a hunter or a person participating in this um, landowner says, you know, that we work out with the, with the landowner that there's 50 elk that need to be harvested. Landowner says, okay, those 10 guys can hunt and they get, we issue them licenses. They go in and they harvest those elk on private land. And it's only when you're over the management objective. And in every case, it's been significantly over the management objective. So I understand a little bit of fear of the unknown, but it's not, it's fairly new, but we've already implemented it and it's not draconian or it's not, um, it's not aerial gunning elk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, Mr. President. Go ahead. Um, just to clarify one thing, you talked uh, you talked about the uh, removing the feed ground quotas from commission policy um, and incorporating them into herd objectives. And if I heard you right, your concern was that would take it away from the commission's holy water. Um, but the the commission still passes on the herd objectives, so. I'm not, I'm not following you because all there, and help me Cheyenne, um, please. Um, if you can, all we're doing is taking those numbers and folding them together with the, and the commission still has oversight over it. You, uh, Commissioner Masterson and president. Yes, I understand that my fear. Okay is that I've been told for years that like the Horse Creek Camp Creek has, uh, Horse Creek Feed Ground there's, has a quota of 1,250 elk and it's, I have it actually right here. I have oh, it. okay. But, but, but I've been told there's too many elk on there. There's too many elk on, on that feed ground for the limited amount of space. Um, same with Camp Creek. There's just not enough area. And then you throw the wolves on top of that. The wolves, there's a pack of seven wolves on there that's been hitting them all winter going back and forth. Um, so what I what I see coming out of this is that uh, you know the managers up there, the department's going to come and say, we need to lower this quota on this feed ground. It's no longer sustainable for twelve hundred and fifty elk. We got to go to whatever the 
the scientific number or arbitrary number that you throw out, 600. Scientific. Scientific. I mean, we'll use that. Yes. The best, the best science uh, will come is. out. It is. And, and it is. You are, yeah. you are correct. But as someone that's hunted that area for 20 years, um, I'm an outfitter. You know, I hunt there. In 2014 through 17, the population of the Falk Creek herd went from, you know, 5,200 elk down to about 3,800 elk. And just in that, that change in elk populations, I went from near 80% success on my clients in, in like 2010, 12, right in there. When it went in 2014, 15, 16, just with the population decrease of roughly 600 animals, I was having hunters that was on armed horseback rides. I, they'd go an entire hunt and I'd not show them an elk. We, lost, there, we had a reduction in 600 head of elk. And the hunting, I went from running two camps at full capacity to one camp to half capacity, and I never have come back uh, in that other camp. So if they take that Camp Creek herd from 1,250 and go to 600, or that Horse Creek herd, I mean, the hunting opportunity there is going to be, it's going to be very meager. It's, 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 we're kind of squeaking by as it is, and we're kind of hanging on by the, the threads, the, the end of it, um, with the wolves. The wolves are a huge issue up there. And if, and if an arbitrary number, a scientific number comes out, that's why I fear because of this is they're going to use science to drive down the greatest elk herd in the state of Wyoming that's on public land and able to hunt. So that's my concern, Commissioner Masterson, Master and President. Um, I'll not take no more of your time. No. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but and I probably will, but I got to say it, uh, you know, being part of the, and I wish the legislature would be a little bit more conscious about throwing terms around because when, when the supposing the legislature, when they're, when they're throwing around aerial gunning elk, because we're over objective, what, what trust does that have for our sportsmen? Cause saying that, um, that uh, it can't happen. And, and and I don't want the legislature to to take so much offense, but words have repercut repercussions. And by throwing terms around, oh, we'll just go in an aerial gun elk because we're over objective over around buffalo. The commission is sitting here today, and and nobody trusts because of that kind of language. I wish they'd be more conscientious of that. Okay, good point. I'm probably in trouble, but thank you. Thank you. Next one is Ted Jenkins. President Lagwood, Commissioners, Director Nesvik. Here we go again. Uh, I'm also an outfitter in the Grays River area, second generation. A lot of the concerns I had have been voiced, uh, you know, the feed ground system, in my opinion, is a very, very successful operation to keep our elk in western Wyoming to a sustainable huntable population and I agree with uh, Brian Taylor I would urge to proceed with caution here uh, one of my biggest concerns is is maybe not anybody in this room has the intent to shut down feed grounds but that doesn't mean in 15 years or 10 years when every one of us are changed out that that is going to change. And I just hope that this plan doesn't kick the door open for that in certain instances. Um, but uh, with the uh, deer mortality that uh, we've seen in winter of 2023, thank goodness we had our 22 feed grounds in Western Wyoming or else I believe this whole conversation would be totally different. We'd be having the same conversation we had with deer. And I, you know, what a wonderful, wonderful problem that the game and fish has to deal with elk numbers being over objective. I mean, I'm sorry, maybe I'm looking at it from a different way. I know some ranchers will probably disagree with me when I say this, but <laughs> that is, uh, <laughs> that is a, a, a problem in my opinion, better than the the sad, black, gloomy numbers we just seen from the mule deer guys here of uh, possibly, I, 
I call myself an elk outfitter now. I live in, you know, I outfit for my whole life in the in the heart of the Wyoming range in the mule deer mecca that is very, very on the verge of losing our um, uh, jurisdiction of one of the best mule deer areas. If we're not really, really careful here, that's going to happen. So uh, one thing I do have to hunt, as Dustin said, we got elk and, and it's because of these feed grounds. So uh, I won't take any more of your time and I appreciate, uh, uh, you know, I believe that we do need a plan. I, you know, I think uh, CWD is something that we definitely need to be concerned about. Like Brian said, we'd be crazy not to, but I think we have, it, it, it's better than having no elk. It's, it's just kind of the same way with the deer, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, amongst uh, residents of Star Valley about feeding deer and the CWD uh, um, that it proposed, you know, risk that it proposed. And, you know, my always, my thought was, you know, if you get CWD in a herd, reducing it by 40, 50% is a hell of a lot better than reducing it by 80, 90% one winter. So that's just my thoughts. And I, uh, I, I, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hey, Ted, I can tell you that after the last month of some real quality time with the Wyoming legislature that um, over objective elk populations haven't felt like a wonderful problem. <laughs> <I'm> right. <laughs> Zach B. E? Commission, <laughs> Mr. Ladwig, Neswick, uh, Commission as a whole. So I was on the uh, stakeholder group. So I've been part of it actually since 2020. I was uh, bored during COVID and uh, called in on some of the uh, Zoom calls on some of the public meetings in the very original part. And uh, I first off want to tell you guys thank you for um, Brian Neswick actually sent me a letter with the governor and invited me to the task force and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be part of it. Um, to say it's complex is an understatement. Uh, it's, it's extremely complex. Uh, Cheyenne and I've had a hour ride with Gary Fralick talking about CWD complexity from uh, LaBarge, Wyoming to uh, Daniel or uh, the den. So anyways, with that all being said, I have kind of a different view on this that I want to propose today, and it's kind of a little odd. Um, I am disappointed that Cheyenne didn't have my one proposal of more feed grounds in one of the chapters, because that was something I proposed. I thought if we could, you know, spread these elk out along the landscape by our design, maybe it would help out still ensuring the same thought process of letting them feed naturally, but I'll get over that. Um, with that being said, I look at this slightly different and so I, I've, I've got a question. So how often do you guys review the regulations on like trapping and bears and everything else? It's three years. So I would like to see before, so I'd, I'd like this not to be signed today with the intent of it being approved with one last little page added to it. My biggest fear is is not the people that sit in front of me today or this group of panel over here right now. My biggest fear is, is who's gonna be running this operation in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And, and it terrifies me because, you know, I attend all these meetings, I attend all the public meetings, I attend, you know, I, I literally spend my life at these meetings and it's not gotten any easier. The discussions have not gotten any easier. The pushback's gotten more difficult over the years. What I ask us to add at the end of that thing is, and you guys pick the number, maybe it's every six years, every 10 years, whatever it is. But I would like, as we learn developments on CWD and we understand it better, because I don't, I, I was also at the 2020 Rollins meeting and asked you guys not to approve the CWD management plan. So I'm that guy too. I, I ask us that as we develop more technology, which we will, let's revisit this management plan in a, in a, uh, not a casual setting where, you know, and I'm not, I'm just using Cheyenne because she's so part of this, but not where Cheyenne swings in and yep, the management plan's doing good. Year six, let's keep going. Add something in there that every 
every five years or every six years, the commission or the team or whatever is, is forced to reevaluate the commission plan, the, the uh, elk feed ground plan. We're forced to see what the new technologies are. Maybe there's a little bit of a language change at that point. Um, and, and, and while it's staying adaptive like we want, we keep it adaptive on that level as we learn new things and, and, and learn new science. You know, I myself, and I know that Sam will have a heart attack or shake her head at me, but I don't believe CWD is as bad as we think. And I know that I'm not popular for that, but there's probably one of us in this room that has COVID right now. Let's just pretend. One of us in this room has COVID. Would we lock the doors and starve us all out to try to figure out who that person was that had COVID? Absolutely not. We are now looking for CWD. If you look for something, you're going to find it. If you test, 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 and we've increased the testing frequencies, we've, we've increased the areas, we've increased everything about CWD testing, we're going to find it when we're looking for it. So all I'm asking is as we're doing this process, let's make this program, you know, add a chapter at the end that's, that makes us more adaptive. You know, it has to be looked at every six years or every 10 years, and it has to be, it has to be pulled out flipped over 10 times, all 92, 95, 106 pages, whatever it ends up to over these years. And then that way the commission, if it changes faces, which it will over the next 10, 15 years, we have that ability to, 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 to adapt to those, the, the new technologies brought in with CWD and, and make those changes. And then the last thing I have, and uh, this one I'm probably not gonna be popular for either, but the last thing I have is I, the competition the elk are going to put on these mule deer terrifies me. I'm the let a deer walk guy. I know it wasn't, some people loved it, some people didn't, but I'm the let a deer walk guy. 1,200 of those tags that weren't used last year were, were in my program. People won four-wheelers and custom truck packages and, uh, you know, guns and all sorts of cool stuff. Bear hunts, you know, everything you, you can think of. Our elk are all above objective right now statewide. Shut down Southwest Wyoming mule deer hunts shut down the whole entire Wyoming range I know that's not going to be liked shut it down for two years use that as a chance for people to elk hunt to bring the population objectives down instead of us going in with and I know we're not an aerial gun but instead of us going in and having to kill them by either starvation of the feed grounds or or alter alternate means more people out there elk hunting we'll see if it works we take the pressure off the deer for two years and try to give the deer a break that in my opinion will be extinct. That's all I have left. Anybody have any comments? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Zach. Bill Ames. Mr. President, commissioners, Director Nesvik, thanks for this opportunity. I was a stakeholder on this group too, and uh, I, I was amazed at the effort that went into this and the questions that were tried to be asked to cover everything. I, I don't really know how it could have gone any better. And these feed grounds have worked great for the past 90 to 100 years, and they still work great. But we have a new kid on the block called CWD. And I've done everything I can to look at every model I could find. And, and the professionals have, you know, highlighted some of them in our stakeholders group, but I've went online and tried to find everything I could. And there isn't a model out there that shows elk numbers to be higher, continuing to feed than reducing feed ground elk. The, the long-term success of elk depends on reducing the reliance on these feed grounds because of CWD. The, the, the CWD changes the whole outlook. And, and I think there's a lot of people, especially in Western Wyoming, that really don't understand CWD. It, it's a real thing. And I, the uh, changing the commission approval for each feed ground versus a herd unit objective, my understanding is that it gives the feed ground management action plans, a little more leeway 
to emergency feed in places or if we need to relocate a feed ground, it just makes it easier on that group to manage for that. And, and the words adaptable in this program is key. There, this isn't locked in. There is no, this whole document isn't pointing fingers that this must be done. It's tools to look at how to achieve this process. And, and we have to look at the long-term success of elk. And there isn't a model out there that continuing to feed ground operations like we are is better for elk. And it, it's been great for the brucellosis and, and I, it's gonna be a challenge working with the egg producers and how we get winter feed grounds or winter range for elk versus the egg producers. And, and I don't wanna see any egg producer fail they're the reason we have open spaces. They are the reason we have these migrations, that they're key to it. But I strongly urge the commission to pass this feed ground management action plan so we don't have to wait until CWD is really a problem. And there, there's nothing in here that says, as soon as this is implemented, we need to do this. This is a slow process that's gonna take a hundred years but let's not put it off. Let's open the doors that these game and fish people can start to implement some strategies to help it. So I, I strongly encourage you pass this thing as soon as you can. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Tim. Habersberger, H A B E O. Did a lot better this time. Yeah, I got it a little better. <laughs> it's like I said before, close enough. Uh, first, I want to apologize. I got told by several people that when I first talked, I didn't address address the commissioners properly. I apologize for that, uh, for my hillbillyism. But I do very much appreciate all of you guys' time, everybody in this room, very much so and appreciate a, a chance to talk. I don't care if you pass this or not, but I don't think it should be voted on today. And I'll tell you why. I was asked by several people in 2020 to get on this task force or whatever you want to call it. I watched some of the stuff. I've never touched a computer. My wife helped me with it. Some of the meetings online, but when they became physical meetings, I went to every meeting except Laramie. And even Kara, who ran these things, said, Tim, you don't have to be here when I went to Rock Springs and Pinedale and Jackson and Afton. You don't have to be at every one. I said, no, if I'm going to get involved, I want to know what the people think. The only meeting I missed was Laramie. And I went to every meeting since. And the number one thing that was said at the start of every single meeting was, these meetings are not to shut down feed grounds. It was said again here today that this task force was not started to shut down feed grounds. I think you commissioners would have got a lot more comments from your constituents if they weren't told that at every single meeting. On the last page of this thing, I had so many things underlined and folded to talk today. We'd be here till the weekend if I tried to say it all, okay? <laughs> but I'll bring up the last page on page 76. In the face of existing and threatening diseases, it is incumbent upon wildlife managers to explore all options, all options for managing elk now and into the future. This is the second sentence. Controlling elk in Western Wyoming through supplemental feeding is not sustainable. That's the last page of this thing. It is not sustainable to keep feeding elk. And the public was told that these meetings were not to shut down. And as far as a herd objective thing and the feed ground quotas, and now we're going to do it this way, it doesn't matter. Why are we changing it? Right now, the managers, every meeting I've ever been to the, that are coming up this month on season dates and everything, I've been going to them for 40-some years. 
Every one of them is, well, here's the herd objective on the feed ground and here's the herd objective for the whole herd unit. It's always been done. And all of a sudden we wanna change the wording. Why? I can't figure it out. I, I got more confused today. Listen to everybody. I got more confused. And everything on the CWD thing is computer models. I brought something up earlier today. The deer wars started over a computer model. That's what started the deer wars in the 90s. They said it was a computer mistake. Computers don't make mistakes. Whatever you feed in comes out the other end. And everything in this is over computer models. Everything. But I don't think you can, by rights, my opinion, that you can vote on this today in good faith because your constituents were told at every single meeting that this was not to shut down feed grounds. And I just read you what it says in the last paragraph on this thing, that they are not sustainable. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Megan Smith. President Ludwig, the commission, uh, Director Nesvik, thank you again for the opportunity to comment today. Um, on behalf of the Sublet County Conservation District, I'd like to reiterate to the commission the importance of local governments, including conservation districts, being named as specific stakeholders in your plan developments. We feel the department has overlooked that importance in both the draft and when reviewing our comments. And as local governments are not listed in the plan that you have before you today. Local governments, including the conservation district and county commissioners are elected by their peers and we represent the local interests and we should be key stakeholders in your feed ground management plan development. Sublet County Conservation District did have a seat at the development of this plan in front of you and we strongly suggest that the commission amend the plan today to reflect the conservation districts and other local government do have a seat at the future, uh, at the table for future uh, FMAP development. Uh, thank you again for your time and letting me provide the opportunity to express our comments. Okay, any questions? Uh, Ms. President, yes, I do. Yeah. Um, thanks, Megan, and, and I certainly support that sentiment, and so I'm not as familiar with the plan. Where would you include that language change? Do you know? Anyone know where, where we talk about stakeholders? They're looking. They're looking, looking right now. Well, uh, Mr. President, um, Mr. President, over here. Yeah. <laughs> can I ask a question while while that's being looked up? Can yeah, I ask a? Sure. Can I ask a? a it just, I'm curious. You you went to the meetings. I personally, well, well, we had or representatives, representatives. right? Um, so I'm just wondering if it ever came up, you know, Hey, you know, we're, uh, not in here. If you got a response or was it like in the I, last version, you, you know, I am not hundred percent sure. So do you know? Yeah. President and commissioners, Nesbik and Coke Landers, I'm the current chairman of the conservation district. Uh, more or less, our staff told us that they have been involved. We appreciate our working relationship, everything that we do. We get along great with our local staff. We would just like clarification and more specific uh, recognition of the local governments and not just a vague definition as stakeholders. Because right. then it leaves it open to opinion to whoever's working the plan future down the years or whatever. We would like specific recognition so that we can remain a seat at the table due to okay. opinion. I, I, I appreciate that. I can, uh, speaking for myself, um, I feel 
um, the involvement of local entities like you and like the county commissioners is incredibly important. Um, whether you choose to participate, you know, you need to have the invitation. And I feel it's very, very important. I won't speak for anybody else, but I hear I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I, Chief. I'd add, not just in this, not just in this plan. Right. You know, yeah. in general. Chief King. President Ladwig, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, I did just want to point out that on, on page 74, we talk about the development of the F maps and, and we have a section in there about public involvement. And there's a sentence that says the department will identify and collaborate with potentially impacted stakeholders. We, we intentionally didn't list every specific stakeholder for the very reason that as soon as we start doing that, we'll potentially miss somebody. And so the intent here is that we recognize there are a ton of stakeholders and the door is wide open for everybody and we'll do our level best to make sure that everybody's invited to the tent, but we didn't list specific entities in here for the very reason that as soon as you do that, we'll probably hear that we left somebody off. So I, I hope that that addresses the concern that you just heard that we, we don't intend to limit stakeholders in any way. It's, it's open to broad engagement. Thank you, Chief. Mr. President, I, yep. I appreciate that, Chief King. And and I'm I'm thinking um stakeholders in two groups. Yeah, there's stakeholders, um NGOs and and those kind of groups, but there's also um local governments, local elected officials. And I think there are more than stakeholders. Um, with an impact like a feed ground to a community. So I, I, I don't disagree with you, Rick, but I think there's still importance of, of when we start doing those, those F maps that county commissions and local conservation districts are, they're not invited. They're just, they're part of the team already. So how do we capture that? How would we capture that in this plan? We'll have a recommendation for you here when we get done. Thank you. This just says option number 11. Yeah, he's, he's agenda item 11, Bill Ring. It's oh, 11. Do we have any more tens? There's a 10. Yeah. McKay Erickson. President, Director, Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I uh, am a resident sportsman for 57 years, all my life, and I've been in, involved all my life in, in these as much as I possibly can. Uh, as I read the the plan, studied it, stewed on it, uh, one point kept coming back to me time and time again, and that is the frightening uh, number of times it talks about lowering objectives. I, I am very concerned about that, and especially after hearing on the study that <clears throat> was quoted, we can't hang our hat on. Things in favor of managing for larger herd objectives. Number one, we talked about it earlier, deer are gone. I'm optimistic, very optimistic, because that's all I can be, but it's going to be a long time. Uh, if we have another catastrophic winter and we're, we have less feed available, uh, we're going to let our numbers of elk go, and that's going to be two-plus species gone. I have a concern of that. Number two is, <clears throat> excuse me, the income. I used to have been astounded at the... Uh, especially in the discussion of the uh, Forest Park and Dell Creek feed grounds in talking to some of the uh, game and fish folks. Uh, I, I, I wanted them to be a little more adamant about, uh, excited about doing whatever it takes to encourage the Forest Service to not drop those feed grounds. And uh, it was kind of, I, I felt like not as 
strong of a response to them because we know what can happen when the federal government <clears throat> has control of these situations. I would encourage the, the game and fish to very much be more aggressive towards more opportunity of feeding and feed grounds. I recognize the CWD. One point that was made earlier, though, that's coming from, and these are not as compact, I realize, but the 60% over numbers on the eastern side of the state in comparison to here, it's it's two very different situations, but it also, CWD is up by 60% in the, in the areas where CWD is prevalent. I know those are two different things, but it, it notes mentioning, I believe. And then number three is probably the most important thing because I come to it a little bit different. I've been, uh, my family has been involved all my life and I'm the youngest of seven children. The Grays River uh, elk hunt is a, a major issue to us. It's like our family reunion. And I see a lot of the values of originally in Western Wyoming, uh, getting run over uh, with with a lot of the things that are happening and the change, and I'm not in favor of a lot of those things, but one that I have always been able to uh, hang my hat on is the ability to have a viable, huntable, uh, enjoyable elk herd. And I'm I'm worried with the lower objectives and the pressure from the Forest Service to drop those feed grounds, as well as now this plan to lower objectives I'm, I'm afraid we're going to lose a considerable amount of way of life. And it's big in Western Wyoming. These feed grounds are huge, huge uh, to, to people that produce, that work there, that uh, take value in the, the hunting experiences. And, and we can go through a lot of those. Um, all in all, I would urge you to fight for, for feed grounds. And I know this is a little bit different, but fight for a forest park and, and Dell Creek. Uh, I would, I would encourage to reject this plan until, um, objective numbers are increased. And, uh, with that, I, I thank you for your time. Any questions? We're ready for a, oh, zoom. Kelsey Yarzab. Okay. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Good afternoon, President Lagwig, Commissioners, and Director Nesvik. Thank you so much for the opportunity to offer public comment regarding the approval of the Department's Feed Ground Management Plan. My name is Kelsey Yarzab, and I'm a conservation organizer with Sierra Club Wyoming Chapter. And today, before you virtually, I represent approximately 2,000 Sierra Club members and supporters around the state of Wyoming. Our organization has been engaged with feed ground management decisions in the state of Wyoming for over a decade, including as a stakeholder in the development of this plan. Some elements of this latest iteration of an elk management plan are in the best interest of our elk populations, including finding new opportunities to expand elk habitat through the purchase, lease, or occupancy agreement with private landowners and federal agencies. We thank the department for acknowledging the need for expanded winter range for Wyoming elk. As previously mentioned in the presentation, the plan also includes a plethora of management options, including the phase out of feed grounds. We believe at Sierra Club Wyoming, along with our members and supporters, that feed ground phase out is vital to the health and longevity of the six Northwestern Wyoming elk herds. And a multi-year phase out program could be implemented in conjunction with the reestablishment of elk migration and allocation of elk winter range. However, in the face of mounting disease threats to ungulates throughout our state and beyond, we firmly believe that the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and the Commission should utilize the best available science to guide their management direction, particularly leveraging the expertise of scientists within their own department to better understand and prepare for the risks associated with the spread of chronic wasting disease, brucellosis, and hoof rot, among others, all on feed grounds. According to the draft environmental impact statement pertaining to the renewal of feeding permits at Dell Creek and Forest Park on the Bridger-Teton National Forest, 
Chronic wasting disease prions, the contagious agent, can persist in the environment and continue to be infectious for years by binding to soil elements or plants, making it difficult to manage the disease once it is established in a population. Further, the report prepared by the U.S. Geological Survey as part of the Dell Creek Forest Park feed ground permitting process similarly acknowledges that the long-term persistence of infectious CWD prions in the environment suggests that feed ground management decisions may have long-lasting consequences. Finally, according to an expert panel convened by the U.S. Geological Survey to develop this report, CWD transmission rates in fed elk populations are expected to be 1.9 to four times higher than in unfed populations. We are disappointed in the department's continued disregard for the very real threat posed by feed grounds in exacerbating the proliferation of wildlife diseases, not only in our ungulate populations, but throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Our previous concerns remain, as noted in our comments on the draft plan, surrounding the ability of the public to meaningfully participate in the next steps of this process, particularly in the development of FMAPs. We have a couple of outstanding questions from our organization regarding the development of FMAPs, such as who will be invited to participate, as the language in the plan is vague and suggests that FMAP participation will be limited to those stakeholders that the Game and Fish Department deem, quote, impacted by feed ground management. Second, we raise the concern of public comment. We ask that public comment periods be allotted after the completion of each FMAP. Uh, we're really nervous and concerned about the, uh, the ability for the public to engage in these processes as the plan uh, seems to state or seems to imply rather that these FMAP plans will be created behind closed doors. We really wanna make sure that the public has the opportunity to engage. Finally, I, really, I wish to clearly state that we are not asking for the immediate cessation of feeding. What we ask from the department and from you, the commission, is to dig into the science, realize the threat, and work toward a well-considered and comprehensive phase-out approach that pr prioritizes the health of, health of our elk populations and presents as, prevents as much as possible the proliferation of disease, particularly the always fatal, fatal chronic wasting disease. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay. Meg Foley. Hello, Meg. Hello, President and Game and Fish Commissioners. Um, I'm Meg. I'm a resident of Wyoming and an active advocate of wildlife. Um, I am here to comment for mine, the WGFD, that it's fundamental mission is conserve and act on behalf of wildlife in Wyoming by prioritizing the needs of wildlife and working to ensure that wild, free-ranging elk and other migratory species can move across the landscape between seasonal ranges without impediment from human development. Um, free grounds are known to be detrimental to wildlife, have interrupted migration corridors, and are known to host many diseases. There is a natural, there is a natural solution to wildlife disease, diseases like CWD um, that is often overlooked, and it is carnivores. Wolves, mountain lions, and other carnivores are critical in maintaining ecological balance. Um, wolves eat silk, sick elk and benefit the entire herd by helping the population by removing the disease and stopping the spread. Humans take the strongest, biggest elk out of the gene pool, while carnivores take the sick and weak. I hope that the Wyoming Game and Fish Department uses this management plan as a vehicle of public education that openly supports a cultural shift toward valuing and prioritizing healthy and free-ranging ungulate herds and carnivores on the land because of their inherent value as native species and their contribution to stable ecosystems. The plan states that CWD and other diseases will increase in our elk populations with the continuance of winter feeding. If that is to be the case, at least look into the natural solutions of staving off CWD, which promotes the existence of carnivores as a way to naturally keep our elk herds healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for me? Thank you very much. Next one is Nick 
Gurok. Hello, Nick. Good yep. afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Nick Givok, and I am a field organizer for the Sierra Club on Wildlands and Wildlife in the Northern Rockies. I am also a Montana elk hunter. Um, and I'm um, this issue definitely has regional significance throughout the Northern Rockies because these elk certainly, some of them do make it into other states at times. Um, you know, this plan really does have a lot of contradictions. It acknowledges that this is a problem and bad policy, but but maintains this issue of feeding elk. Basically, you are turning wildlife into livestock. And I know this is a complicated issue with a long history, but as Ms. Yar Yarzub stated, nobody is proposing an immediate uh, pulling the rug out from under these elk. We're talking about a gradual phase out of this. Um, the other thing is there's all this talk about uh, chronic wasting disease, which is a huge looming issue but you don't, we don't have to speculate. You had a 50% mortality rate of elk calves on the Horse Creek feed ground two winters ago. Now in a state like Wyoming that is so aggressive toward native carnivore species, you cannot uh, plausibly say that if those animals were distributed on the landscape on native feed that predators would have taken half of them. That is, that is unrealistic. Um, as you know, in Montana, we have healthy herds of, of elk and many other species, and they are we have we have a statutory uh, prohibition against feeding wildlife. Um, they are on native range, well distributed on the landscape. We have the full suite of carnivore species. So you know, and this issue does affect us in Montana and Idaho as well. Um, so we urge this commission to get serious with the wildlife science, you know, and, and many of the comments made today, you know, there is nothing in the mission statement of Wyoming Game and Fish that its job is to guarantee an outfitter a job. We need to look at the science and get serious about managing for healthy wildlife and that uh, that necessitates ending this uh, feeding program over time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Did Marissa Green come on? That's all I have here, so I don't know if you have any on. We don't have that name here, but did you say Commissioner Bowers? That's okay. That's... Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm just calling in reference. And we're not. We're we're got you mixed up. We're not ready for the trapping oh. side oh, yet. Okay. We do have Jess. Jess Johnson, would you like to speak? I apologize, I did not get a comment form in, but I felt uh, like after the experience that I've had for the last four weeks that it made sense to come up here and talk about this. Jess Johnson, Government Affairs Director for the Wyoming Wildlife Federation, and I wanted to urge and say thank you for what you guys have presented and what the department has put in front of you uh, with this feed plan. What I have sat through for the last four weeks was the legislature coming apart at the seams around elk. <laughs> and in all different ways. And my fear is if we do not jump on this and uphold your authority and the department's action plan around this, even if that's just a plan to make plans, which is what this is, it's showing accountability, it's showing that you guys are moving forward, that you're doing this. And if we don't do it, my fear is that we're going to end up in front of the legislature again, having to talk about the need for you guys to have the authority and the scientists to be making the decisions and the stakeholders at the table rather than at the legislative level. Keeping the wildlife management at the commission level is imperative. 
and it has been hard to do. This last year was the hardest I've ever seen them work at pulling that away at the legislative level. You guys have the tools, you have the experts and the people at the table to do this far better than any legislative thing. As amazing as they are, and as much as they do care, the wildlife decisions should be here with you. And so I would just say from that experience, urging this vote on this plan, because it if we don't do it, man, they're gonna show up and we're gonna be back in front of them fighting to keep it at your level again. Any comments? Thanks, Jess. Mr. President, before the commission makes a, starts deliberating this and makes some decisions, um, I would like to offer Brad Hovengay an, an opportunity to provide a few closing thoughts. And then I've got some thoughts as well to kind of summarize some of um, some of the things that may not have been brought up yet today here. Brad, Brad go ahead. Commission President, uh, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, my name is Brad Hovengay. I'm the regional uh, wildlife supervisor in Jackson, and I co-chair this group with John. And I just felt like um, maybe I could provide a couple of closing thoughts real briefly. Uh, I don't want to drag this out, but this plan is an incredible opportunity to, to provide direction to this agency moving forward with feed grounds. I want to stress that it's long term. I want to stress that it is completely adaptable. Um, we can make a plan to re review this whenever we want. We intend to review it. We intend to have it adaptable. And that everything in this plan, it's, it's a long-term work in progress to go a specific direction that we've never had in our agency before. And everything that we do will go through this body and through this administration and the department. There's, there's things that that uh, goals we want to work towards, it'll take time, but we're literally not going to make big swings and moves as an agency without having the support of the people behind me and the people in front of me and, and the people I work with. So just in closing, um, I just want to stress that this is a long-term plan to get to long-term goals and have a direction for this agency to go where we move all as one group. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, director. So yeah, I've got, um, I've got some thoughts here before you guys start deliberating and, and decide which way you wanna go here. So I will start by saying that I really do appreciate the work of John and Brad and their entire teams. They've done yeoman's work on this thing, invested a lot of time and a lot of mental energy, lost a lot of sleep. And um, I, th I think have come to a pretty darn good piece of work here. I also do want to thank many of them are here today, those folks that participated throughout the last three years, I guess it's been. Um, I remember sitting in this room right here um, when we started this to kick it off to talk about um, at the first meeting, the sideboards and exactly what Mr. Harberger just, um, just brought up during his comment, this was not a feed ground closure plan and it is not. Um, so, reflecting and thinking back and thinking about a lot of the discussions that we've had. First of all, I would say that one of the common themes with everybody on all sides of the issue is um, this notion of fear. Um, people have fear of the unknown. That includes the department. We have fear of the unknown. Cheyenne talked about the fact that we don't know what happens with CWD in a feed ground environment. We've never observed it. Nobody in the world's observed it. And so there's fear. There's fear from folks in this room that make a living off of um, outfitting or tourism or other things related to wildlife that have a fear of what happens if we don't have the same number of elk. There's fear from folks in the, um, in the environmental community that, you know, if we don't do something right away, that it's going to have long-term negative environmental impacts. There's fear from um, folks in the ranching industry that make a, that make their living off of livestock that, um, literally, brucellosis transmission to their livestock herds is um, is catastrophic. So there there is a lot of fear, and I really I get that and respect that. And I will tell you that the people that are sitting in this room that wear red shirts and worked on this, um, they they get that and they considered that uh, when they put all this work to do work together. It's been stressed, and I want to stress again: we did not get here overnight. It took us 120 years to get to this point, or 115 years by 
my math may not be the best here on, on the fly, but, um, and, and we have no expectation, nor do we want to set any expectation that this can be solved overnight or in five years or in 10 years. This is decades long work. It's important to realize too, that we aren't able to, we're not in the driver's seat. We don't get to make all the decisions. We have to ask for permission from land managers in many of our feed grounds for permission to do this activity on their ground. And it's been litigated. And um, that's a factor here that certainly has to be, be considered. I will tell you that for a lot of the reasons that I'm gonna talk about, in my view, doing nothing is not an option. There's a similarity here for sure with the issue we talked about with the pronghorn corridor. And I do believe that the state needs to lead. We've got to be out in front of this issue and demonstrate that, that the state of Wyoming is the entity to manage um, elk feed grounds and to do so in a responsible way. I think it's important to reflect. So over the whole entire course of feed ground management in Wyoming, there's a lot of things that have changed. Some of them pretty drastic. We've recently, not by our choice, um, but had a feed ground close. Um, that was that was through a court decision. Before that, um, if you look back on the history going back decades, there have been multiple times when feed grounds have been added and closed. We used to have moose feed grounds, believe it or not, in, in Sublette County. I, there might have been some in Lincoln County too. There's been major changes with the length of the feeding season and shortening it. And we've, we've been able to do that through um, a whole lot of good research, good science, and been able to do that without um, reducing the objectives for those elk herds. We've significantly reduced the elk, the length of elk feeding seasons in a lot of places and done it well. We've mentioned the low density feeding. We've mentioned, you know, we did, this was a significant emotional event for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. We did test and removal on, on elk in several of our feed grounds south of here um, where we captured elk, tested them, and if they were positive, we removed them from the population. There have been my point here is, is that we've done some fairly drastic things with regards to elk management, and we have continued to persevere and have healthy elk populations after all that. We are faced with a new challenge with CWD, um, and you know what? Like the challenges we faced in the past, I, I think this is our, next, our best step forward to try to address that. Um, I think that we can't fail to acknowledge that feed grounds have worked to achieve the objectives that they were originally established for, to provide huntable numbers of elk, to reduce transmission of diseases to cattle, to reduce damage, to reduce competition with other species. But CWD does change the landscape um, and it changes it in ways we don't understand and know because we don't have the information. Um, you know, I would say, I would, I would close with this and then I'll offer some ideas for maybe some changes you might want to consider. What, you know, what do we want sportsmen and landowners and ranchers and outfitters and everybody who cares about this ecosystem? What do we want them to think about the decisions that we make now? And when, when I say today, I mean that figuratively. I mean, over the course of now and over the next few years, what do we want them to think about what we did in 30 years from now? Worst case scenario, we don't want them to say, you know what, you guys had all the information to indicate there might be problems and you did nothing. That's just not an option that's responsible. I would, I don't want to take on a responsibility like that to say that I had a chance with the best available information to make some kind of a course correction and to take some proactive steps to lead, but I chose not to do it because there was too much fear in the room. Um, with that, I would tell you that um, we have engaged with the, the Forest Service at length on every single time we've had to go do a permit renewal. This time is no different. We're on the record with the Forest Service recommending that they continue to issue us a permit for, for both the two feed grounds that are in question right now, Del Creek and Forest Park. Um, our engagement with the Forest Service has been robust. It's been productive. They've listened to us. I don't know what decision they're gonna make. But I do know that they've been litigated multiple times on this issue. I have no concern whatsoever with the commission putting in writing in this plan that the department will, with public involvement, um, do a full review of the plan every 10 years. That doesn't concern me, as Brad just indicated. We're going to do that anyway. 
but if the commission and the public will feel better about having a formalized process that's in the plan, that doesn't, that doesn't concern me at all. Um, I think that um, adding specific language that says when we're talking about FMAP, Feed Ground Management Action Plan, um, stakeholder engagement that we specifically call out, the department will engage with local government officials. No concerns with that whatsoever. We'd be glad to add that in to make sure that our county commissioners and conservation districts, as we've heard, are, are included. Um, and, and then here's the other thing, you know, this, this, this sentence that Mr. Haberberger brought up regarding the distribution of elk um, cannot continue to be um, controlled by feed grounds. The intent of that was not, um, it was, it was more about distribution of elk and not managing elk populations. But if that's the, um, if, if that's the way that people have interpreted that, and obviously he has, if he has, others have as well, you know, that eliminating that sentence doesn't change the spirit of this plan. It doesn't change this thing. We're the, the meat of this thing is in all those 75 pages before that. And so um, if that eases, provides clarity and eases some concern, I certainly wouldn't resist the commission wanting to take that action. And Mr. President, that's all I have pending any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Director. Any questions? Uh, yes, Mr. President, I have a question, and sure. it's for Cheyenne. What is, so when it comes to, if, um, when it comes to the removing the feed ground quotas from commission policy, incorporate them into a herd objectives, um, why is it so much the recommendation to do so? What What is all the background for that? President Ladwig, Ladwig, Commissioner Roberts, um, currently, and it was mentioned in public comment, and it is somewhat true, but not always, that we're man that we kind of when we do our season setting that we're managing towards our herding objectives, but also assessing our quotas. But really, there's not clear guidance of how we are supposed to manage for those quotas or not. From our understanding, the real main use of those quotas as written in commission policy right now is for commission budget planning, the cost of hay for that amount of elk on each fee ground for your budget and for your financial planning. And so when we talk about those quotas for management decisions, it's not clear and it's not consistent. So sometimes it is used as we want this many elk on a feed ground. Sometimes quota is interpreted as we don't want any more than this number of elk on a feed ground. Um, and also those have not been updated in, in quite a long time. And so by bringing it into, object, into the objectives, it allows us to provide clarity of how we're supposed to use and manage for those quotas. And the reason that we don't specify how we want to do that is because we don't know yet and we want public input on how we should do that. For example, we could say the commission should plan to have budget capacity for this many elk on these feed grounds and then we just manage for a herd unit objective. Or it could say this is the amount of elk uh, where we start to see you know, disease impacts from necrobacillosis or hoof rot where we start to see increased uh, calf mortality because of other diseases associated with essentially overcrowding. So that's the reason we wanna take it out of policy and put it in those objectives because it allows more adaptability. So for example, if we did do a herd unit objective review that does take public process. And the reason we call it public process is because this is public process right now. It's not a vote of public support. It is your decision based on our public process and what you're hearing. And so we got a lot of comment of how do you measure um, public support? And that's why we changed towards public process. But again, if we had a herd unit objective review and we review those every five years and we were looking at those feed ground quotas, we would be able to have public process and commission approval of those quotas every five years um, for each herd unit. 
rather than trying to revise a commission policy anytime you might want one small change for one feed ground. Did that, Mr. Was it Mr. Child, did that answer your question? Anything? <laughs> I understand that the way it's written, if that was the case, they wouldn't be trying to remove it from the commission policy. The way I understand it, the way I understand it, it's kind of, it's been explained to me by a couple of people today two different ways. I, I, I suspect that if they want to take a seat ground objective or you know, quota and lower it, they have to come before you guys to do that. Uh, they're asking to get rid of that? No. I guess I'm agreeing. Let me clarify that. This is, I, I think it's an important point that we need to clarify for the public. President Ladwig, Commission, thank you for the opportunity. I, I agree. It's very important to clarify this. Both, so the Commission will remember this summer or fall, I don't remember which month it was, but um, Deputy Chief Brimmer brought to you a suite of our herd unit objective reviews, and some of those had changes, and you approved those. So um, it is equally, and Dustin, I would look at you, but then no one can hear me, so sorry. <laughs> um, so both require this essentially the same public process and the same commission process of approval, whether the fee ground quotas are in commission policy or in herd unit objective review, they both would come to this body under a public process. The really the key difference, Dustin, is that um, in commission policy, we don't really open those or review them unless there's like a specific need or change identified. So there is no kind of time frame on that. Our herd unit objective reviews, whether we change them or not, we review every herd for every species statewide on a five-year basis. And so it would actually um, allow the commission to review those at a minimum of every five years, but that public process is the same. We are not um, taking any of that um, decision-making authority. We're not changing that. It's just which process it follows. Yeah. I would like to see it because that demonstration, I, I would like to see that stay in the hands of the commission. Roll call. Uh, Mr. President, yeah, so I had a couple questions for Cheyenne, but after that presentation, um, I, I I agree with you. So I, I, I'm trying to understand Dustin's concern, but it's actually beneficial to the herd number to be in your quotas instead of just a feed ground number that we still review it, but I understand the flexibility of a herd unit area region instead of an isolated feed ground. So I don't know how to get dust in there, but I'm comfortable with moving the commission feed ground quotas to a regional herd unit. And the flexibility then that gives you as those populations change due to um, large carnivore impacts or weather impacts, or uh, I think that gives us more flexibility. Am, am I correct with that, Cheyenne? President Ladwig, um, Commissioner Brokaw, I believe so, yeah, definitely. And and I, I'm trying to think of how I can explain it differently. Um, it's almost like with the commission policy, you have a statewide policy. And under a herd unit objective review, it's under regional management. Again, both have the same pub opportunity for public process and commission decision for approval. But I, yes, it gives us more flexibility to kind of um, do what we need to do for management at the regional level and at the herd unit level, rather than in commission policy where you're kind of at the statewide level. 
and isn't it true you at, at the regional level all, all you're doing is making a recommendation and then crawls up the ladder to this commission so we, we're going to review it annually if needed if it's changing so the um excuse me commissioner brokaw every herd unit is to be reviewed on a minimum of a five-year increment however if changes are needed, we can review them sooner. So there's nothing stopping us from reviewing anything sooner. Right, and and um, coming from Southeast Wyoming, where we are so far over objectives and we've set objectives and we've set three-year hunting quotas and elk from Colorado continue to come across, we've, re we've reviewed and addressed those numbers annually as needed. So um, while the, while the while the holding pattern is five years, we can certainly bring it before this commission annually if needed. Absolutely correct. And and similarly, we do propose hunting seasons annually. And so if we're um if we need to do a full herd unit objective review, which essentially so the the FMAPs are this opportunity for us to look at each herd unit and figure out again, like which of those strategies, not all of them apply to every, they just won't work, which strategies work for each herd unit and how do we wanna incorporate those quotas into the herd unit? That will essentially initiate, once we're done with the FMAP, we'll essentially have to do a herd unit objective review to get those quotas in. Even if we change nothing else in a herd unit objective, We'll have to adjust, we'll have to propose a change because we'll be incorporating the quota. So immediately following every FMAP, there will be a herd unit objective review. And so we will have public process through this FMAP process, and then again through a herd unit objective review process. Mr. President, uh, um, I'm going to move on if, if, if you'll allow me. So from your direction and, and the directors, um, I liked the comment made that this is a plan on how we're gonna make plans to manage our elk as it changes within area based on litigation or disease or whatever. So I do have some language changes that I'd like to put into the plan. So how would you like to work that? Would you like to flush that out now in a, in a more, open setting than a formal setting so I don't screw up my motions? Are you ready to move the plan? Director Nesvix knows how I can get tongue-tied and, and bogged down. Oh, do I that. ever. And I, I've done problem. that before, and I don't want to do that here. So how would you like to proceed? My here? recommendation is if somebody moves it and you get a second, then in discussion you talk about amendments. But uh, Commissioner Brokaw, before you do that, I'd like to make a statement. Certainly. That something that I've been thinking about. And it concerns this process and, and almost every process that we work with today and will work with in the future and have worked with in the past. As a commissioner, I have found out after five years that we change, this body changes every six years by replacements. So every six years, there's a complete new thought process here. So things can change. If we make the decision today, it could change next month it could change in two years or it could change in four years because of the makeup of the commission and we also i found out and understand that i i think cheyenne said that close to what i'm trying to say is that as a commission and a department we can review anything that involves this organization anytime we want to review it it's not something that has to be done every three years if there's a problem we can take care of it we can work on it. We we have that ability, and, and I think people need to kind of understand that, that we can, we don't have to wait for these preset periods. And I guess that's about all I have to say. I hope I didn't step on anybody's toes, but that's kind of the position we're in. And I appreciate the time to be able to say that. Commissioner Brokaw, you can. I, I'm not ready. I'm. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I ready. thought I gave you enough time. Uh, okay. Um, you have three things, Ashley. Oh no, when we go to the commission. Okay, then, uh, Mr. Chairman, 
for consideration of the room, um, I move to accept the recommendation to approve the elk management plan. I would second, Mr. President. Did you get that, Tony? Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Yes, sir. I'm not found on my page yet, but I think uh, Commissioner Lundvall to my right has some. That's called throwing you under the bus so I can get my act together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Commissioner Burkle. So I've been I've been trying to keep notes through all of this, and I think there have been three things that have specifically come up, and you were going to mention, I'll remind you, consulting local government. You wanted that put in there somewhere, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then there was the move. I'm not going to word it right. What we just talked about, moving it from one, the big to the small. Uh, I can't use my words after five o'clock. Taking it, we just talked about it, Cheyenne. Say it out loud again. Yes, that one. And then there was the line at the very end that was discussed as well. That if it was confusing to the public and they thought that it meant that we were looking to do away with fee grounds altogether, that we could possibly remove that as well. And it wouldn't change the spirit of the law. Those are the three things that I wrote down that have been discussed. I think that's correct. And so that's what I, I don't know the plan well enough where to include those. One of them was the, I recommended that you at least consider a 10 year review of the plan. This, and well, no, go ahead and then I'll go take it on. Uh, Mr. President, I, um, as to the uh, Commissioner Lundball's first point about including local elected officials, um, I can make a suggestion if Commissioner Brokaw does not have one written down, I can throw out something to work please, from. Please do so. Um, and this is just for uh, discussion purposes. And uh, page 75, I believe. Uh, excuse me, 74, under public involvement. The next to the last sentence of that first paragraph reads, the department will identify and collaborate with potentially impacted stakeholders. Uh, my thought would be to uh, add to that, um, to read, collaborate with potentially impacted stakeholders, which shall include local elected officials. That would, what I'm going for is the direction that there will be an affirmative, a proactive outreach to local government memorialized in here, but it doesn't also recognizing that past that group, um, you know, trying to define all the stakeholders that you want to go after becomes, I mean, I saw the list of the people who collaborated with this. You'd make this a hundred page document if you tried to include it. So what I'm trying to do, what I'm going for is to recognize the importance of the local governments that I think we all, still mean to be presumptuous, that I think we would all see, um, and then leave it at that. That's my thought. Uh, Commissioner President, clarification. Commissioner Masterson, what page were you up uh, for public involvement? Page 74, uh, public involvement. Uh, the next to the last sentence of that first paragraph. The department will identify and collaborate with potentially impacted stakeholders. And my suggestion was to change it to read, will, will identify and collaborate with potentially impacted stakeholders, comma, which shall include local elected officials. That was my starting point. I, Mr. President, I think that works great. We'll pay you and 74. Mr. President, I've also got something I'd like to add on there when we get a chance. Oh, pardon? I'd, I'd like to, I would like to, and under when the director says every 10 years that we do review and approve it, I'd like to, do that every five years, if possible. I know it's, uh, but I think if five years, 
uh, like you said, Mr. President, that you know the commission changes every six, and I think a five a year review of the the feed ground would give a few commissioners that have been here for a while, plus the new ones that they review it every five years. I don't know if that would be cause too much heartache, but I'd like to see that uh, every five years. Mr. President, um, I've always wanted to do this. Point of order. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate uh, and agree with um, oh, wow. Commissioner Roberts' uh, suggestion, but just for, so we can, uh, one one bite at a time. Um, perhaps we can deal with changing or addressing, if we choose to, the local government question, and then move on to that suggested amendment, lest we get further tied into the Gordian knot, which is elk feed grounds. Perhaps one okay. thing at a time. We have those choices while we're discussing this. We can we can do three or four amendments, which is looks like it's gonna take and vote them all in at one time, or we can do them individually. Uh, I, I have no, uh, I think it's cleaner to do them one at a time, Mr. President. And just to, I think it'll be quicker, actually more efficient. Let's just take a quick vote and, or, and change it as as this body sees fit. Vote, move on. Now I have a question. Does the amendments come from anybody, and the second come from anybody, yes. or does it have to come from the person that made the most? Okay. So uh, you that would be a then in that I would be making that motion to amend the plan as read. Motion has been made by. Commissioner Masterson and seconded by Commissioner Roberts. No. Oh, no. Commissioner Bell. To would you state that again, sir? Yes, sir. Um, it, it's a simple add to this next to the last sentence of the first paragraph under public involvement. It would it, the with the change the sentence would read. The department will identify and collaborate with potentially impacted stakeholders, comma, which shall include local elected officials, period. Everybody heard that? Yeah. It's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passed. That's motion one. Motion two. Okay, I I would like to amend it and do a motion that this uh, Wyoming Elk Feed Ground Management Plan be reviewed and approved by the commission every five years. Second. Mr. President, why, why don't we just do as needed? Because my motion's five years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't like five years. I don't like five years, Commissioner Robert. I like as needed. The motion has been made to review and approve every five years by Commissioner Roberts, and was seconded by Commissioner Bell. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passed. Okay, uh, number three. Uh, Mr. President, um, I don't know if uh, Commissioner Roberts has a place to put that language in, or, or should we? Do we need to? If the commission I, I, directs us to add the language. We'll right. add it at an appropriate place and trust us to put it in the right spot. I, 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 there's never a question of trust. I just didn't know how we wanted to do it. So okay. it's clearly it's on the record. So, all right. What was motion three? The public's concern with the line at the end that limits. I'm looking for it. Page 
Second. It would be removing the second sentence at the top of page 76. Controlling elk distributions in Western Wyoming through supplemental feeding is not sustainable. My amendment to the motion is to strike that sentence. Oh, oh. Motion has been made by Commissioner Brokaw. Seconded by Commissioner Lundvall. Seconded by Commissioner Lundvall to remove the second sentence at the top of page 76, 76 which says, Controlling elk distributions in Western Wyoming through supplemental feeding is not sustainable. Mr. President, I, I would support the motion um, because I think it would bring some comfort um, to people who might interpret that um, in a way that it was not intended. And rather than wrestle with the language um, here for a half an hour about how we can craft it, I think that might be the most appropriate way and I would support the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor of the mo third motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Did you get that, Tony? Are we taking care of? Is there any other amendments to this process? Removing it from commission policy. I just don't want to admit to death. Right. Um, no, that's an important one. Number four. Yeah, I, I, I'm ready to do it, but Cheyenne, I don't know where to do it. Where do you, where would, remember where, you said we can say they, at the discretion of anybody. Yeah, the action is in the existing commission policy. It's not in this plan. So it's a separate directive to the department to go and remove um, the establishment of feed ground specific objectives from current commission policy for the reason that that is already covered in herd unit reviews for those herd units that contain feed grounds. Cheyenne, are we good there? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. President, Director, Commissioners. Um, yeah, that language is captured in the plan. At a later date in that process, we would come to you with a request to update or revise your commission policy. And we would also come with you to update a revised herd unit objective, which would then have quotas within that policy. So we are not making that request today. We're more just letting you know that the plan to do that is forthcoming and, it, and is stated in this plan. Okay, thank you. So However, what I would prefer is that you give us the direction to move forward with that so that we can prepare that and bring it back. I guess I misunderstood. I didn't know we weren't asking them to do that today. Well, I think we could still do it today, but it's not an amendment to this plan. We yeah. need to vote on this plan and then do that as a separate. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. We are not prepared that. with like an updated draft commission policy today. So I'll do this then. With that, I have no further amendments to this plan. No further Okay, then we need a motion and a second. We've already got a motion. We already have that. I, I, I just have one. I can't help but one other comment. Um, the, uh, I want to thank everybody who commented on this, even if you're not in the room. Um, this, is, this is the essential part of this whole thing. And you've got to participate. And you've got to tell us what you think. And I really appreciate it. Um, as long as it's constructive. Um, it's, it's, we can't function without what you tell us. Um, so thank you with the exception of, uh, Mr. Jivok, Jivok, who, uh, commented our, uh, I, I took, he was from Montana. He apparently doesn't think much of the commission or the department, um, wishing that it would come into the 21st century. So with the exception of him, thank you all. Um, and especially, especially 
to those of you sitting in front in the red shirts, because um, this this is to tackle something like this, and I cannot imagine what it's been like for a long time. So thank you very sincerely for everything you have done. We don't pay enough. Okay. I think we got this settled. I'll ask for uh, the commission to vote on the department's feed ground management plan as amended. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed. Thank you for all your work. Appreciate it. Thank you for everybody with your inputs. All right. We got to go to the last call to the public, and we've got several, several green or blue sheets. Okay. The next <laughs> item of do we should we do the trade trapping first and then this one last or do this one first? This That's is the, the same list. number. As no, it's it? number eleven. It's a, these are all number eleven. Oh, okay. All yeah, call the public, but he's talking about a senior hunter. Sure. Do it first. Sure. Okay, we'll take care of some Zoom public inputs. And do you have one from a uh, Bill Road? Bill Road. <laughs> Good stuff. I have to say something. I'll come back tomorrow when everyone's in better humor. Oh, you're Bill Road? <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Must be pretty important. Oh, that wasn't it. Hey, if you're not, we need you to leave the room. We still got some public comment. If you're not sitting down, please leave the room. Thank you. All right, go to the Zoom. Okay, we're ready to go to Zoom. Uh, Lisa Robertson. She sent us an email that said she was going to speak tomorrow. Oh, I hadn't seen it. I don't look. She sent an email to all of us. Okay, okay Lisa Robertson is going to see us to talk to us tomorrow. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Heather Newport. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Heather, we can hear you. Good afternoon, President Ladwig, Director Nesvik, members of the commission. My name is Heather Newport with Jester's Legacy. Our group was organized after Becky Barber's dog was killed in a conibear trap a little over a month ago near Afton. As you know, the fur bear management topic has been gaining a lot of traction in the Star Valley area and throughout the state. We currently have a growing list of over 100 supporters that care deeply about the safety of our friends and family, furry or not, while enjoying the outdoors. Quite a few of them are in attendance today, and we're optimistic about the opportunity to improve the safety guidelines for fur bear management. Representative Byron and the Lincoln County Commissioners separately sponsored two fur bear management topics to the Travel, Recreation, Wildlife, and Cultural Resources Interim Committee in their most recent session, which my colleagues will address in a moment. While the Interim Committee chose not to consider our topics this year, we learned that Wyoming Game and Fish Commission has direct authority over fur bearer regulations, which is where our interest is focused. Meanwhile, outdoor enthusiasts and trappers alike are joining forces to bring common sense suggestions to the table. We know Senator Garou from Jackson is interested in sponsoring legislation for the 2025 session, and we anticipate he would be grateful to work with any task force from Wyoming Game and Fish. Prior TRW work for, from three years ago is available and can be a valuable resource. 
Plus we have a list of residents, including responsible trappers, willing and ready to help out and answer questions whenever needed. I will now turn the time over to my colleagues to discuss our mission in further detail. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Who do you have next? New and Schwander? Yeah. Hello, Becky. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. I want to uh, express my condolences for the loss of your dog and, and uh, I'm anxiously waiting to hear what you have to say and, and we're gonna see what we can do. Thank you so much. Um, President Ludwig, members of the commission, Director Nesvig, um, I am Becky Barber with Jester's Legacy. Um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to comment today. I understand that mandatory education for trappers has been an interim topic before, so the committee um, apparently chose not to add it to their list for this year. I would encourage the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission to take the lead in bringing trappers and other stakeholders together to provide updates to the department's existing voluntary curriculum and to include ethics. Our group would be more than willing to help with any task work. We believe potential legislative sponsors will be looking for that kind of expertise as they consider moving forward. Um, again, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak and I would like to thank the Lincoln County commissioners for their support as well. Thank you. You're welcome, Becky. Her, sir? Okay. Kara? Kara, are you there? You're breaking up. You're breaking up real bad. How about now? That sounds good. No, you're still breaking up, ma'am. It's not working. It, it, you're very, you're very broke up. Still there, or did you drop? She can't answer me, can she? Have you got Have you got a different phone or something? Because we're not getting anything hardly at this end. Yeah, let's go to the next person. Terry Bowers. Yep, got that. Okay, Sydney. Hello. Can, Hello, can people hear me today? Yes, we can. Awesome. <clears throat> and I can maybe do Kara's for you as well if we need to go that direction. But good afternoon, Mr. President, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, and any hardworking agency staff who might still be in the room at this point of the afternoon. Thank you for this public comment opportunity, and especially for the virtual option with a shout out to Tony Bell for her assistance with that. So my name is Sydney Woods. I'm with Jester's Legacy as well over here in Star Valley. And because Wyoming's wildlife is indeed worth the watching, I want to thank you also for your many contributions to maintaining this unique kind of life we are so fortunate to share. 
Our group's initial discussions began with a likely focus on the snowiest counties where winter recreation and fur bearer trapping will continue seeing increased conflict because accessible corridors are limited. Then in our conversation with the regional supervisor in Jackson, we learned to appreciate that the commission might prefer a single approach for proposed updates rather than having separate communities come to you year after year. So as you've heard, we broadened our request to statewide consideration, looking for ways to improve safety and allow for successful coexistence among different kinds of winter recreationists, including fur bearer trappers. This is important for residents, of course, and also to tourists and businesses that serve them. And we applaud the Lincoln County commissioners who recognize this and who offer their support in finding solutions. Um, we understand that this commission is on a regular three-year schedule for reviewing its trapping management and that the topic is due this year. So to that end, we ask that any working group that the commission creates to investigate updates will be open to diverse stakeholder involvement, including wildlife watchers. Um, we offer our time and our various experiences in our communities and on our public lands toward that coordination. We also know many of the people who have contacted us would be ready and willing to attend meetings when the topic is on your published agenda. So um, shall we try Kara again? <laughs> and I will look for her notes. Hello, Kara. Hello. Am I coming in this time? Yes, ma'am, you are. Oh, wonderful. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Director, Commissioners. My name is Kara Purser, also with Jester's Legacy. I do appreciate that you've all been uh, having a long day, so I will keep this brief. Uh, today, we're asking the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission to institute setbacks from numbered roads and trails during fur bearer season. Uh, the current situation is unclear to the recreating public and to trappers. Existing road setback language is only found in the shooting sports information and is not listed in trapping regulations. Uh, the status of roads as open or closed creates additional confusion. Uh, in a conversation with one of our supporters, I learned that he tripped and fell in a snare this last fall that was set directly on a numbered forest service system trail. And I was surprised to learn that that was a legal set in the state of Wyoming, uh, as are most people <laughs> are surprised to learn that that's legal. Uh, in our area of the state, for bear season and the likely location of sets overlap significantly with where the general public recreates. And we would like to see setback standard requirements from numbered roads and trails regardless of seasonal vehicle closures. Within our supporters, we have both hobbyists and professional trappers. Uh, these folks who are active trappers agree that required setbacks are reasonable and smart, and they've offered assistance in reviewing and honing in regulatory proposal. Uh, wildlife services trappers already operate within required setbacks. This manage is imperative. This management update is imperative for coexistence between the general recreationist, whose population is ever growing in our state, and the hobby trapper. Setbacks seem to be a no-brainer for safety considerations while trapping on public land, and buffers would be consistent with requirements in our surrounding states like Idaho, Montana, and Utah. Because this topic is fully within the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission authority and does not need legislative approval. We would hope that this safety improvement could be finalized before the next fur bearer season. Thank you for your time and attention to this topic and also appreciate Lincoln County Commissioners and their support on this and, and others across the state as well who have joined us. Mr. President, I have a question for Kara, if she wouldn't mind. Kara, are you still on? There's a question. Yes. What what kind of setbacks? What what kind of what are what are, how much of a setback are you talking about? 
that's a good question and one that we would like to work with uh you know multiple people to determine um i think you know we would probably propose a few hundred feet um some people might push back on that but i think we could come up with a happy medium um all the trappers that i've talked to say yeah we already do that <laughs> but but there's plenty that aren't doing it if their hand's not forced. And that's what the feedback has been um, from some of my pals that are out there working on ranches and professionally trapping or, or even just trapping for fun. They, they also have, you know, kids and pets and they say they would never set, set up um, too close to roads and trails, but it's occurring for in places where people aren't told otherwise. So I would say a couple hundred feet. I don't think that's a big ask. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Who are they? I don't have those names, but better let them bring them. Bring them. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Yes, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Director, Mr. President, Commissioners. My name is Dale Cottom. I am a Star Valley resident. I live in Thane. I work in Afton. Um, I I wear three hats. I am a business and regulatory lawyer. I'm a recreational trapper, and I guess my kids and I collectively are professional trappers um, at part time. I regularly appear before uh, regulatory bodies like yours, um, primarily the Public Service Commission, but I've been uh, in front of the DEQ and the EQC and a number of others. I want to make it clear I don't represent anyone today. I do not have a client. Jester's legacy is not my client. Um, Becky Barber is a very dear friend. Um, she, uh, we were co-workers for a number of years, and I um, I knew Jester, and it just it, it broke my heart to see the photos of him in that conibear. Um, one of my absolute worst nightmares is the fear that someday I would come up on one of my sets and find um, someone's pet that's been lost or a child that's been injured, and um, and so I can tell you this, uh, uh, our trapping legacy and the recreation and, and passing this tradition on to my children is a passion of mine. And, and I'm very, I'm, I'm very determined to do what I can to continue it, but, um, we won't be able to do that if we're not responsible trappers. Um, the other thing I need to tell you is that, um, I have not set a trap on public land in over 17 years. I only trap on private land. And so in the spirit of full disclosure, whatever regulations you um, ultimately may adopt for public land, they're not going to affect me. And I just want to make that clear because I am a member of the Wyoming Trappers Association, the Idaho Trappers Association, and the Nat National Trappers Association, but I only trap on, on private land. Um, the last lady who spoke uh, hit the nail on the head. We need mandatory trapper education and we need um, setbacks. The, in particular, the regulations should be more clear about how to calculate the setback. When I heard about Jester's incident and somebody told me, well, it was an illegal set, it was in, you know, within 30 feet of the road, and I said, that's not, you don't, you, that's not the, the law. You don't have to be 30 feet off the road. And I thought, I better check this out. And so I read everything in the Trapper pamphlet, and I thought, okay, all right, okay, I, I get it. You have to put the two regulations together. And I've been trapping over 50 years and I never did that. But it doesn't, again, it doesn't affect me since I don't trap on public land. Um, <clears throat> we do need trapper education, mandatory. When I moved to Star Valley and I applied for my Idaho trapper's license, uh, they said, well, you've got to take this course and you've got to have a card and a trapper education. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I've been trapping 50 years. And they said, Oh, good for you. There's your seat. Go sit down, uh, open your book. The class is about to start. And uh, I trap quite a bit in Idaho. I'm very familiar with their regulations. They're very good. Um, we ought to be 
having a look at those regulations as a suggestion to the commission. And I also suggest we look at Vermont's because Vermont's legislature mandated that the their game and fish adopt regulations that implement best management practices. And there was a comment period, and I believe they just adopted their regulations and their portions of that that are very, very good. Um, I have the best management practices all printed out and put in a binder. I do everything I can to follow those because again, if, if we don't act responsibly and ethically, we're going to lose, uh, we'll lose our rights and we'll lose this, this tradition that, that, um, that is so in, ingrained and, and such a part of our history in Wyoming and the United States. Um, and then finally, I, I know this is probably not the, um, the place to accomplish a change with the listing of otters, but it's a place to start. Um, I, I would like to um, do what I can to have otters delisted as uh, protected, um, protected animals. I'd like to see them listed as fur bearers. Otters can be trapped in Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, and now even Nebraska. And uh, they're reaching nuisance levels. The Wyoming Untrapped website is a wonderful resource. You can go in there and it looks like they're pulling public information about incidental catches. And you can see the scores of otters that are caught incidentally, which is an indication that their, their populations are healthy. Um, I can tell you what's happening in Star Valley. There are private um, trout ponds where the trout can't get out. Um, it's all legal, I'm, I'm sure. But the otters are coming in and setting up shop and camping and, and decimating those private trout ponds. On the Idaho side, um, we, we trap um, for four different ranches. We're paid 75 bucks a beaver. My kids have paid for a lot of their college with uh, beavers they've caught. They've, they've, they've uh, really racked up the, um, the catches and the takes. And, and one of the landowners there lost his entire trout pond to a couple of otters and we're we're trying to to get those uh, get that situation turned around. So um, I know it's a statutory designation for otters, but uh, um, I would ask that um, that we that we consider asking the legislature to delist the otter. Um, I have a number of other notes here. I won't go over them now. I'm I'm sure I'll have the opportunity to speak to you again. But I I strongly uh, support mandatory trapper education. I think setbacks need to be at least 50 feet off the edge of an improved road, maybe maybe bigger. Um, and I'll be the first one to sign up to be a volunteer um, teacher of a trapper education course. Okay, thank you, Dale. Uh, and I just, my understanding is that even if we didn't have the mandatory setback situation, this was still an illegal set because it was a 330 conibear bear and it wasn't in water. What I read about it is it uh, does um, make me conclude it was an illegal set. You cannot set a 330 conibear bear on public land without some portion of it being underwater. And I'll just, so that's that's my understanding from what I read, it was, it was still an illegal set. And that's I'll- understand. I'll I'll just say anybody who sets a three thirty or even a two twenty on dry land is is asking for trouble. It's just not there. There's no reason to do that. You can you can make the same catches with snares. There's if, uh, the only type of conibear that belongs on dry land is one up in a tree to catch a martin. That's my opinion. <laughs> I so. All right, thank you for your comment. You bet, you're welcome. Thank you for your time. Any more, Wayne? Is he on? Hello? 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 He's unmuted, but 
Hello again. Going three times. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, that's that's good effort. Next. And what? Oh, the Becky. Hello, Becky. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, President Logwig, members of the commission, Director um, Nesvik, in response to um, the illegal trap and the need for setbacks, yes, it was an illegal set, but had there been the appropriate setbacks, even if the trap was illegal, it wouldn't have happened. And so that is why we are looking at setbacks. Thank you for your time. Hey, can I, Becky, can I ask you what you would suggest as setback? You know, I I was thinking around 300 feet. Um, you know, for, for even kids, um, you know, I know someone had said, you know, 50 feet, but if you've got kids and you've got pets, that really isn't that big of a buffer. Um, but, you know, again, we could, you know, all work together and come up with a happy medium. Okay, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, knowing how a dog can smell a lot of things, 300 foot really isn't that great to a dog either. And uh, I don't know, we have we have some thought processes to try to get this going. Uh, I think we're going to have the department look into things. And... Uh, Probably we'll be hearing more of this by our meeting in April. Yeah, what I would say, Mr. President, is we're, you know, there's a lot of things that came up today. We're glad to come back and talk about what work has gone into previous um, collaborative work with a lot of different folks, including trappers, including folks in the trapping reform community landowners, a lot of different folks. This commission actually made some recommendations to push forward to the legislature a few years ago. We can prevent, present that to you. You can decide if you want to push those recommendations again. They were rejected when they went to the legislature, but we can bring you kind of the whole background on this particular issue and let you decide what you want to do. What? Send this to them. Yes. We have a document here, Becky, that we... I have received from the department that started activity in 2020, a historical record of what our department has done in the trapping mode. Uh, I think we have your address. We'll try to get that to you and we won't try. We will get that to you. And uh, you can use it for some of your determinations too, as this, if you see what we've already done. Thank you. I sure appreciate it. Okay, Becky, do you have anything else? No. She must be gone. Um, I yeah, it kicked me off, but nope, I think that is about all I have. I again I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson or John. Hello. Hello. Going three times. Hello. Sold. Hey. Is there a, we'll do a call to the public general in the room. Is there any comments? Mike? President Lagwig, Director Nesvik, Commission. Um, Mike Schmidt again. I'm up here on two fronts. One, I'll, I'll talk first as a member of the Wyoming State Trapping Association and a representative in District 5 for them, um, <clears throat> that we have dis had this discussion since this uh, tragedy has happened with Jester. Um, our group is in favor of some setbacks, looking at setbacks, and some uh, uh, mandatory trapping um, education. Um, 
Now I'd like to speak on behalf of myself. I have, and I will work with my group, but I have some concerns with just a, a trapping setback and throw that out there. I, I believe it's a Band-Aid. I, I, I'm not against it, but I think we need to really think it through and make sure that we go about this the right way because if we set a 50-foot setback, 100-foot, 300-foot, what happens when the next dog goes 350 feet? Do we go to a 500-foot setback? Do we go to 1,000 after that accident? Do we go to sea to shining sea? I, I don't see an end to it. So I think, there, I think we really need to think through on how, this, how we proceed with this. Um, I do believe that there needs to be some of the, the dog walkers and the public that use these trails. I believe that there would be some uh, 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 advantage for them to also go through a trapping education. So they understand the laws and the regulations and certain times of the year when trappers are out there uh, trapping certain species. You know, there's times of the year where the trapping trappers are out there in more forest than other times. I think that's important for them to know. Um, so I, 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 uh, I believe that this needs a lot of work. This needs a lot of deep thinking on it to make sure that both sides come together because I think both sides need to make some some concessions to make this work long term. I'm just afraid of throwing a 300 foot boundary out there as a band aid, and we're going to be right back here in another two or three years. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. I, I, I have some concerns with quite a few things, and one of them that bothers me is that no matter what kind of law we make, how big that law is, somebody's going to violate it because we have poachers, we have fishermen that fish overfish, we have you can't stop everything, but if we get the right rules, we can maybe slow it down. Right. Unfortunately, you're correct. We'll probably never stop that, yeah. the illegal activity, but we got to do our best to curb yeah. it the best we can. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. I think Tim wants to talk. Tim. I know it's good. I'm not even going to say your last name because we're on first name basis <laughs> now. <laughs> I know everybody wants to get out of here. I wasn't even planning on talking on this subject, but I think the mandatory course would be phenomenal i just checked my wallet i took mine in 1968 when i was 14 years old in in pennsylvania it was mandatory hunter safety including trapping it was all one thing mm -hmm. so i'm in favor because i already got a card <laughs> but cool. i think it would be a phenomenal thing to set back all that set back so far for lethal traps not as far for non-lethal traps everything like that it needs discussed just tragic incident was horrible i mean everybody over there's talking about it. i've talked to none of these gals about what happened but everybody's talking about it over there on our side it, it was a bad deal it was an extremely bad deal and tragic but i agree with everything that was said here we need some rules maybe some courses i think would be good some mandatory courses uh and also agreeing extensively with getting these otters off the protected list they're getting thrown in dumpsters by the hundreds. This is ridiculous. So there could be in so many cotton beaver traps, and that's the way it's been since I started trapping here. My number one hobby, other than work, has always been trapping. I started trapping when I was nine. And when I came to Wyoming and found out we couldn't trap otters, and there's very few states you can't trap them in. We're one of the only ones, and nobody can tell me why they're protected here. And it needs discussed. It's been brought up, but never truly discussed. And I agree with that gentleman that it needs discussed why our otters are protected, why they're on that list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate your comments. Any further comments from the public? Do we entertain a motion to adjourn? That's do my we, do we set a direction? I third that. <laughs> we, we set a direction. Yeah, I think, Mr. President, I'll, I'll make that commitment on behalf of the department that we'll bring you um, some information at the April and a presentation at the April meeting. Okay. Everybody hear that? Yep. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, yeah, so moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Aye. Take your pick, Tony. <laughs> Aye. All in vote. All in favor. <laughs> Do you have any ideas?